Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if class 1 had traveled to Wonderland part 1. If you guys enjoy this what if and want to see part 2 comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist so let's start the video. Eyeing 8 year old Izuku Midoriya sat atop of one of the many benches scattered around the park, tears pooling in his large green eyes and falling down in large droplets off his freckled cheeks. He wailed loudly as he sat, his cries reaching all corners of the small park though no one was around to hear him weep and no one would have cared either. For in a world where people have incredible abilities known as quirks, who would want to pay mind to someone who doesn't have one? Izuku has just finished a fight only moments ago, and obviously lost, as he tried to defend another child from his best friend turned bully, Bakugu Katsuki. Apparently the boy said something that set Bakugu off and Izuku tried his best to defend him from his ex-friend and his two cronies. The end result was a very injured Izuku covered in cuts, bruises, scorch marks, along with dirt and grass blood all over his tattered clothing and body. While on the other end, with the boy Izuku tried to protect, he made a mad dash for an exit with not so much as a helping hand or a thank you, and he most certainly wouldn't be getting one later. Meanwhile Izuku still crying his eyes out from not only his injuries and failure but also his broken feelings. He didn't want to go home and see the worried and pitiful face of his mother. He didn't want to go to school and face Kachin again with his rude and threatening behavior. He didn't want to be quirkless. He just wanted things to go to the way they were before, Kachin being his friend and not his tormentor. His mother not always looking at him with pity every time he fanboyed about heroes. For the time before he found out he was quirkless. However the world isn't anything like a fairy tale, and never will be. You can't just fix your problems by simply waving a magic wand and saying a magic word. You can't get a fairy godmother to grant all your wishes. You can't get a magic apple to help you fall in love. And you certainly can't live happily ever after. The world doesn't work like that, never has, and never will. That is what a young Izuku Midoriya thought was true until on that very day. Something quite magical happened that would not only change the course of his life but also change his state of mind. As he sat on the rough hardwood bench continually crying his eyes out and letting every last pent-up emotion he held since he was only four years old, a very unusual feeling struck him in his very being almost as if something supernatural was amassed. Then not too far from where he sat the bush began to stir and before he could even blink a flash of pure white dashed out from the bushes. Izuku subconsciously shut his eyes from whatever was moving so fast. The object even created a heavy air current that blew very hard for a brief moment. When he peeked one eye open he saw a very unusual sight, an above-average-sized white rabbit with sky-blue eyes bounding about in a circle, like it was lost or disoriented. However that was not the most unusual thing about this adorable pink-nosed creature, it was actually wearing clothes. And to be accurate a cherry red waistcoat with a fluffy acoustic and a golden pocket watch dangling from a chain connected to one of the coat's pockets. Izuku looked on in amazement at the unusual creature and its attire. At first he didn't know whether to make heads or tails of what he was was seeing. He had heard that Yue had a principal who was an animal with a quirk, so maybe this was another case or maybe it was a really small person with rabbit quirk, so it had to be one of the two. Meanwhile the white rabbit stopped frantically running around in circles and stopped only a dozen yards from where Izuku was sitting perfectly still entranced by the creature. It rested up on its hind legs like it was looking for something and then it grabbed the golden watch with its front paws and took a posture like a human. He flipped open the watch and immediately a look of pure fear consumed its tiny face. It then started to jump around sporadically while shouting in worried fear, Oh dear, oh dear, I'm late, I'm late, I'm very very late. Izuku was completely flabbergasted by the rabbit's sudden human-like mannerisms, speech, and British accent. He wanted to know more about this rabbit, who he is, where he came from, how can he speak, and what he was late for. He immediately hopped off the bench and began chasing the rabbit as it dashed away into the thicket, Yuzagi-san. Wait a minute, where are you going? What are you late for? He called out to the rabbit, but got no response. As the little creature frantically scurried about desperately looking around for something it was searching for, Izuku continued to run after the distressed creature as best as his small and mostly uncoordinated legs could while still calling out to it, with still no response to be heard. Suddenly the creature spotted a large grove of trees with a particularly large and ancient-looking tree in the center of them all. The frantic animal made a mad dash for the grove while almost leaving poor Izuku eating its dust trail. Izuku followed as best he could until he saw the little animal dash around the large old tree and disappeared from sight. He followed around where the animal had ran to, but when he came to the other side he found that the white rabbit had vanished. He looked around for any clue as to where it could have gone. Certainly a creature of its size couldn't just vanish. And even if it was moving fast Izuku could have seen it make a U-turn around the tree or saw a trail of disturbed soil. And it was certainly making a lot of noise particularly yelling I'm late. 
over and over. So where could the white rabbit have gone? He looked around for a bit, but like with the children gave up quickly, until his eyes fell upon a very large hole snug in between two of the large tree's many thick roots. He walked over to the hole and standing just at its edge he peeked into it to see that the width of it was rather enormous. Izuku wondered if the white rabbit went down this large hole, but it could have have, could it? The hole was so large in fact it could easily fit a person not an above average sized rabbit. Though it definitely looked like a rabbit hole with the edges and body of the hole dug with claws and a rather uneven opening. Not only that it was extremely deep, so deep that no light could reach the bottom to see it. As carefully as he could Izuku bent over the edge and with his hands cupped around his mouth he shouted into the hole, Hello. Hello hello hello. The hole echoed. Yuzagi-san. He called again. Yuzagi-san Yuzagi-san Yuzagi-san. Echoes the hole. You down there. He called once more. You down there you down there you down there. Echoes the hole once more. But no one answered his call. Izuku knew when I give up and when he's had more than enough excitement for one day. And also knew standing at the edge of a dark hole was not a good idea. So with a dissatisfied sigh he turned around to shovel himself back home before his mother became too worried. Though before he could take one step forward he immediately felt the ground underneath him begin to shift. Izuku tried to react before he fell, but it was too late. The moment his muscles tense is when the edge broke apart and Izuku felt himself fall and let out a small scream. Thought by some form of pure instinct the green-haired boy reached out in a last-ditch effort to stop his descent and grabbed hold of some of the grass in his small hands. However his hold only lasted a few seconds longer and the ground gave out on him once more sending him falling down the rabbit's hole. The last thing to be heard was the echoes of the young green-haired boy screaming. M-O-M-M-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y-Y
The young boy slowly opened his heavy eyelids only to find that he was in a bed. But it wasn't his bed. It wasn't his normal child-sized bed with All Might sheets, sleeping with his All Might action figure, and once he, he was in a different bed altogether. The bed itself was many times larger than his. The frame was all metal curved into an old Victorian-style frame. The mattress itself was an uncomfortable old spring mattress, but the many white, fluffy, and cautiony sheets that Izuku slept on top of were so thick it made it super comfortable and squishy. It was placed on the inside of what seemed to be a giant fireplace. Why anyone would be a bed in a fireplace was beyond crazy. Izuku slowly lifted himself off the fluffy white sheets and took in his current surroundings. He saw a tile floor with carpeting laying on top. The walls were made of dirt with the tile floor appearing to follow upwards until it hit a point where it was nothing but dirt, with certain articles and furniture embedded into the walls. One thing was certain in Izuku's mind, him falling down that rabbit's hole was no dream. He knew full well he was awake. There was no denying that now. Then how did he survive? He looked around to see that the bed encompassed most of the fireplace, and he was laying on top of the sheets, so he must have fell on the bed when he blacked out. Young Izuku was grateful that he wasn't injured or worse, shaken up and exhausted by the experience but unharmed. The young body couldn't stay here for long. As inviting as the bed was, he had to find a way out of this hole and back home. He lifted his exhausted body up and carefully climbed to the side of the bed as it seemed to suck him in with its soft surface. He came to the corner and noticed the bed was set up much higher than he anticipated. He swung his legs over the side and tried to slide down but failed and fell on his butt. Ouch, he said rubbing the pain away. He got up on his wobbly legs and began to look around for any sign of escape, but only found a little chair and glass tea table sitting in the open, along with a door, a door, a way out, he thought to himself with glee. When he actually got to the door he immediately flung it open only to find another door, only this one was a bit smaller. He flung that door open only to find another smaller door. At this point Izuku was getting a bit upset by this elaborate and annoying prank or design flaw. He kept flinging open door after door with each one only getting smaller and smaller, to the point where he thought he came to the final door. However he failed to notice one crucial thing about it, it was only half his height of that. He might be able to fit through it, in theory, if he crawled. The green-haired boy reached for the handle but suddenly a loud yawn came out of nowhere. He jumped in place nervously looking around for who made that yawn, but then heard a voice, Oh dear I must have dozed off again. What time is it? Who said that? Izuku asked. Down here, yawned the voice in a thick British accent. Izuku looked down to the door to now notice it had a face. Two screws being the eyes, the keyhole is the mouth, and the handle is the nose. You talked, exclaimed Izuku in bewilderment. Of course I can talk. He spat back insulted. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to tell such funny jokes. Wanna hear one? It asked quickly changing temperament. Before he even had the chance to reply the door began. What's the difference between a gyator and a fish? Izuku didn't have a chance to open his mouth before the door finished. You can't tune a gyator. He made a face like he was expecting heavy laughter, but Izuku only looked at him confused. What do you call an alligator in a vest? Woody asked, an investigator. He made a face like he was expecting laughter, but only got silence from Izuku. He tried again and asked, What do you call a pile of cats? A mountain. Again no laughter from Izuku. Did you hear about the hungry clock? It went back four seconds. Izuku still stayed in uncomfortable silence and made a plain expression. The door made a hissing sound sucking in air and said, Yikes, tough crowd. Can you please help me Mr. Door? Izuku asked changing topics. Well that depends entirely on what it is lad. And call me Woody. Woody replied. Do you know how I can get out of here Woody? Well lad I'm afraid there are only two ways. You either go up the way you came or go through me. And you don't look to be able to go back up so I guess you'll have to settle for the latter. Woody answered. Izuku looked up and saw that the top of the tunnel was enveloped in darkness and there was no way of him getting back up. He turned back to Woody and asked, isn't there any other way? Woody shook his head and replied, It's what I've told you or you stay right where you are and listen to my jokes for the rest of your life, particularly I preferred you take the latter. He said hopefully. Okay can you please open up please? Izuku asked. Woody sighed and grumbled something about not being appreciated and replied, I can but first you gonna have to get smaller to walk through me. Izuku was baffled by his statement and asked, How do I do that? Simple, all you have to do is take a swig of that bottle on the tea table behind you. Woody answered simply. Izuku looked at the tea table and chair behind him but saw no bottle on the top of it. What bottle? He asked. The one right there. He replied and motioned back over to the table. Izuku looked back to the tea table and suddenly a little glass bottle appeared out of nowhere. The young boy left the door and went to the table and picked up the bottle to examine it. It was big as two shot glasses and had a flower engraved on the front with a cork sealing it shut. It was filled a strange purple liquid that almost seemed to glow a little, along with the cork was tag tied to it that read drink me. Izuku was almost ready to pop the cork and take a drink when he stopped and asked the door, 
What if I want to be big again? Well that's simple. All you have to do is eat one of the cakes next to you. He answered like it was obvious. Suddenly a little wooden box appeared next to Izuku who opened it to find some kind of oval crackers filling the inside. Each one was a different color with writing on all of them that read, Eat me. Just remember, a little goes a long way. What he warned. Izuku turned back to the door and asked, How do I know this is safe for me? Don't you trust me lad? What he asked. To which Izuku shook his head no. What he groaned and rolled his eyes before saying, Well you should. After all I am a duck door. Izuku ultimately decided it was a bad idea to be eating and drinking things he didn't know what they were. Especially if it was recommended by a talking door with a bad sense of humor. He left the table and moved back to the door asking, Can I just crawl through you? Woody scrunched up his face in deep thought and replied, Well I suppose you can, you are small enough to do so, but first you have to unlock me with the key. What key? The one behind you. Izuku looked back to the tea table to see a little golden key glimmering on top. At this point Izuku was beginning to sense a pattern. That or Woody was just trying to mess with him. He huffed angrily stamping his feet on the ground and complained to the door, I wish you had told me that a bit earlier. He stomped over to the table grabbed it and stomped back to Woody, but realizing how he was going to unlock him. Woody must have saw this and reassured him saying, Don't get cold feet now lad. Just pop the key into me hole and twist. Wood then stood still with his keyhole mouth in the right position. Izuku then popped the key and twisted it to the left and the door slid right open. The green-haired boy got on all fours and began to crawl through the opening. Almost immediately after a few seconds of crawling he could see light on the other side along with new sounds. Suddenly Woody called out from behind him, Good luck out there son, you're going to need it. Suddenly the sound of a slamming door could be heard. Izuku looked behind him and saw nothing but a dirt dead end. No use in turning back now, he thought to himself. He then continued to the other side and what he found took his breath away. Izuku crawled out of the hole and saw a scenery so beautiful, unique, and awe-inspiring that it in the simplest of words possible, it stole his breath away. It was something of a cross between a forest and a valley, with tree, bushes, flowers, and mushrooms so large that it made Izuku feel like he had shrunken. Clear blue skies above with fluffy white and pink cloud that looked like cotton candy, crystal clear streams that trickled down rhythmically, it was all so surreal. The plants were also very unusual as not just for their size, but they looked very different. They were still green like any one plant but their shapes all looked made up, like something out of a child's mind. Even the flowers and mushrooms colors looked like something had just decided to throw random colors together. Though in spite of all that they were still gorgeous without a doubt, soon Izuku began to think he was no longer in Japan anymore. As he continued to admire everything he saw a whole host of things that just didn't look natural, like enormous toys and game pieces that looked like they were a part of the environment. Different kinds of sweets and baked goods were littered all around, some even growing from the ground. Drinks seemed to flow never-ending from their respective containers and either pooling on the ground, forming a small pond or streaming down into a river, and some were pouring into their appropriate cups and never seeming to fully fill up. It was also strange to young Izuku, like it was straight out of pure imagination or a fantasy story. Even the animals looked completely made up, the birds, the bugs, the fish, even the little creature that ran on the ground. Some looked like relatively normal animals with different colors. Some were too big or too small for what they were. Some looked like a two or even three-way cross of different species. Though the sounds and smells of this place made it feel like a perfect, serene, peaceful, paradise of imagination. However reality jump-started back into young Izuku's brain. And when he was done admiring everything around him he realized that he had no idea where he was or how to even get home from wherever here was. Now he no longer had a feeling of wonder. Now dread and fear slowly started to creep its long clawed fingers up his body and into every fiber of his being. The awe-inspiring area around no longer felt peaceful and serene, now it only felt creepy and ominous. Izuku gulped at the thoughts and feelings rushing through his mind and body. Though one thing remains true in his fear-stricken mind, he had to find his way home and fast. The question was how to get out of here. He decided to just keep walking forward and follow the dirt road hoping to find somewhere or someone for direction. And he did just that and he walked, and walked, and walked, and walked for what seemed like hours on end. At times he would come to a fork in the road or a sign with gibberish written all over it that seemed to point in every which direction. Though no matter what road he took what sign he followed or shortcut he took through the forest, he always seemed to be find himself in an all too familiar location every time. Seeing the same post signs, the same trees, the same roads, it was like he was going around in one giant loops. Eventually he came to an all too familiar fork in the road and stopped when he got to the sign that hung in the twisted tree in between the forked road. He looked at the sign only to see the same exact gibberish that he saw the last 100 times. At this point Izuku was exhausted, scared, and on the verge of an emotional breakdown. In his young mind he only saw one option remaining before he broke down and hoping someone would save him. 
And as loud as he could in a shaking voice he called out, Mommy, Kachin, anyone, help. But no one and no thing replied back it was just quiet. Realizing no one was around Izuku slumped down on the old twisted tree and hugging his face into his knee he began to softly weep. He only got the chance to weep for a few moments before a voice called out saying, So, you really can talk, HM? And here I thought you couldn't speak to begin with. But I really shouldn't be one to talk about talking, since I always steal everyone tongue from their mouths. Izuku's head shot up and he frantically looked around for the source of the voice. After finding no one around him he shouted nervously, W who's there? W where are why you? Up here on the tree behind you, said the mysterious voice. Izuku looked up to the tree but only saw a tree. He looked to the left and the voice said, cold. He continued to look to the left, still cold. He looked to the right, warmer. He continued to look to the right, warmer. He then looked above the spot and the voice called out with glee, hot, you're on fire. When he came to the spot in the tree there was nothing there except a very slight and thin warp in the tree's branches. Izuku squinted at the spot and without warning a large toothy smile appeared. A talking mouth. Izuku stated flabbergasted. Well of course a mouth can talk all mouths talk, just in different ways. The mouth explained with a hint of malice in its voice. Then a floating mouth. Izuku questioned. Have you ever heard the term, things aren't all that they seem to be? Well same goes here. Nothing is ever truly discounted. Everything is connected to something no matter how big or small. And I'm certainly an exception to that. After all I'm not just some random floating mouth. The mouth said as a pair of yellow eyes and dark grey stripes appeared out of the air. Then the rest of the creature filled in to reveal a very very unusual and unsettling looking cat that seemed to grin menacingly from ear to ear. A talking Nico, Izuku said in bewilderment. Nico, the strange cat questioned. If memory serves then that's one of the Asian words for cat. And Nico hails from the island of Japan. So if I'm not mistaken you are Japanese or you not? Questioned the cat. Izuku was a little unsure of the cat's unusual speech and replied too quickly, no. I I mean yes. Yes I am. He corrected himself. The cat narrowed its eyes and replied in a scolding tone. Think before you speak boy, otherwise you'll sound illiterate and uneducated. I'm sorry. Izuku half mumbled in embarrassment. Now then, what's your name boy? Asked the cat. What's your name? Izuku rebounded. The cat put on a smile but his eyes showed annoyance as he replied strictly. It's impolite to ask for someone's name when you've been asked first. I am Midoriya Izuku. Izuku replied in shuddered embarrassment. If my memory still serves, you Japanese folk use you last name in place of your first name for introduction. Am I wrong? Asked the cat. And no. I I mean yes. He corrected himself. The cat seemed to smile menacing at his obvious distress. Who are you? The young boy asked. My apologies. Allow me to properly introduce myself. I am the Cheshire Cat or Cheshire Puss is my given name. You can call me whatever works for you. The cat introduced himself. Mr. Cheshire Nico, can you tell me where I am? Izuku asked. Why, you're here of course, he said with a devilish grin. No I mean where am I? What is this place, and how do I get out of this forest? I keep going in a circle, I want to go home. Izuku said with tears welling up in his big green eyes. Finding your way home is something you'll have to figure out on your own. The reason you're lost is because you don't know your way around. And no one has given you direction you haven't asked for, replied the cat. I guess that makes sense. Will you give me direction out of here? Izuku asked. That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. Nowhere in particular. Izuku began until the cat cut him off. Well then it doesn't matter where you go so long as you walk long enough to get somewhere. No, I mean I want to get out of wherever here is and to get out of this forest. Izuku shouted. Well I can give you direction out of here, if that's what you're asking of me. Questioned the cat. Izuku rapidly nodded his head. And as for this forest as you call it, it's called the Vale of Tears, explains the cat. The Vale of Tears. Yes, the Vale of Tears, sighs the cat. Such sweet sours that wash away the salt of despair and bloom forth the growth of new emotions to take root. The cat explained like a riddle. Izuku was mostly confused by his wording. As for where you are I can tell you quite simply. Spoke the cat in a menacing tone with a dramatic pause. However it is not a matter of where or when you are, but rather why. Izuku was still confused. The world that you are in does indeed have a name. And its name is Wonderland. Grinded the cat. As for where you are I can tell you quite simply. Spoke the cat in a menacing tone with a dramatic pause. However it is not a matter of where or when you are, but rather why. Izuku was confused. The world that you are in does indeed have a name. And its name is Wonderland. Grinded the cat. Now, Wonderland. Yes, Wonderland. A land of beauty, mystery, danger, and well. Wonder. And every creature that lives here will try to change your state of mind. Explained the cat. 
Izuku just looked at him confused again. In his mind the name Wonderland seemed very familiar, though he couldn't remember where he heard it. Wait, what was that second to last part about danger? Now then, why are you here boy? Asked the cat, suddenly remembering his horrifying trip down the rabbit hole. The sounds, the lights, the feeling of dread and death shooting through his whole body driving him to hysterical tears. Izuku began to visibly shudder and straighted to form large palls of tears in his large green eyes. The cat looked on at the sight and smiled with Grimes' pleasure. When Izuku finally found his voice he replied in a shaky tone. I I I was in the park W when I say a W white Yu Yuzagi and chased it D down into I its hole where. But before he could continue the cat cut him off asking, Yuzagi, if I'm not mistaken then that means rabbit? Asked the cat. Izuku nodded. A rabbit, a white rabbit you said. You did say a white rabbit, correct? Why yes, Izuku said shakily, with blue eyes, in a red waistcoat, yelling about being late for something. The cat described. Izuku perked up at this and replied happily, Yes, that's him. Do you know him? Izuku asked hopefully. The cat made an annoyed sigh and said, Unfortunately, he a friend of a dear friend of mine. Izuku's eyes glittered in delight as hope filled his body. Have you seen him? Do you know where he went? He asked the cat, to which the cat replied, I do. And if you are looking for him he went that away. He said pointing with his tail. So he went that way. Izuku asked pointing to where the cat's tail pointed. Which way? Asked the cat. He did. Who did? The white rabbit. What rabbit? Asked the cat. But you just said I mean oh never mind. He said looking towards the ground in a disappointed tone. Can you lay atop your head? Asked the cat. When Izuku looked back up at the cat he immediately noticed its headless neck with its head under its chest and its front paws using it to rest on. Along with that was the fact its head was still very much alive and smiling. Izuku let out a shrill yell at this sight. The cat's head grinded at him as he said, I guess not. The cat's neck bent down and popped its head back into place and continued to grin like nothing had happened. Izuku stammered back in fear of this sight and completely froze in place not knowing what the cat would do next. Then the cat threw him off guard asking the young boy, Do you still want those directions, or should I leave you to cower in place? Why yes, Izuku replies in more of a question than an answer. Suddenly the cat disappeared and reappeared on one of the twisted tree's branches far off to the right. In that direction, lies a hatter. He said waving his paw around to the right. It disappeared and reappear again this time at the opposite end of the tree, and in that direction, lives a hare nicknamed March, said the cat. Visit either if you like. They're both mad. Ta-ta, said the cat as it slowly started to disappear. What? Wait, Izuku yelled at the cat. The cat stopped halfway through its vanishing act and became completely visible once more. The cat looked at him inquisitively with a smile never leaving its face and waited for the young boy to speak. Did you just say that they're both mad? The cat nodded silently. But I don't want to meet any mad people. Izuku remarked. The cat chuckled at his reply. Izuku was confused and a bit insulted at the cat's attitude. The cat then replied, Oh, well you can't help that. We're all mad down here. Each and every one of us. They're mad, I'm mad, and you're mad too. Tuh. Then the cat started to disappear once more. Wait. Izuku snapped at the cat. The cat once more stopped its disappearing act with only its floating head being the only visible part of its body. How do you know I'm mad? Izuku inquires of the cat. Well if you weren't, you wouldn't be down here. And everyone down here. The cat paused for a moment before looking at Izuku with a sinister and malicious grin and finished, is completely mad. And with that the cat's head disappeared into thin air. Wait don't go. Izuku desperately called out to the cat. Tell me some other place to go. Tell me how to find the white Yuzagi. Tell me how to get out of Wonderland. I want to go home. Izuku yelled out with all his might. But no one was there. The cat was gone and Izuku was alone once more. He called out with all his might for the cat to reappear. But it never did. He called out for anyone to be out there to help him, but no one was there. No one around him. Nothing around him. Not even any sound from the forest behind him. It was quite, quiet and alone. And Izuku was alone with no sound but himself and his thoughts, which were of no help since his thoughts brought about terrible things. Things that a young boy should never even think about. Things that should never be talked about. Izuku found himself slumped down with his back against the old twisted tree once more, tears already brimming in his big green eyes. He brought his head into his knees and began to sob loudly. He wept and wept and wept and wept, for what seemed like hours to the young green-haired boy. But Thom sought no end in sight. The feeling of helplessness weighing over him was completely unbearable as he wept it even more and harder. When suddenly out of absolutely nowhere, a very small and shaky voice called out to the weeping boy asking him, Excuse me, little boy, but are you okay? Izuku slowly brought his head up from his knees unsure if he wanted to see what potentially mind-breaking creature was in front of him this time. When he did however he saw something much more strange than some backwards creature from this fantasy land. Instead he found a boy, an odd-looking human boy at that. He was a bit older than Izuku between 10 to 12 years old. 
He had very soft facial features with piggy cheeks and the lightest shade of blue eyes he had ever seen. In addition he had tear track stains running down both sides of his face to the point they looked like they were permanently engraved into his cheeks. He had no hair on his head as it was all shaved off with little stubbles just starting to grow back in. His only clothing was a straight jacket that had been unclipped and so big on him it looked like a dress, with the sleeves so big they flopped like bird wings when he moved them. He wiped the tears from his eyes and in a shaky voice asked in a British accent, Are you okay? Can you talk? Are you hurt? Seeing him as no such danger or threat, Izuku wiped his eyes and replied, No I'm not okay. This made the older boy jump in surprise and fear. I want to go home. The green boy cried. The older boo said nothing for a while as he looked like he was processing what he heard. I can take you home, said the odd boy. Izuku immediately perked up at this and hopping to his feet asked excitedly, You can, really? The odd boy nodded and replied, Of course, but I can't do it myself. I'll need the help of another, that is if I can find him. But before I do I have a few questions I want to ask you. Seeing no harm in answering his questions, considering he was actually going to help him, he nods at the odd boy who asks, How did you get down here and why were you sitting here crying? Izuku tried to steady his breath as he didn't want to relive his fall down that hellish rabbit hole, and with a large stutter in his voice replied, I I was in the pea park and out of nowhere a W white Yuzagi came o out of the bee bushes. Yuzagi, questioned the odd boy. Rabbit, a strange voice called out. A white rabbit. The odd boy half yelled in surprise, causing Izuku to jump back and reply in slight fear, yes, in a red waistcoat, with a gold watch, running about yelling I'm late I'm late I'm late. Asked the boy. Yes, yes, that's him. Do you know him where is he can he get me home is he nice? Izuku bombarded the boy with questions, jumping up and down. The odd boy seemed to grow sad and replied, I'm afraid I don't know where he is, I'm not sure of that myself half of the time. Izuku's hope began to die down until the odd boy continued, but he is a dear friend of mine and I'm sure he's more than willing to help you if I ask him, and though I may not know where he is, I do know someone who does. This brought back Izuku's joys and hopes right back up. By the by, why were you crying over here anyway? He asked. Izuku began to twiddle his finger and looking down explained, I meet someone who wasn't very friendly to me. He gave me direction I didn't want. He teased me, confused me with big words, he kept smiling at me, and then he disappeared. Who was this very unpleasant sounding person? The odd boy asked. It was a cat. He replied simply. The odd boy gave him a look before asking. Yellow eyes, gray stripes, talks in riddles, disappears into thin air, can take his head off his body. Exactly. Cheshire puss. The odd boy said in an angry annoyed voice like Kachin. Where did you last see him? Izuku pointed to the last spot where the cat was and the odd boy walked by him looked up at the spot and in a scudding voice shouted, Cheshire Puss, show yourself. But no reply came. The odd boy huffed in angry annoyance and shouted, I know you're up there. I heard you from earlier telling me what Yuzagi meant. And I certainly know you wouldn't miss the spectacle of watching someone cry for your sick twisted enjoyment, especially a child. Suddenly a large smiling grin appeared out of thin air. Oh my dear sweet Alan, do you always have to ruin my fun? Questioned the mouth. Yes, I do. The odd boy, Alan, exclaimed while crossing his arms in annoyance. And I told you not to call me that. Alan fumed. And you know exactly why I ruin your so-called fun. He spat at the mouth. Your fun is revolting, uncivilized, unethical, inhumane, and above all rude. He said in a disgusted voice, counting on his fingers. But you know I can't help myself. After all I get bored so easily. The chance simply arose and I took it. The mouth argued innocently as two yellow eyes and some grey stripes appeared, no more than anyone else would. It continued to argue as the rest of it filled in to reveal the Cheshire Cat. No one, and I mean no one would have taken your so-called chance. Alan fumed at the cat crossing his arms. Ah, but you did and now here you are with this boy. The cat shot back, except I'm helping him, not misleading him and then bringing him to tears like you. Alan shot back angrily. Alan made a noise in the back of his throat and spat. You're absolutely no help at all Cheshire Puss. Oh but you know I can be. And you of all people know this better than anyone else. Said the cat with a malicious grin on its face, as if it won the argument. Alan simply gave it a deadpan expression and pointing to the ground commanded, Get down here now. Like it was a loyal dog the Cheshire Cat jumped from the branches and landed right next to Alan. Where it sat in place like a loyal pet. When Izuku finally saw the Cheshire Cat up close he took immediate notice of how disturbing it looked. For starters it was huge, at eyes height with Izuku when sitting and tall enough for Alan to rest his chin on its head. At first glance it appeared to have no fur at all and just skin, but instead had small bits of hair just starting to growing like Alan. The only abundance of hair growing on it was at the top of its tail which made it look like a paintbrush. In addition to it lack of fur its body shape was very prominent and very very thin. 
almost no meat on it bones, and speaking of which its bones shone distinctly through its skin and were almost outlined by the color of its fur, making it look like it was wearing a skeletal suit. Its head was seemed too big for its thin neck and smaller body, but still the cat was able to hold and move it about like it was nothing. However, the most disturbing thing about the feline was it had blood stained on its white teeth and lower lip, like it killed something recently. Izuku took a few steps back at the sight of the strange cat. That and the fact it craned its neck uncontrollably close to Izuka's face. Alan turned around and turning to the cat said sweetly, Now Cheshire isn't there something you want to say to um? Alan trailed off not yet knowing Izuku's name. Izuku saw this and quickly introduced himself, Midoriya Izuku. The Cheshire cat turned to Alan and explained quickly. The Japanese used their last name in pretense to their first. Alan nodded and turning to the cat asked, Don't you have to say something to Izuku, hum? The Cheshire cat looked to Alan then Izuku, You're never getting out of here. This is your new home now. You'll never see your family or friends ever again. So get used to it cause you'll be a permanent resident of Wonderland, forever. Exclaimed the Cheshire cat in a malicious and psychotic voice. Izuku began to weep at this news and the cat simply smiled sadistically at his dismay. That is until a small fist knocked the Cheshire cat in the head so hard that his eyes nearly popped out from the impact. Alan loomed over the cat and threateningly and said, Try. It. Again. The Cheshire cat looked back to Izuku and with a grin and quickly said, your face smells. Another and harder knock on the head came from the fist of Alan as he yelled, Try it again. The Cheshire cat turned to Izuku again and this time asked him, How long does it take before you become a human scratching post? Izuku didn't answer. Answer, I'll tell you in about five seconds. It grinded maliciously inching closer to him. Before he could take another moment closer to Izuku a fist flew under the cat's chin with just force that its head rocketed off its body and into the old twisted tree where it got stuck upside down in its twisted branches. The cat's head looked down at the tearing green-haired boy and the angry bald boy. With its grin now looking like a frown it stated with almost amazement in its voice, I must say you certainly have gotten stronger, dear sweet Alan. The cat said his name in a teasing tone. I told you to stop calling me that. Alan yelled while stamping his bare feet in frustration. He turned to Izuku and profusely apologized to him saying, I'm so sorry about Cheshire Puss. He says the cat's name with distance and loud enough for him to hear. He's usually not this bad. Usually. I'm so sorry about all those things he said, none of it was true. You'll get back home I'll make sure of it personally. He just liked to say those things to see others' reactions. Also I dare say he doesn't have a single shred of decency in any fiber of his being. He explained. Though the only thing to slip Izuku's lips were, doesn't that hurt him? Alan giggles at his response and shaking his head explained, it really doesn't. This kind of this happens all the time and it never seemed to harm him. Also all Cheshire cats can do what he does. Just then the Cheshire cat's head wiggled loose from the branches and hopped along the tree until its head just stopped, floating in mid-air until its body appeared out of thin air underneath it, all the while its grin never leaving its face. Appearances as you know are very deceiving. Nothing is ever as it seems to be, said the cat, unless you already know, henceforth it's not deceiving. Now, since you're going to be no help go crawl back to whatever hovel you call home. I'll call for you again as I see fit, Alan said back sternly. Why, you seem to be on edge. The cat asked almost as if to get a reaction from him. I am very much on edge thank you very much. And you're certainly not helping either. He replied. Perfect when you're not on edge you're taking up too much space. And with that last quote he disappeared into thin air leaving only his grin behind for it to disappear not long after. Alan huffed in annoyance and turning to Izuku said. Come on then, let's get you back home then, shall we? My friend, who knows where the white rabbit might be, is not too far from here. He said grabbing Izuku's hand. Who is this person? Izuku asked as he walked with Alan on the path to the left. Why he's the Mad Hatter. At this Izuku stopped cold in his tracks and said fearfully. But I don't want to meet any mad people. Alan looked at him strangely and replied. Well that really can't be helped. After all, we're all mad down here. But aren't mad people dangerous? Izuku asked. Some of them are yes. Some of them are sad. Some are angry. Other are just quite. In the end they're all human, just like me and you. Only they've been hurt. And hurt very very bad. Alan explained. Izuku thought over what Alan said and decided that it would okay to meet this mad hatter as long as he was careful. Alan almost seemed to read his mind as he reassured him saying, Don't worry your head off about him, he's actually rather friendly and charming dot 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 to a degree. You'll be fine as long as you're with me. Alan then pulled on Izuku's hand and dragged him down the path. Izuku stopped again realizing he forgot to ask something from Alan. Alan turned back to Izuku with a confused expression as Izuku asked, um, I never got your name before. Alan seemed to blush in embarrassment at his mistake and clearing his throat he said charmingly in his British accent, My deepest apologies. Where are my manners today? My name is Alan, Alan Little. A pleasure to me you Izuku Midoriya. Izuku's face was now a dark shade of crimson red from Alan's forwardness. 
Alan immediately took notice of this and tilting his head like a confused dog asked him, What's wrong? Why you see called me B by MYF first name? Izuku replied with a heavy stutter. Even after W we only J just met. Alan looked at the green-haired boy in confusion and asked, Yes, why wouldn't I? Did I do something wrong? Suddenly the Cheshire Cat reappeared in an instant and answered Alan's confusion. The Japanese only allow the usage of their first name to others who are either family, close friend or lovers. As such referring to them by their last name is very proper, unless you are that close to the person. And with that the Cheshire Cat disappeared once more. Alan looked to Izuku as a small smile formed on his lips and he began to softly giggle. Izuku felt somewhat insulted at this gesture and snapped at Alan half yelling. What's so funny? Alan giggled for another moment longer before clearing his throat and reply. I'm sorry, it's just everyone refers to each other by last name instead of first, and doing so is considered risca. That's silly. He giggled some more. Izuku pouted with his cheeks inflated and flustered red feeling very insulted that his customs were being insulted by someone else. How could he just laugh like it really was just a childish thing? It's very proper to call someone you don't know very well by their last name and such behavior has been ingrained into him since he could clearly remember. While Alan continued to lightly giggle, Izuku was becoming more and more angry by the second, to the point where his pouting cheeks were as red as Kachin's eyes. Izuku stamped his feet and in an annoyed tone asked, Oh yeah well how do people refer to each other from where you're from? Alan stopped his giggling fit and calmly explained, Where I'm from everyone refers to each other by their first name unless they are a superior, in which case you call them by their last name with the prefix of Mr. or Mrs. before their name. Sometimes if you have great respect for someone you would call them sir or governor, m lordship, ma'am or m lady, ladyship. Izuku looked at him for a minute before finally rappling. That sounds silly. While trying not to giggle himself, Alan made another small giggle and replied, Well to each his own I suppose. But you're still more than welcome to call me Alan or even dear Alan or sweet Alan. Everyone does. What about dear sweet Alan? Izuku asked. However, at that very moment Izuku could have sworn he felt the temperature suddenly drop down a few degrees and a powerful wind swept through the forest. When Izuku looked back to Alan for an answer he was still and quiet with a shadow covering his face and an iry aura around him that made Izuku shiver involuntarily. The sleeves of Alan's arms fluttered a bit as if to indicate his fists were now balled up, and in a very light tone and serious tone Alan replied, By all means, please, refrain from ever calling me that. Izuku gulped and softly replied, I'm sorry. It's just the Cheshire Cat calls you that so I thought. Cheshire calls me that nickname because he the only one that can escape. Alan interrupted him. Escape. Escape from what? Izuku asked cautiously. Alan's menacing aura seemed to fade as he brought his hands to his hand like he was having a severe headache, while the temperature seems to rise to normal once more. And returning to his charming British self replied, It's nothing never mind, let's just get to the hatter shall we? He asked weakly. Alan started to walk with his hands to his head and began to sway back and forth like he was suffering from a case of vertigo. Izuku felt worry course through his body as he ran over to the tittering boy and grabbed the sleeve of his straight jacket trying to look for his hand to hold onto it. When he did, Alan turned back to him and gave him an inquisitive look. Izuku looked down at the floor still afraid to look at the older boy's eyes. If you're not feeling well we can take a break right now until you feel better. I don't mind waiting for a bit. He offered. Alan smiled and holding Izuku's hand under his sleeve replied. It's alright, I should feel better within a few moments, I merely need to walk it off. Besides as they say there's no time like the present to accomplish your goals am I right? I guess. Alan giggled. Then let us be on our way. He said enthusiastically. Just before they continued on their journey Izuku stopped once more and said to Alan. Um, you can call me Izuku if you want, if that's alright with you Alan. Alan smiled at his offer and replied. Yes that's fine with me, Izuku. And off the two boy traveled down the direct path to the home of the March Hare to meet the Mad Hatter to find the White Rabbit. Oh dear oh dear me. This is quite the kerfuffle that our boys seem to have found themselves in, isn't it? The two boys continued their walk along the path for quite a fair bit of time. And by walk I mean Alan was practically dragging poor Izuku as the older boy skipped happily along while the younger boy just barely managed to keep pace with him. Eventually Izuku was getting pretty tired of getting dragged and released Alan's hand to catch his breath. Alan stopped his merriment and turned back to the younger boy on his hands and knee breathing heavily. Why are you skipping? Izuku asked breathlessly. Why not? Alan rebutted. It's fun. But why are you so happy, especially being in this mad world? Izuku asked. Alan put a sleeve to his chin as he pondered his question. Well, this world is quite mad but so is the world you live in yes. Izuku questioned this and nodded lightly. Well why not have fun? I mean, the lives we live are very short and the worlds we live in are very much bleak, barren, and shallow. So the only thing we can do is make the most of what we can in live every day to the fullest of its potential. And if that's not a reason to be happy, 
then I'm not sure what is. Alan explained. Izuku thought about what the older boy had said, and even though he didn't understand most of what he was saying, he understood enough for the point to come across. He nodded his head to let the older boy know he understood. Alan smiled and reached his hand out for Izuku who grabbed it and hoisted himself up. It's much more fun to skip to where you need to get to. It also gets you there much quicker, don't you agree? Alan asked, but isn't skipping for girls? Izuku asked. Alan giggled at his question and asked back, Now who told you that rubbish? Kachin. Izuku replied without missing a beat. Then he doesn't sound very smart. Alan replied. Izuku's expression went pale as he wiped his head around looking or Kachin if he heard what Alan said. If he did then things weren't going to go well for either of them. What are you doing? Alan asked inquisitively. Izuku quickly realized that there is no way that Kachin could be anywhere around them, especially down here. Izuku blushed as he said embarrassed. Um, looking for Kachin. Is he mad? Asked Alan. I question that sometimes. He replied as he looked to the ground. So dot 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 he is mad. Inquired Alan. Well, um, I mean, I'm not sure. Izuku stammered out quickly. Then don't question something unless you know the answer to it. Stated Alan. Then how will I know something if I don't question it? Izuku asked. Simple, you find out for yourself so you don't have to question it. You see, Alan explained like it was obvious. Alan's statement made just as much sense as it didn't. But Izuku nodded anyway not wanting to push the subject any further. And besides that, who cares what other people think say or do of whatever it is you do? As long as like who you are and what you do then it doesn't matter what other think. This statement made much more sense to Izuku and he nodded his head enthusiastically with a smile. As the two boys skipped through the forest hand in hand Alan began humming a song over and over, Izuku wondered what it was he was humming and inquired of him, Hey Alan, what are you doing? I'm humming. Alan replied simply. I mean what are you humming? A song, Alan said with a mischievous look from the corner of his eye. He was obviously teasing Izuku. And Izuku saw this while trying to restrain his giggling from his attempt at humor. I mean what kind of song? Izuku asked trying to hold back his giggles. It's a sort of lullaby the Duchess used to sing to her baby all the time. Really, how does it go? Izuku asked excitedly. Alan then stopped skipping with Izuku and began to recite the song for him he called the Song of Pepper. Speak roughly to your little boy. And beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy. Because he knows it teases. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes. For he can thoroughly enjoy. The pepper when he pleases. Izuku could only blink as he looked on at Alan completely dumbfounded by what he even just sang. And how he could even consider that an appropriate song in the first place. That's not a very nice song. Izuku said simply. Many a lullabies and nursery rhymes you know will have very dark meaning to them, and even darker origins. A menacing voice called out of nowhere. Before the two boys could look around for the voice, the Cheshire cat appeared before them out of thin air grinning as it usually does. Cheshire puss. Alan scolded the cat. Didn't I tell you that if you'll be no help at all then to just leave? I certainly don't need you scaring poor Izuku any more than you have. Oh but why would I leave and not telling the boy about his own hypocrisy? Replied the cat. Alan simple growled at the cat as he stood between him and Izuku for protection. Like I said previously, many of the song you know and love to sing or how did you say it not nice? The cat motioned to Izuku. What do you mean? Izuku asked in a low and frightened tone. Izuku don't pay him any mind. It only encourages him further. Alan warned him. Now why would he not want to ask questions any further? It certainly doesn't take me saying that his curiosity is now peaked, stated the cat. Let's take one song that I'm sure is a favorite of yours. Say ring around the rosy, asked the cat. Izuku said nothing as he peeked from behind Alan's back, though his curiosity was now certainly piqued. And seeing this the cat grinned ever more menacingly as he explained further, let's start from the beginning shall we? Did you know of a very tragic time in your human history? So tragic in fact that it was the inspiration for the song. Izuku very lightly shook his head no. It was created after a great plague struck the world by storm, known by many as the bubonic plague or known by many more as the black death. Izuku shook his head again and lightly squeaked out, Black Death. Yes, the Black Plague was its name and death was its game. It struck all of Europe and most of Asia during the medieval ages, ravaged thousands and killed millions. The cat continued. Let's start at the beginning of the song, Ring Around the Rosy. A red ring around a boil of inflamed infected skin. A pocket full of posses. During that time people would keep posses and other strong scented flowers and herbs to ward off the stench of the diseased and the decaying corpse that continuously piped up. Ashes ashes. After the boils formed on the body the next symptom would be severe sneezing fits, pronounced as ashes instead of a chew like today. The sneezing would be quickly replaced by coughing, then vomiting, then vomiting blood. And the last part, we all fall down. We all fall dead, explained the cat cynically. By now poor Izuku was clutching to Alan's straight jacket in horrified fear like his life depended on it. 
All the while Alan was standing there trying his best to comfort the terrified young boy and gave the Cheshire Cat the most hellish murderous expression in history. The cat grinned ever more at his handful work and with a boy or a bounce in his suntical voice said, Well I hope that changed your view on things, my work here is done and I really must be off, ta-ta. And with that the cat vanished once more. Alan only stood there staring with murderous intent glowing in his eyes staring at the spot where the Cheshire Cat once sat. He growled to himself about all the horrendous things he'd do if he ever caught the damn bloody cat. Before he could continue grumbling any further Alan heard a small whimper from behind him. He turned around and saw poor little Izuku all hold on the ground holding his knees to his chest as he whimpered silently while steady streams of tears flowed down his face, trying to hold in his cries. Alan cursed himself for completely forgetting about Izuku behind him, and falling to his knees he held up Izuku's face in a comforting manner like his mother used to, and softly cooed to him as best he could, no no no, it's okay, no tears no tears, there's no need to cry, you're fine, everything is going to be okay, you're okay, even though Alan didn't know a single lick of how to comfort someone or even the right word to say. He still had to try his best with the zero experience he had available to him. Eventually Izuku stopped whimpering and finally opened his tightly closed eyes still brining with tears and looked at Alan. Alan made a soft sigh of relief as he thought Izuku was beginning to calm down some. Almost immediately Izuku completely broke down, roughly crying his eyes out and howling in sadness. The tears were now falling off his face like a spigot set on high pressure and his cries could be heard from far sides of the veil. Alan was surprised at his sudden breakdown hoping that his words would have at least did some form of comforting for the green-haired child. Alan tired his best to calm Izuku down. He tried cooing kind words to him again. He tried using encouraging words, he even tried to sing another song one without a dark origin to it, though nothing seemed to work to calm down the hysterically crying boy. Feeling as though he fail in his one and only task Alan too began to weep silently with tears starting to fill his sky-blue eyes. Izuku saw this through his veil of tears and tried to calm himself down enough to talk properly. When he did he looked up to the older boy and asked, why or why you see crying? The older boy looked down at Izuku and tried to say something but only got a choked up responses that caused more tears to coagulate and pour down his face. Soon after his failed attempt at speaking the older boy immediately began to weep and howl just as hard as Izuku did before. Not too long after Izuku began to cry again and with just as much gusto. Soon the two boys were in each other's arms weeping and howling with equal power. After about an hour of the two boys weeping and howling with each other, they soon found themselves very much tuckered out, emotionally. The two boys sat under one of the large trees with Alan's back to the tree and Izuku sitting in his lap resting his head on his chest and Alan slowly patting his back. For a long while the two of them said absolutely nothing and simply stayed quite enjoying the peace and ambience of the veil. Eventually Izuku, without taking his head off of the older boy's chest, asked, Alan, hum, he replied, was what the Cheshire Cat said true, about the song. Alan knew there was no use in lying to him, especially since he didn't lie himself, so he let out a small sigh and replied in a calm tone, yes he was right about the origin and meaning of that song, every last part. Izuku was silent for a moment before burying his face into his straight jacket, why? He asked, why what? Alan asked back confused. Why would someone make a happy-sounding song from such a terrible event like a illness that killed tons of people? He explained burying his face deeper into the older boy's straight jacket. It just doesn't make any sense. Actually it makes perfect sense. Alan stated calmly. Izuku could only look at him flabbergasted by his morbid statement. How could you even think to say something like that? He yelled at him clutching to his straight jacket out of anger. Alan was quiet for a moment as he looked up at the tree and calmly explained. In times of great suffering when we are at the end of our line, Making the horrible into a fun, good thing is the only thing you can do. It's the only thing that can help you work with the pain, or let it completely crushes you to nothing. Izuku looked at Alan with a mixture of understanding and disbelief at his wisdom, before he could even process what he was saying. How do you know this? Alan sighed heavily with sadness and lightly replied, Because I've been at the end of my line many a time, I have endured great suffering, all on my lonesome. Alan looked like he was about to cry once more, but quick as a whip, Izuku buried his face into the older boy's chest once more and kindly said, You don't have to suffer anymore. I'm here now and I'll help you find more slack in your line. Izuku wasn't entirely sure what he was saying, though he hoped that it made Alan feel at least a little better. And indeed it made his feel so much better, so much lighter, so much more happier. Alan couldn't hold back the huge smile stretching across his face or tears on welling up in his eyes as he replied, Thank you. I'm no longer suffering, now that you're here. After a while longer the two boys eventually got back to their feet and were about to continue on their walk to the Mad Hatter's tea party when Izuku called for Alan's attention with a question. Hey Alan, why is the Cheshire Cat mad? 
Alan gave him a puzzled look. I mean he's kind of creepy and scary, appears to be goofy and silly at times, and even sadistic and malicious at the same time, but not mad. Before Alan could even open his mouth with a reply, a very familiar voice came from behind Izuku and asked, So you want to know why I'm mad? Suddenly Alan grabbed Izuku and yanked the little green-haired boy behind him just as he saw the Cheshire Cat's signature grin form out of air. The rest of the car filled in moments and looked at Izuku, who was cowering in fear of the creature. Well, do you want to know why I'm mad or not? Asked the cat. Izuku inadvertently nodded his head yes and the cat grimes at his decision. And so he explained his madness, a dog's not mad you grant that. Again Izuku nodded. Well, when a dog wags its tail that means it's pleased, and when it growls it's upset. Now, when I growl I'm pleased, and when I wag my tail I'm upset. Henceforth, I must be mad. The cat said like it was obvious. I call it purring, not growling, resorted Izuku shyly. Call it what you wish. We all have our own way of saying things, and if one thing remains certain I'm down here, and like I said before everyone down here is mad, including you. The cat said maliciously. And with that it disappeared. Cheshire Cat really is a jerk, stated Izuku. Alan signed apathetically and replied. Well yes he is, but let not talk or even think of Cheshire Puss anymore or we may just see him again to tease us. After Alan said that the Cheshire Cat's smile and eyes appeared grinning widely at the older boy. Alan saw the cat and immediately yelled, get lost, to which its grind and eyes disappeared again. But the cat, hopefully, now gone the two boys picked themselves up and continue on their mini-adventure to help Izuku find his way out of Wonderland and back home. The two boys then continued to skip hand in hand down the path to their destination. They had been skipping in virtual silence for a solid 30 minutes enjoying the quiet and ambience. When they finally came out of the Vale of Tears forest and into a wide field of rolling green pastures, Izuku's eyes widened with wonder as he saw the largest, greenest, and most beautifully breathtaking field he had even seen in his young life. To say he was starstruck was a complete understatement. Words could not even comprehend the feeling he was experiencing while immersing himself of this awe-inspiring location. Alan could see Izuku's glittering wonder over his shoulder, and he chuckled at his odd expression. Do you like it? He asked. It's the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my whole life. Izuku stated with great zeal. And in the simplest of words, it truly was. The lush meadow spread out far into the horizon on all sides. Wildflowers of all different shapes, sizes, and colors all were scattered all across the landscape. The sound of a babbling brook could be heard not too far off. The wind blew gently and rhythmically across the whole area throughout the grass and flowers. The sound of birds and insects could be heard singing to one another. Clouds moved slowly across the sky creating small patches of shade here and there. It was so unreal, so entrancing, so wonderful. Alan tugged at Izuka's hand to grab his attention and said, Come on then. No use in standing here and watching the beauty. Let's immerse ourselves in it. Izuku smiled brightly and the two boys took off running and giggling like two little overly excited animals. Izuku immediately went over to all the flowers near him and began to admire and smell each one. They all looked different from one another, but the thing that stood out the most was their smells. Some smelled bland, other tart or really sweet, some even smelled like fresh food and sweets. The most curious thing of all was the fact that some of them were alive. Some would giggle and try to push Izuku away. Others would purposely spew out their pollen on him. Some would even snap or growl at him. There were even a few flowers that would sniff him back or even lick him. This made Izuku giggle uncontrollably, especially when the snapdragon started to tickle him. Alan on the other hand was very preoccupied trying to catch a dragonfly that seemed to tease him by flying away quickly when he tried to grab it. The little flying bug even zipped by his face even just hoving right near his eyes, as if to tease him further. Eventually his attention was turned by another strange creature in some tall grass that popped its head out from all the noise. It appeared to be a rabbit, but with a long mouse tail, and possessing an unusual color. Then about three more peeked their heads out, a gold one, a blue one, and an orange one. After seeing them all, Alan immediately ran towards them, and in turn the creatures squeaked and turned tail running much faster than Alan. Alan would go around and chase his one then see another go by and chase that one. This continued in until he finally grabbed one of the buff balls at the end of the creature's tails and the buff ball popped right off. Both the creatures and Alan stopped in their tracks. Alan walked up to the purple one with the puff in hand. The creature did not run instead stood perfectly still and even offered Alan its tail. Alan took the animal's tail in hand and placed the puff ball back on it. The purple creature then shook its tail to make sure it was on. When it was satisfied it looked to Alan with a mischievous look on its face and along with its other friends began to chase Alan. Alan squealed with delight at the game, but didn't go on for long since the rabbit creatures were much faster than him and pounced on him in moments. Alan laughed hysterically as the four animals began to rub their soft bodies all over Alan and nearly drown him in saliva from licking his face all over. Back with Izuku, he had finally managed to break free of the tickling snapdragons and tried to catch his breath from all the laughing. 
when suddenly a honeybee came a little too close for comfort. Izuku tried to shoo away the little bug but it only kept advancing closer to him. Izuku started to get very scared as knowing firsthand how painful a bee sting is. When the little bug managed to land on his nose that's when all hell broke loose. Izuku immediately began to scream and cry as he swatted at the little creature. When it fell off his nose Izuku made a beeline for Alan, who was no longer playing with the rabbit creatures being drawn by Izuku's crying, and ran right into his straight jacket for protection. Alan held the young boy in his arms wonder what in the world got him so worked up. Then he saw the culprit flying at mock speed towards them, which was actually pretty slow all things considered. Izuku saw the little incest flying towards him and made a little yelp before burying his face in Alan's outfit and crying hysterically. Alan tried to hold his laughter back, as to not make the young green-haired boy feel any worse, and held his sleeve's hand out. The honeybee saw this the invitation and flew right on his palm like a tame bird. Alan rolled up his opposite sleeve and began to softly pet the tiny yellow bug like it was a dog of sorts. He then got Izuku to come out of his, not so clever, hiding spot and showed him the little bug in his sleeve. Izuku made a sound like distressed mouse and cowered before the little creature. Alan made a quite scoff at his behavior and calming told him, it's okay, she's not gonna hurt you, she just wants to be pet. See, he held the bug a bit closer. Izuku saw that the bug was sitting perfectly still comfortable on Alan's sleeve. Izuku brought his face fully from Alan's outfit and merely stared at the bugs. Do you want to hold her? She just wants a little pet from you. Alan offered. Izuku rubbed his tear-filled eyes and nodded. Alan then let the little insect crawl from his sleeves to Izuku's hand, and like before only sat comfortably in his hand. He then carefully took three fingers and slowly petted the little animal across its back. When Izuku stopped the bee twiddled its antenna and reached up its front limbs as if it were begging for more affection. Both Izuku and the honey bee's eyes glittered in excitement. Izuku then proceeded to pet the little bug some more. However he petted the little creature too hard and ended up squashing it by accident. Izuku quickly realized what he did and slowly uncovered his hand only to find the decrepit and squished form of the bee in his hand. Izuku's eyes started to fill with tears once more and not too longer after he began to wail for the death of his little friend. Izuku's shrill cries were so loud and ear-piercing that the rabbit creatures held their ears from the noise. Even some of the living flower turned away and bent towards the ground from the noise. One of the rabbit creatures tugged on Alan's straitjacket holding down on its ears from the pain, and yelped at him rapidly as if begging him to stop Izuku's crying. Alan then quickly snacked the little incest's broken body from Izuku's hand and covered it with both sleeves of his jacket. He closed his eyes and focused. Then a small light emitted from underneath his sleeves for a brief moment. And when he lifted up his sleeve there in his covered palm sat the little honeybee, good as new, almost as if it was never squished in the first place. Alan managed to calm Izuku's crying fit down long enough for him to show the honeybee back in perfect health. Izuku immediately calmed his own cry and looked on at the little bug in complete disbelief and guilt. The little bug looked back at him with almost a look of worry on its tiny face. Izuku rubbed his eyes and in a stutter, I am sorry F for squishing why you. I I didn't mean to. He apologized to the little bug. The honeybee then flew up to Izuku's nose and placed what he only thought could be a kiss on it, as if to say that she forgave him. The honeybee the flew over to Alan's ear and buzzed something into it, almost like it was telling him something. It then proceeded to grab hold of Alan's jacket collar and tried to pull him in a certain direction. Alan took Izuku's hand and followed after the little bug. It flew in a zigzag motion, and the boys tried to follow in its flight path getting dizzy and bumping into one another along the way, until it came upon a small sapling growing all alone on a small hilltop. On a low-hanging branch sat the bee's hive suspended from it, with dozens of bees flying in and out of it. The honeybee then flew into the hive with the two boys not too far behind. When the boys came to the hive Izuku noticed that there were two very large bees by the entrance wearing very tiny suits of armor which made them look like guards. The honey bee FLW out from the hive and flew over to Alan's ear and buzzed something to him. When the bee flew back into the hive Alan walked up to the hive and standing on the tips of his toes knocked gently on the hive walls. After a moment or two a very large bee, larger than the guards, flew out of the hive and landed on Alan's covered hand as he offered it. In addition being the largest bee its colors were far more prominent and brighter than the others. It wore a tiny gold crown with red jewels, a tiny purple cape on it back with white fur trim, and it was even holding a tiny scepter. No doubt that this was the queen bee. Buzz buzz buzz, buzz buzz buzz, said the queen. This is the queen bee she has graciously graced us with her presence on behalf of her worker. Alan translated, may we have some of your delicious honey your majesty. Alan asked the queen, pewetty pewies, Izuku had cutely. The queen seemed to blush in Izuku's cute child talk and replied, Buzz buzz buzz, buzz buzz. She said yes. Alan translated, Just wait for her to call out her workers and guards. The queen then wiggled her antenna and made a few buzzing noises that sound out of tune for a bee. Biz biz biz, sounded the queen. 
All at once the whole hive began to shake violently, and a huge swarm of bees came pouring out of the entrance thick as a storm cloud. Izuku jumped behind Alan for protection, while the older boy simply stood there like he's seen it enough times to be desensitized by it. When all the bee flew off to another part of the field Alan walked up to the hive and plucked two honey wands that seemed to be growing by the base of the sapling like a flowers. He then motioned for Izuku to come closer, who did so without question. Alan then took one honey wand, and standing on his toes, placed the wand into the entrance and swirled it around a dozen times. He took the wand out of the entrance with a large globe of golden glistening honey coagulated around it. He handed this one to Izuku who then, after a moment of admiring it, began to lick it like a lollipop. Alan repeated the same process with the other wand and the two boys happily licked their honey wands with delight. The queen then came back with her army who all pulled back into their home. The queen landed on Alan's shoulder and Alan thanked the queen for the honey. Thank you Mrs. Queen Bee. Izuku thanked with honey all over his mouth. The queen waved her forelimb dismissively with a bit of blush on her tiny face at Izuku's cuteness and replied, buzz buzz buzz. She said you're welcome. Alan translated. With a goodbye wave to the queen and her hive the two boys walked out towards the open field and continued on their little adventure, licking their honey wands along the way. Eventually the two boy came across a very large pond with equally large flora and fauna, so large in fact that it made Izuku feel like he had shrunken in size. The pond had to be at least a few miles long and wide with crystal clear blue water that could easily see the bottom. With reeds so long they grew as big as garrafas, lilipads so wide they could probably hold the boy's combinated weight, stones that looked like mini mountains, birds with different colors and multiply wings, fish of all sizes and colors with odd shapes and extra parts, strange and beautiful water plants and flowers, and so much more. It was as gorgeous and breathtaking as the vlee in the field. The two boy polished off the rest of their honey wands and threw the remains to some large passing hummingbird-looking creatures and began to walk along a path towards the large pond. Strangest thing was that the path looked like it was made out of peacock feather. When Izuku traced back to where the path lead to, it lead right to an actual peacock, sitting atop an old withered tree, with a tail so long it looked like a natural road. The bird suddenly cried out at Izuku who was staring at the bird for a good while. Izuku recoiled at this and then retreated into Alan's jacket with fear. Alan only giggled at the young boy's constant shyness and fearful nature. The two boys soon came to the end of the peacock feather path at the very edge of the pond, which came down into the water like a slope. Izuku wondered why Alan even lead him to this path in the first place if it was just going to lead them both nowhere. Izuku looked up to Alan and asked, Now where do we go? Alan smiled at him and answered simply, We jump. Jump? Izuku asked. He didn't get answer as Alan suddenly sprang from his feet and jumped right out into the pond and on top of one of the lily pads. The lily pad shook for a moment and then stabilized like Alan was just another frog standing atop it. Izuku awed at this knowing that normal lily pads could never do this, but then again he wasn't in any normal world. Come on then, hop across, like a frog. Alan explained excitedly as he stood on his hands and feet and jumped from pad to pad just like a frog. Izuku then took a leap of faith and jumped on the nearest and biggest lily pad to him. When he landed on the pad it shook violently like it was going to collapse on him. Izuku tried his best to steady himself like Alan did so easily. Unfortunately after a time of trying he ultimately failed and flopped on his butt in the pad as it continued to shake violently from all the movement. Izuku tried to stand again, but flopped, tired again, and flopped, tried again and continued to try until he finally gave up and just sat in the water pant in defeat. Alan couldn't hold back his laughter at the poor boy's multiply failures. Izuku glared at him with such ire that it made the water quiver a bit. What's so funny? A very angry Izuku yelled at the older boy. Alan couldn't even attempt to reply since he was laughing even harder at the angry red flushed face of the ultra angry green haired boy. You look like the colors of a Christmas tree. The older boy laughed. Izuku's cheek only grew with even more color as he puffed them out in annoyance. It's not funny. Stop laughing. Izuku yelled at the top of his lungs, with anger tears welling up in his eyes. They'll say it's funny. That's cause you're not jumping on the lilies like I told you. Alan explained when he calmed down enough to speak. Izuku calmed down a few notches and looked at Alan with a confused expression. He scrunched up his face as he thought about what he said about lip pad travel. Then he remembered Alan jumping from pad to pad on all fours, just like a frog. So Izuku positioned himself on all fours as best he could and rearing all his strength in his back legs jumped to the nearest lily pad. What's more he actually landed on the plant perfectly and it only jittered a little bit on impact from his jump. Izuku's eyes glittered at his own accomplishment. And looking to Alan he saw the older boy with a large smile on his face. You're a natural Izuku. You're just like a little frog. Izuku gittered and smiled even brighter at the compliment and praise from the older boy. The two them soon found themselves hopping from pad to pad like frogs and riveting all the way. As they came to what could only be considered as the middle of the pond. 
They found a few lily pad being occupied by some very large green frogs, with appended to be half of Izuku's size while standing. He hopped onto the nearest lily pad to the closest frog and stared at it for some time admiring it. The frog stared back at him and made a very small ribbit in return. Izuku copied the frog saying the word ribbit. When the frog didn't ribbit back Izuku said ribbit a few more times hoping for it to respond. Though instead of getting a response he only got a lecture by the frog. If you're going to speak my native tongue the least you can do is actual try to speak it properly. Instead of doing that insulting gaggle you were gargling about. Said the frog in a British accent as he stood on his hind legs like a person. Now then this time don't just say ribbit, sound it out like I do. Suck in air, force it up your gullet, into your throat and then, ribbit. Ribbited the frog. Izuku stood to his feet and did as the frog instructed. He sucked in air, forced it into his tummy, then his throat, and then ribibit. Izuku made a very off-key ribbit which sounded more like a burp or a vomit sound. The frog shook his head as he pinched the bridge of his nose and said, Better. Not good, but much better than before. With more practice I can see you'll have at least the very basics down soon. Alan joined in the lesson as he sucked in air and instead of letting out a ribbit he let out a very loud and very juicy sounding burp. Alan made a big corn tooth smile as Izuku giggled hysterically at his gross humor. The frog, on the other hand, wasn't so entertained and made a face palm with his long webbed fingers. Oh come now Alan you're so beyond immature humor, the frog said in a disputed tone. Alan apologized for his behavior, although his expression said the opposite, and then offered the frog reconciliation by having a dance with him. The frog pondered this for a moment and then agreed. He hopped onto Alan's lilypad and held his jacket sleeves. Then the two of them began a silly dance that involved hopping from one pad to another and jumping up and down with lots of spinning. Izuku watched on hardly able to hold back his laughter as he watched the older boy and the amphibian jump and spin and bound all around. Then another frog appeared next to Izuku on the opposite lilypad. It looked much different from the other one as it wore a disgustingly large amount of makeup on its face and a big curly blonde wig, so it was painfully obvious it was female. Hey there cutie pie, care to dance? She said in a very deep female voice with a wink of her eye. E.W. squealed Izuku as he hopped away from the grossest frog. Oh come on sweetheart I don't bite, called the frog as she chased after Izuku. The chase only lasted for a few minutes as Alan shouted over to Izuku, Izuku. Want to change partners? Izuku nodded rapidly and hopped over to Alan who jumped from his partner to the lady frog. Alan took the lady frog's hands and began to to the same dance as he did with the other frog, hopping, sinning, and jumping between pads. Oh Alan dear, the female frog said WG equals Heil fanning herself with her hand. You're such a good dancer as usual. Thank you miss. Hop stopper. Alan thanked the unsightly frog. Izuku mentally thanked Alan for his sacrifice, but soon felt a finger tapping on his shoulder. He turned around only to see the male frog standing with a displeased look on his face. Izuku didn't notice it before but the frog was actual Izuku's exact height while standing up. He gave the frog an inquisitive look before the frog spoke. Are we going to dance or do I need to teach you that too? The frog asked in a lecturing tone. Izuku shook his head no and the frog sighed as he grabbed his hands and the two of them began hopping and spinning all over the place just like Alan. Izuku didn't know how he managed to get the dance down so quickly, but he realized it was more fun crazy freestyle movement than like an organized dance. And Izuku excelled in that so as such he immensely enjoyed the dance with his froggy partner. You're not half bad for someone with such short legs, commented the frog. Izuku only smiled in response. The two boys and their two frog dance partners continued to dance for what seemed like hours on end until they all were completely exhausted. They all sat on lily pads trying to catch their breath from their thrilling dance. Once the two boys caught their breath they stood up excused themselves and walked along the lily pads to the other side of the pond. The frogs called out to them saying, Come back anytime boys for another dance. Called the female frog. Yes, and I'll give you more speaking lessons while we're at it. Called the grumpy male frog. The two boys waved to them and hopped over to the far end of the pond. When they finally came to the other side they soon found another dirt path to follow. Alan was the first to jump over to the other side and after a bit of coaxing Izuku jumped over too. However when Izuku did he found his legs felt like jelly as he began to fall backwards. Alan saw this and reached out for Izuku's head to pull him back however the moment and loose foot caused Izuku to not only successfully take hold of Alan's hand, but also swung him around and accidentally threw him into the pond. Alan landed into the water with a large splash that carried to every part of the pond. Any creature in the current area all turned to this and gasped with fear-stricken faces. Izuku took notice of this and began to grow worried as he sat on the edge of the pond. Alan then lifted himself from up with water running down his face and a shadow covering it in a now completely soaking wet his jacket. Izuku wanted to say sorry but couldn't even form the words as the animals grew even more nervous and began to back away. Even the plants began to bend away from the older boy. 
Alan came close to Izuku who was now on the verge of fearful tears and then the shadow lifted off his face to revel a very happy smile and the sound of laughter to go with it. Izuku too began to laugh with Alan and the pond creatures all calmed down again at this sight, some even awed and cooed at the two boys laughing together. Izuku then offered his hand to pull Alan out. Alan accepted it though Izuku failed to notice the thin mischievous smile on his lips, and before he knew it Izuku was pulled into the pond along with him. Alan laughed as Izuku shot out of the water like a rocket as he coughed up water all red-faced. Alan continued to laugh at him while Izuku only pouted at the older boy glaring much ire at him. Izuku then got an idea and he stuck his hand into the water and quickly whipped it out creating a big wave that splashed the older boy in the face. You think that's funny? Izuku challenged. I think it's rather hilarious. Alan resorted as he splashed Izuku back. The two boys then broke out into an all-out splash fight. Even the odd fish in the pond began to join in the fight and began to pick sides splashing the opposite boy or tickling their feet underwater, turning the fight into an all-out splash war. The two boys and their armies of fish splashed each other until the two boys were very exhausted from all the fun and laughter and very cold from the water. The two boys then climbed back onto dry land where they tried their best to shake and wring all the water from their bodies and clothing. Suddenly Izuku noticed something very strange about his body. It was being healed by the water even his clothing was reminding all by itself. Izuku awed before this spectacular and wondered how this was even possible or even why it did this. Remember when I said that the veil of tears washes away the salt of despair and bloom forth the growth of new emotions to take root from such sweet sour emotion? Asked an all too familiar voice. Izuku looked around him only to be surprised by a very large and familiar floating grin with a set of yellow eyes and grey stripes. Sheshur Niko. He whispered. Well, do you remember? Asked the cat. Izuku nodded. He wondered why this was even relevant. This lake is filled with water straight from the veil itself, explained the cat pointing with its tail. Izuku followed the cat's tail and on the far end of the pond sat a small stream that filtered into it. The stream seemed to connect to somewhere in the forest now far behind them. Then why did my clothes and body get all cleaned and fixed up? Izuku asked looking down at his hands. Because the, the veil's water is composed of tears, a constant source of suppressed emotions all being let out at once. And like such, sadness and crying allow one to let go of their pent-up feeling and once gone allow the person to heal as a result. The same properties acts within the veil, explained the cat. Izuku looked over to Alan who was trying to wring out all the water from his jacket, but saw that the water had no effect on him like it did him. He was still as dirty and frazzled looking as before when they first met each other, only this time just wet. How come nothing happened to Alan? Izuku asked in a low tone. The cat only smiles wide at the boy and simply replied in an equally low tone, you'll have to find out that one your own. And with that his stripes eyes and grin disappeared. Izuku wondered what the Cheshire cat was saying, but no doubt it was just another riddle to confuse and upset him. He wanted to ask Alan what the cat meant but forgot it knowing how upset word of the Cheshire cat made him. So the two boys followed the dirt road hand in hand. As they did the two hummingbird creatures from before came by and rubbed their soft feathery bodies on the two boys' faces with the feeling of their fast moving wings tickling them as they brushed against them rapidly, as if to thank them for the honey wands earlier. When the birds left they continued their walk until they came upon another forest though it was distinctively smaller than the one from the veil. They were about to follow it until Izuku's eye was caught by a sudden fork in the road that was hidden by plants and grass. The path veered far to the left and was made out of stone under all the plants. It seemed to go around the smaller forest and head far out into the distance. There Izuku saw smoke billowing from somewhere and an awful smell coming from its direction by the wind. Even further back Izuku saw an out-of-focus red dot that seemed to resemble a heart. When Izuku asked Alan about what was in that direction the older boy's expression turned dark like it did back at the veil, and suddenly grabbing and whipping the green-haired boy he turned him away from the area and squeezing his shoulders so hard he thought he would break them. Alan loomed over the young boy and in a dangerous and almost parental scolding tone he said, No matter what, no matter under any circumstances at all are you ever, ever, allowed to go to that place, no matter what, not even out of curiosity, for any reason should you go there. Do you understand me? Izuku didn't reply as he was scared stiff by the almost crazy look in the other boy's eyes. Do you understand? He yelled even louder. Izuku shook his head rapidly with his eyes closed not wanting to look at the older boy anymore. Alan finally calmed down when Izuku replied and when he did saw the little boy holding back tears. He quickly let go of his shoulder and after an awkward moment he wrapped the little boy into a hug and petting his green hair he said soothingly, I'm sorry I went off on you like like Izuku. But, he trailed off, as Izuku opened up his eyes and looked up at the disheveled older boy. There are many nice places in Wonderland, but there are even more bad places, and that place that's the worst of them all. He leaned down and gently clasped his hand in the smaller boy's face and softly asked, Promise me you will never go there. Izuku sniffled loudly, seeing he was being genuine, replied, I promise. 
The two boys then hugged each other and afterwards they continue into the forest hand in hand to the March Hare's house. Now, soon two boys came across a very unusual looking house. And by unusual I mean it looked almost exactly like the head of a hare. Instead of have a square or rectangular build it was rounded on all sides. Two chimneys made the ears, two windows made the eyes, a pink planter made the nose, two white doors made the buck teeth, mouth, and the roof was made out of straw giving it a crazy looking hairdo. Alan led Izuku behind the strange little house and as they came around Izuku could slowly hear the sound of music, chatter, and laughter. It was a bit strange at first, but soon he found the source. Out not too far from the back of the house was a gated area with the biggest table he had ever seen. What's all that noise? Izuku asked Alan. Why it's the mad tea party of course. He replied as if it were obvious. Mad tea party. Yes, mad tea party. Izuku wondered what made it mad at all. You see this is no ordinary tea party. It's mad because it never ends. It's never ended. Never started, never picks up, and never slows down. Alan explained with some excitement in his voice. When Izuku thought about it, that really did sound mad. They came to the gate, which was all metal and painted black in a Victorian style. And Alan easily pushed the gate open like it wasn't even locked or even had a lock in the first place. They crossed over a mini stone bridge with an equally mini stream and came upon the table. To say it was big before was an understatement. It looked far more suitable for giants rather than small boys. As he came closer he saw it had equally large chairs in all different styles sizes and colors. The table itself was made from mahogany wood and had a linen cloth laid on top that had a multitude of stains all over it. Even though the table had many chairs for many people. On the top, Izuku could very clearly hear only three people. One was snoring loudly and squeaking. One was giggling and laughing up a hysterical storm with the sound of clattering silverware and china and the other couldn't seem to keep their mouth shut while changing the subject or tone of their voice every five seconds. Alan brought Izuku over to one of the chairs at the end of the table where he pulled out the chair with all of his might. The chair made a loud and irritating screeching sound as he pulled it causing Izuku to cover his ears from the pain. Alan motioned for Izuku to hop on the chair and Izuku came up to the chair, which was many time larger than him, and tried to climb onto the seat. He struggled and flailed as he tried to pull himself up, but to no avail. Eventually Alan simply gave Izuku a hand by lifting the young boy onto the seat by literally jumping onto it. Izuku was shocked that Alan could even jump so high, considering he didn't look at a first. Alan let go of Izuku and told him to stay seated for a moment. Izuku listened and sat down in the very large and really comfortable seat. Alan hopped off the seat and not a second later did Izuku feel the motion of his seat being pushed in and the sound of Alan's grunting as he did so. After Izuku's seat was pushed and he saw another seat at the head of the table move back and Alan jumping right onto it. Alan then dug his feet into the seat and grabbing the table by its cloth he pulled the seat in closer to the table. Izuku could see Alan was using all his force as his face turned tomato red when he pulled with all of his might. When Alan finally brought his seat in close enough he flopped down onto the chair with a sigh of relief escaping his lips. When Izuku finally looked at the table it completely shocked him. Not only was it immensely long and was seated for far more people, but it had the largest assortment of tea party fairs imaginable. All different tea kettles and pots that streamed and tooted rhythmically creating a very thin fog in the air. Each one was distantly different possessing unique shapes, sizes, and colors. Some even having many handles, spouts, being cut in half or sideways with all the tea still inside it. There were plates and tray and racks of different sweet, baked goods, finger foods, and so forth spread all over. The setup was simultaneously extremely well kept and a complete chaotic mess at the same time. One thing was certain though this tea party really was mad. The guests, or should I say only guests, were even stranger than the place setting of the tea party. There was a sleeping dormouse, a giggling march hare, and a chatty hatter, all of them looking quite mad themselves. The dormouse was about Izuku's size light grayish brown and fast asleep, sat between the mad hatter and the march hare, snoring loudly while squeaking in between breaths. He wore a checkered blue and white vest with a bell on his head like a hat. The March Hare was as tall as Alan and spoke in a very thick Scottish accent rather than a British accent like Alan, while occasionally throwing silverware china or condiments like pepper. He was a light to dark brown and had straw tied between its ears. He was very giggly, laughing profusely at the slightest thing that came out of the Mad Hatter's mouth, even if it was food or drink. He wore a white button-up shirt under a blue vest and a red bow tie with a monocle. The Mad Hatter, oh he was something else completely, it was hard to say whether he was human or not. He had a very thick British accent like Alan and was at least twice the size of any human, even bigger than All Might, which Izuku noticed immediately. His skin was a sick green color, in fact everything was wrong with his dot 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 well everything. His ears were enormous even for his size, his nose looked like it couldn't decide to be long and pointy or big and round, his plain colorless eyes looked like they couldn't decide on being at the side or on in the front. He wore black polished shoes with traditional spats with long black faded dress pants. 
He had white gloves and a straight jacket on like Alan that was also unclipped leaving his arms free. Only differences was his was his actually fit him. And the cherry on top was an enormous and long top hat that was once green but now was a faded blue-black with many patches on it holding it in one piece. It too looked like a checkerboard. And each patch had a different symbol in it that Izuku had never seen before. It even had a card in the brine that read in style 10 over 6. He was holding a cup of hot tea and talking very fast constantly changing his tone and the subject every 5 seconds. While the March Hare laughed at everything he said, Izuku noticed music playing in the background and looked behind him to find about 20 or so different record players playing different song at the beginning or cutting off at the song's end. Some of the flowers and trees were even playing songs along their branches, vine, and stems like a bunch of string instrument. Izuku turned back to the table to notice that all three people, creatures, guests, or whatever, all three guests were now silent or awake and staring right at Izuku in uncomfortable awkward silence. Izuku looked between Alan and the three guests uncomfortably and when no one made any sign of movement or speaking he decided to break the ice with a civil hello. Though before he could open his mouth to breathe air the Mad Hatter stopped him as he asked very sternly. Who are you? What do you want? Why are you here? There's no room for you. No room. No room. Izuku didn't need to look at the table to know that there was more than enough room for them all. There's plenty of room. He argued back slumping down in his chair. Have some wine laddie. The March Hare offered in an encouraging tone. Izuku looked around the table but saw no wine. Only tea, there is no wine. He questioned. That's because there isn't any, a wee twat, said the March Hare. Then it wasn't nice of you to offer. Izuku replied angrily. It wasn't very nice for you to sit down without being invited, scowled the Mad Hatter. Izuku slumped down into his chair a little bit further knowing that the Hatter was right. He wasn't invited to this party so he shouldn't be the one getting annoyed at them. Hatter it's alright, he my guest. This is my friend. Alan piped up in an exhausted tone. The Hatter looked over to the head of the table and made a face like he just noticed Alan was there. And with a gleeful cheer he said, Alan, where did you come from? The Dormouse yawned and in a half-asleep voice answered, from his mum. The March Hare began to laugh hysterically at his witty comeback. Never mind that. Never mind. Why didn't you introduce us to him sooner? The Mad Hatter asked staying on topic. Tell us. Tell us. The March Hare chanted excitedly. Alan stood in his chair. Hatter, Hare, Dormouse. He acknowledged each one by name. By this time the Dormouse had fallen asleep again and had to be awakened by the March Hare yanking on his whiskers. Hawa, said the awakened Dormouse. This is my new friend Izuku Midoriya. He introduced them to Izuku. Izuku wondered why he was introducing them by first name. Then he remembered that Alan acknowledges people by first name, so same must go with the guests. Izuku. Alan called Izuku's attention. This is the Dormouse, the March Hare, and the Mad Hatter. Dormi, March, and Hatter for short. He introduced him to them. Well any friend of Alan's is a friend o' mine, said the Hatter. Here here, yawned the Dormouse. I'll drink to that. Agreed the March Hare as he poured tea from a teacup back into a teapot through the spout and drank it through the top. Yes well now that formalities are out of the way. Hatter I need. Alan began until the Hatter cut him off saying. Here son have some more tea. He said to Izuku as he poured more tea into his already filled glass. But I don't need any more. In fact I need less. Izuku states as the tea overflowed his cup. No 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 no. States the Hatter in a stern voice. You mean I can take more from less? This made no sense to Izuku. Not in the slightest. That doesn't make any sense. In fact it's practically the same thing. Izuku reverted. Oh no it's quite different wee lad, said the hare. It like saying I see what I eat is the same as I eat what I see. He said while eating dunking a plate in his tea glass and eating it like a donut. Or saying I sleep when I breathe is the same as I breathe when I sleep, added the dormouse. It's even like saying I like what I take is the same as I take what I like, finished the hatter as he slurped his tea. Ahem, hatter, Alan said in a kind tone to get the madman's attention. Here boy have a biscuit and jam. Hatter said paying no mind to Alan and shoving a biscuit in Izuku's face. Hatter, Alan repeater himself. Um, thank you, but I... Izuku began but was cut off by the March Hare. Let's change the subject. He half yelled while grabbing a mallet, from who knows where, and snacking the Hatter so hard on the head his hat caved in on him. The top part of the hat opened and the Hatter spoke though it like a mouth, splendid idea, and poured an entire pot of tea down the opening of the hat. Hatter, Alan said a little more sternly. How about a riddle? The Hatter offered freeing his head from his hat. Oh god no, not this again. Izuku heard Alan say under his breath. Wonderful. The Dormouse agreed with a yawn. I'll take sugar, said the Hare, getting off topic. Who wants sugar? Asked the Dormouse. I do, replies the Hare. How many lumps? One or two? The Hare seemed to ask himself. Two, answers the Hatter. The March Hare took off the Hatter's hat and using the same mallet yells, One, two. As he smacks the Hatter on his bald head. 
However the hare seemed like it was going to continue hitting the hatter as he raised the mallet again. It seemed as if the hare really couldn't count. And before the mallet struck the hatter he moved out of the way and the dormouse was struck on the head instead, twice, waking it up. The hatter grabbed his hat from the hare and clearing his throat continued with the previous conversation. Now then back to the riddle. Hatter, Alan said even more sternly in a raised tone. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Asked the hatter. The hare scratched his chin and replied, I don't know. The dormouse only muttered something incorrectly. And the hatter said, neither do I, as if he was asked the riddle himself. Hatter, Alan yelled at the top of his lungs as he stabbed a knife into the table. However when Izuku looked at the knife he saw it wasn't an ordinary knife. It wasn't even on the table previously which means Alan had it on his person. The knife itself was menizing to look at. It looked like a regular cutting knife but it was so much larger. Its blade alone had to be as long as Izuku's arm and much wider. The handle was made from brass and had little engravings on it. Even the blade had a painted vine design on it with little specks of dried blood. At the sight of the knife and Alan's screaming voice, Izuku's blood went cold and his body froze up with fear. And it wasn't just him. Everyone and thing had stopped cold. The air around them turned ice cold. The warmth from the sun was snuffed out by clouds. Everything seemed to turn gray, and the wind blew an awful sour smell. The teapot stopped puffing our steam. The records and plants stopped playing music. Even the guests stopped doing whatever they were doing and simply staying in place like wax figures. The dormouse awoke with such fright in its little eyes and stayed awake. The match hare stopped giggling and began to chew his nails nervously. And the mad hatter stopped talking, drinking, and breathing altogether. Alan then stood up on the table and pulled out his giant kitchen knife with ease as he nonchalantly walked over to where the hatter was seated unmoving. All the while Izuku couldn't take his eyes off the bone-chilling expression and his heart-stopping crazy bloodthirsty look in his eyes. When Alan finally came to the hatter's seat he grabbed him by his giant green nose. That actually made a little squeaking noise and brought him close to his face, knife in hand. Hatter, he said dangerously calm, though he was anything but. The hatter gulped and replied, Why yes a Alan? Alan took a short breath and said sternly, Now that I have your attention, I'm going to ask you one question I'll talk slowly and use small words so you can understand me clearly, got it. The hatter nodded gently. Alan took another breath and said, Where is the rabbit? The mad hatter then quickly reached out one of this arms grabbed something and held it up to his head for Alan to see. It was the March Hare, who laughed nervously and waved at Alan. Alan growler and grabbed the hare in the hand that held the hatter's nose and threw him across the table. I said rabbit, not hare. Where is the white rabbit? Alan yelled with fire burning in his eyes. Ooh, 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 said the hatter with some form of relief in his voice, the white rabbit. Mister, I'm always late for everything. No time even for anything at all, not even tea. Why didn't you say something sooner? Alan snarled like an animal at his comment. The hatter gulped and knowing that Alan was in no mood for madness he said to the savage looking child. Well, I see you're in no mood for small talk, eh? No I'm not hatter. Alan agreed angrily. The hatter gulped nervously again and explained trailing off every so often. Well dot 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 you see Alan dot 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 the thing is. I don't know where he is. What? Alan screamed in surprise. What? Izuku squeaked out silently. What do you mean by you don't know where he is? Bullshit. Of course you know where he is. You know everyone's business. Alan yelled accusingly at the hatter, glaring his knife dangerously close to his face. Normally I would agree with you, but I say what I mean and I mean what I say Alan. And what I say is the truth. None of us have seen hide or tail of him for quite some time at all. The hatter tired to explain calmly. Or as calm for the nervous wreck he was. The last time he came by he had to get that blasted bloody pocket watch of his fixed, again. Added the March Hare as calm as he could. And afterwards he left without so much as a civil thank you or mention of his current business. Said the now fully awakened Dormouse. And we haven't seen him since, and that's the truth. Added the Hatter. And when was this? Asked Alan raising a skeptical eyebrow. Why back when I think old March here was still mad, answered the dormouse motioning to the hare. It be true lad, agreed the hare. You're all mad. Alan shot back in a raised voice. Thanks very much, thanked the hare. Alan rolled his eyes and tightening his grip on the hatter's nose and pointing the knife towards him he asked aggressively. And when will he be back? I'm not sure, said the hatter shrugging his shoulders. Then he made an expression like he remembered something that could save his skin. But I can probably guess when he might be back. Oh, and how's that? Alan asked skeptically. Simple really. That blasted watch of his is always on a tight schedule, just like him. So as such it also has a certain time when it completely breaks. So he comes to me to fix it every time, on the dot. Exclaimed the hatter traumatically. Alan finally let go of the hatter's nose, showing he was pleased with the answer, but still kept his knife at his face, showing he wasn't completely pleased with it, and putting his free hand on his hip asked. And when exactly will that be? Well does anyone have the time? Asked the hatter to his two other friends. We really haven't the time. 
yelled the March Hare as he took a pocket watch from a cup of tea. The time, the time, who has the time? Questioned the Dormouse. He has the time. The Hatter shouted pointing towards Izuku. No time, no time. I'm late, I'm late. I'm very very late. For a very important date. No time to say hello, good be. I'm late, late, late. Yelled the White Rabbit as he suddenly burst through the gate behind Izuku. No, no, no I'm overdue. I'm really in a stew. No time to say hello, good be. I'm late, late, late. He yelled as he ran right up the table and straight over to the Hatter not even noticing Alan's presences. Oh Hatter, dear Hatter, please help me I'm in dire need of your help. A white rabbit shouted in fear as he waved his watch in the tall man's face. The Hatter snatched the watch from the frazzled creature asked said calmly, Oh let me guess, your watch has gone off and broken its ticker on you hasn't it? Yes yes yes, can you fix it? Answered the rabbit, but please be quick about it or I'm likely to be turned to stew if I'm late. The Hatter took the watch up to his huge ear and shook it violently, causing the sound of jingling metal parts to be clearly heard. Well I see the problem, said the Hatter simply. It's no wonder you're late. Your watch is exactly two days slow. TTTT two days slow. The White Rabbit half shouted in fear looking like he was on the verge of a heart attack. It's a simple fix really, and it won't take too long either, said the Hatter rescuing the Rabbit with a pat o' his head. The Hatter then dunked the watch and tea and whipping it around smacked it onto the table causing it to break open and reveal all its parts and mechanisms. Now then let's have a look shall we? Said the Hatter as he placed a salt shaker on his eye like a microscope, and in doing so cause ounces of salt to fall from the shaker onto the watch's innards. Well here's the problem. The Hatter cried happily as he took a fork. This watch is too full of wheels and spring and gears. He stated as he used the fork to scoop all innards out. Oh no no no, cried the rabbit. Oh my poor watch, not my gears, not my wheels, not my beautiful springs. He continued to cry as he desperately tried to catch the dislodged parts flying all over the place, even pulling a spring that got caught on his nose. It needs butter. Butter, yelled the hatter. Butter. The March Hare yelled into the rabbit's ear. BBB butter. The white rabbit asked confused before looking at the butter near him and handing it over to the hatter, who took it and began to apply it into the watch like a slice of bread. The white rabbit was already in the beginning stages of a panic attack. Seeing this only made it worse as he tired to get the hatter to stop smearing the butter into the watch. No no no. You'll get crumbs into. Only to be easily pushed aside by the hatter, smashing the remains of the butter into the white creature's face. Who reassure the rabbit saying, There's no need to worry, I'm only using the very best butter. What makes it the best? Izuku asked himself. Why it's made of the finest weed in all of Wonderland. Answered the Dormouse. Izuku was a bit skeptical of his answer. Milkweed that is. Finished the Dormouse. Tea. Asked the Hare. Tea. Oh yes I never thought about tea. Of course. Said the Hatter pouring a whole pot of tea into the watch. The White Rabbit managed to get the butter out of his eyes and tired again to stop the Hatter. Only to be stopped by the March Hare's foot. Sugar. Offered the Hare. Sugar two spoons. Yes thank you. Thanked the Hatter as he grabbed two teaspoons from the Hare. Instead of the sugar and mashed them into the watch. Please be careful cried the rabbit, only to have a jar of jam placed in his paws by the hare who offered jam, and inadvertently delivered it to Hatter. Jam, yes, I almost completely forgot about jam, said the Hatter taking a big knife full and smearing it into the watch. Mustard, offered the hare. No no no, that's just crazy, cried the Hatter. Now lemon, that's what it needs. That's much different. As he squeezed lemon juice into watch, or what was left of it by this point, Alan scoffed at the insanity happening in front of him and in a light and displeased tone offered, well I say it need more pepper. It needs more pepper. Screamed the Hatter as he took a pepper grinder, uncapped it and poured the whole container into the thing that used to be a watch. At this everyone on the table all began to violently began to sneeze. The Hatter, in fact, made such a large and powerful sneeze that most of the watch's contents flew right at Alan's face. Fortunately for him, he reacted fast enough to kick an empty plate into air and use it as a shield to cover his face at the last second. You, Alan said simply as he dropped the plate from his clean face. The white rabbit now looked even whiter than before as he simply stood there completely frozen at the violent treatment his precious watch was getting. He then swirled around grabbing Alan by his collar and in a frantic scream yelled, Why did you have to encourage him to add more? And Pepper of all thing, Pepper. Alan smacked the creature paws off of him and yelled back, Why did you give him your watch? Despite knowing fully well that he's mad. We're all mad. The rabbit yelled back. The hatter then closed the watch up thick that it was perfectly fixed. Though when he did the watch immediately began to melt like ice cream on a warm day. The hatter looked closely at the watch examining it while scratching his chin and immediately started. Hum, it seems it needs more tea. More tea, yelled the hare as he threw the lid off a teapot. The hatter then took the melting remains of the watch and placed it into the half-filled pot. 
At this point the white rabbit had completely fainted while Alan Simple rolled his eyes at all of their performances. Meanwhile Izuku was more confused and scared rather than entertained or anything else for that matter. The March Hare then jumped on the table grabbed the teapot and began to shake it all around like a maracha. He even began to shake his whole body like he was dancing to mambo music. Not too long after the record players and plants began to play mambo music for the hare to dance too. The dance went on for around several minutes with the hare dancing all around the table breaking cups, dished, and teapot, knocking over food and drink alike even stepping on it or kicking it off the table completely. The hatter then set out a clean piece of bread on the table and the march hare hopped over to the bread and poured the contents of the teapot onto the bread. What strange concoction even came out of the teapot couldn't even be described in words. The hatter then placed another clean piece of bread onto forming a sandwich of some kind, only for the march hare to take a frying pan out of nowhere and smash the sandwich flat. The hatter then took a knife and cut off the edges of the smushed thing, like you would with a sandwich, while saying reassuringly, there we go that should do it. When the hare lifted up the frying pan underneath it laid a perfectly new, bright, and shiny golden pocket watch ticking away normally. Izuku was absolutely blown away at this spectacular that made not one lick of sense to him. Alan on the other hand just looked bored with it as if he saw it a hundred time over and had become numb to it. At that moment the white rabbit awoken from his episode and with glassy eyes looked around to see where he was. When his eyes fell on his prime condition pocket his eyes opened wide with sparkling wonder and overjoyment. He hopped to his feet and went around to everyone at the table and thanked them over and over for fixing HS watch, even if they didn't do anything. He finally hopped over to Hatter and taking the giant strange man's gloved hand shook it rapidly giving his most sincere thank to him. Oh thank you Hatter. Thank you so very very much. I'm completely indebted to you. The Hatter simply waved it off with a snobbish expression like it was nothing. The white rabbit then reached for the watch being held between the Hatter's fingers saying, Now then I'll just take my watch and be. But the rabbit never got to finish that sentence as he cut himself short feeling a disturbance in his gut. He turned around fast only to see a sharp object being flung at him from high velocity. He didn't even have time to react or even gasp in surprise, because suddenly felt himself being flung back with such immense force by the shape object and impaling him right into a nearby tree. <laughs> Screamed the white rabbit in bloody chilling pain as he felt himself hit the tree and stick there. Izuku immediately shut his eyes tight and covered his ear. But it was no use in drawing out the pain-stricken screams from the impaled white rabbit. Everyone was at the table was dead silent or hiding their face away from the gruesome sight of their aquinitis. All except for Alan who had a cold look on his face hearing and seeing what had been done to the poor frantic creature. For it was him that threw the sharp object at the rabbit and implying it onto the tree like a wall decoration. And not just any sharp object it was the giant cutting knife that he had from earlier. Alan still stood there locked in his throwing position from Henny through the knife, still unmowing, still unfeeling, still cold. The white rabbit continued to scream as he went into detail of his fatal injury. Oh how could you? How could this happen to me? Me. Oh the pain. The pain is excruciating. Absolutely excurasting. Oh the blood. The blood is everywhere. Oh I hope I die from blood loss first. I don't want to die from the excruciating pain rushing through my whole body. He screamed louder. Izuku was shaking in his seat as he heard the white rabbit tortuous dying pain. Above the blood-curdling screams he could just barely hear the sound of bare feet walking across the table towards him and felt a shadow cast over him. Izuku looked up to see the cold expression of the once happy and slightly off older boy. It, it was that expression that chilled him to the center of his bones. It okay to look. He said coldly. Izuku was shocked at what he just said to him. Why did he say, how could he say I, and why did he say it to him? Izuku shut his eyes again and rapidly shook his head no as he meekly said, Why would you want me to do that? Why would you say it okay for me to look at the poor rabbit you just impaled on that tree? He heard Alan make an exasperated sigh as he explained, That's because I didn't impale him lovely. Izuku's attention was brought back by the boy's stange word, and replied in question, Lovely, it mean not to harm to cause death, so I didn't hit anything important on him. In fact I didn't even hit him in general. Alan explained, Izuku looked up at him confused and asked, If that the truth then why he is screaming like that? Alan pinched the bridge of his nose and replied aggravated, It's because he's a complete drama queen. Alan pointed a finger over to the white rabbit and Izuku begrudgingly looked up. Only find what Alan said was true. The white rabbit was indeed impaled on the tree but not by any of his body parts. Only by the color of his waistcoat as he dangled there like a limp fish flopping about only inches off the ground. In fact the scene was almost more funny with the right context. Izuku straightened up in his seat as Alan walked away from him and over to the edge of the table where he jumped off and during his descent almost seemed to gently float down. 
He walked over to the still screaming white rabbit and stood there with his sleeves crossed waiting patiently for the rabbit to realize his actually pre-deem. Oh Alan how could you? How could you use the vorpal bald on me when I went through so much trouble to help you get it? I thought we were friends. How could you do this to your own friend? Oh the pain. The pain is horrible. My blood. My blood everywhere. I can feel my innards spilling out. The rabbit continued to yell. Eventually Alan got fed up with all the screaming and snapped at the animal yelling. Oh calm the bloody hell down you. You're not dead, dying or anything else. Then why am I covered in blood? Oh I can't look at myself. Yelled the rabbit. Alan just looked at the rabbit like he completely lost it. You're wearing a red waistcoat you bloody buck tooth corn carrot muncher. The rabbit stopped squirming about and looked down at himself and noticed that he wasn't bleed out and only hanging the vorpal blade from the collar of his waistcoat. The rabbit then let out a nervous laugh which slowly turned into laughter of pure relief. Pretty soon everyone at the table, minus Izuku and Alan, were all laughing in real life. Soon Alan got tired of all the crazy laughter and grabbed the rabbit by his ears while swiftly tearing him away from the vorpal blade holding him up. He then held the creature up to his face with a very displeased look on it. The white rabbit stopped laughing slowly and gulped down a breath asking, I see that you're not very pleased with something Alan, and I think that something might be me. No really, what make you say that? He asked rhetorically. He then ripped the vorpal blade off the tree and walked over to the table with the white rabbit's ears tight in his fist. Oh dear oh dear me. Whatever have I done this time? Said the white rabbit in a fearful tone. When he returned to the edge Alan jumped back onto the table in a single leap, just like a frog. He then snagged the pocket watch from the hatter in a nasally grunt and trudged over to where Izuku was sitting. He held the creature up so he could see Izuku asked, Rabbit, do you know who this is? He asked rhetorically. The rabbit gulped and replied, Um, a special guest of yours. No, he immediately shouted. No actually you're right there, but you're still wrong. This is Izuku. The rabbit then gave a slightly relieved face and a forced smile as he said, Well it's a pleasure to meet your acquaintance young Izuku. I'd tip my hat to you if I had one. No more pleasantries. He yelled Alan, Do you know why he's here? For tea. Alan made an annoyed face at this answer. Okay so not for tea then. Well then it's quite simple really. He's mad of course. The rabbit answered, Well you're wrong. He not mad. Alan shouted at him, But of course he's mad Alan. Otherwise he wouldn't be down he in the first place. Argued the white rabbit. Wrong again. It was a mistake he came down here in the first place. Not only that it's your mistake, so you have to fix it. Alan stated angrily. What? My fault he's down here. Oh don't be ridiculous it couldn't have been my doing. Mad people come down here all the time. With or without me. Besides I bet the boy doesn't even remember how he got here in the first place. The rabbit stated boldly with a snobbish attitude crossing his arms to exemplify his point. Alan only gave a deadpan look to the white creature as he held the rabbit facing Izuku once more and calling his name asked him kindly in his charming British accent. Izuku, is this the white rabbit that you told me about? The one that you chased down into a deep hole? Izuku nodded. And is this the pocket watch he was holding? He asked holding up the pocket watch. Izuku nodded again. Alan held T-Rabbit up to his face with an animalistic snarl on his face. The white rabbit was now profusely sweating and gulped nervously. So what's your excuse for this time, hum rabbit? Alan asked in a sweet yet threatening tone. Please Alan you know it's not my fault. I don't dictate who sees me up above or who goes into Wonderland. It's not of my doing. I promise you that's the truth. Explained the rabbit like a nervous wreck. Well, Alan trailed off in his sentence in thought. Okay I believe you, mostly. He said begrudging. The rabbit pulled out a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped his sweaty brow with it in real life. However, Alan suddenly started. Since you did bring him down here, it's going to be you that take him back. Now, Alan commanded the creature. That white rabbit looked at him with worry on his face as he frantically said, No 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 no, I can't. I can't. I really really can't. If I do I'll be late. Very very late. So you're saying you'd rather not fix your mistake and leave Izuku to be stuck down here for life? Alan asked the rabbit with anger climbing on his face. If it means I won't be late then yes, said the rabbit. At that moment Izuku could feel his heart drop into his stomach. How could the rabbit say something so selfish? Was being on time far more important and morally right than helping someone that they cause pain to? Even if he was an animal why was he so unfeeling and selfish to someone he very well have doomed to entrapment in a backwards world full of mad people and creatures? Izuku could feel tears filling in his eyes at the white rabbit's words. Was he really going to be stuck down here? Was he never going to see sane people, his mother, All Might, or anything else ever again? Was he really going to be stuck in Wonderland, forever? Alan saw Izuku's face tear up with the thought of never escaping this mad world. And if he wasn't already angry from the White Rabbit's decision then now, now he was blazing furious. As if the world moved in slow motion Alan made the most horrible expression imaginable and showed it right at the rabbit, whose face slowly went from frantic to absolute horror. 
Alan then squeezed the white rabbit's ears tight and in a weightless slow feeling whipped the rabbit over his head and slammed him back first onto the table so hard that every teacup, cake, and pot of tea on the table all vibrated from the impact. The white rabbit now laid back down on the table with the wind knocked out of him and his vision gone blurry from the impact. He just managed to get enough of his vision back to see a furious Alan looming over him with golden pocket watch in hand. The white rabbit seemed to disregard it Alan's murderous look and tried to make a grab throw his precious watch, but was quickly stopped short by the foot of Alan pinning him down by his throat. The white rabbit tried to move Alan's foot for some breathing room but only got a quick breath before gasping at the sight of the vorpal blade only centimeters from his nose. Only thing the rabbit could do was gulp at the sight of the angry boy with with his life and death in either hand. Now you listen to me you overgrown lump of hasten pfeffer. I don't give a bandersnatch's ass about what you're going to be late for. Because if you don't get Izuku back home you're going to face the consensus. Alan explained in a morbid ton. Alan didn't even explain what consequences would become of rabbit if he didn't help them. Whether he didn't want to scare Izuku anymore or saying there will be consequences is far more terrifying than explaining it is up for debate. But but but, the rabbit tried to argue. But what? Alan yelled at the creature under his bare foot. But I really can't be late for this summons. I really can't. The rabbit continued to argue. And why's that? What's so important about this summons of yours? Asked Alan in a yell. I've been summoned by. The white rabbit trailer off like he was scared to say the person's name or whether he did have enough air to talk. The Red Queen. He squeaked out. The Red Queen. Alan stated with fear in his voice. The Red Queen. Shouted the hare in fear as he stuck his head in a teapot. The Red Queen. Shouted the hatter in fear as he hit his face in his hat. The Dormouse only fainted at the name or fell asleep again. It's always hard to tell the difference. Who's the Red Queen? Izuku asked carefully. You don't know who the bleeding Red Queen is lad? Asked the hare hiding in his teapot. No. Izuku replied. Alan made an unusual sounding sigh and replied. The Red Queen is the tyrannical ruler of Wonderland, who rulers over all with a bloody fist. She's as mad as mad can get. And that's coming from me, stated the Hatter in fear still hiding in his own hat. Alan sighed and glaring down at the rabbit said, Rabbit, I don't care if the bloody Queen of Heart did summon you. Since the Hatter fixed your damnable watch you'll probably be a few minutes early now. So you can spare a few minutes, can't you? Alan asked rhetorically. The White Rabbit gulped and lightly nodded his head. Alan slowly and carefully took his foot off the rabbit's neck to give him some air. When he completely took his foot off the white rabbit neck, he slowly rose to his feet and brushed off his coat before taking a deep breath of air. Alan saw the rabbit relaxing and put his guard down for a moment. However the moment he did in a quick flash of white fur raised across the table and the white rabbit made a mad dash for his pocket watch. He reached out and tried to grab it and then make a quick getaway with it in toll. However Alan's guard wasn't completely down and foresaw the rabbit trying something like this and immediately countered. He pivoted on one heel grabbed the rabbit's wrist and neck by the collar of his waistcoat and flung his over his shoulder by his waistcoat and threw him headlong into one of the many half-eaten cakes decoration the table. The rabbit landed face first into the cake with a large splat and bits of cake flew all over the table. Some even got stuck in Izuku's hair and face. Now Alan was really mad for the white rabbit trying to pull a fast one on him and angrily marched over to the creature who was now dislodging himself from the cake and waited there till he wiped the cake from his eyes. When the rabbit had gotten his vision back he immediately noticed the murderous look in Alan's face and the vorpal blade above his head ready to bring it down on him. The white rabbit let out a gasp of terror as he was cornered into the cake. Izuku also let out a shrill whimper as he shut his eyes before the brutality. The white rabbit was about to let out a scream until he saw Alan place his watch on the table ready to not stab him, but instead his beloved watch. N-O-O-O, cried out the rabbit. Please not my precious watch it was an unbirthday present. Oh really, and why shouldn't I, hum? You obviously don't give a bandersnatch's ass about Izuku's well-being, so why should I care about what happens to your material property? Alan asked in a raised tone. Alan got to his feet with the vorpal blade still pointed at the watch like a ransom victim and walked casually to the rabbit and very very closely to his fuzz face. The white rabbit back off as Alan got close with his murderous fire blazing in his blue eyes. I'll cut you a deal rabbit. Alan started. I promise you that no harm of any kind shall come to your watch as long as you take Izuku back home. Once you fulfill your part I'll give you back your watch. No strings attached. And you can go about your merry way to the bloody red bitch. For whatever the hell she wants you for. Have we got a deal? Asked asked more like a threat than an offer. The white rabbit sighed seeing no way out of this and begrudging nodded his head. The white rabbit shook off all the cake and frosting off his fur and coat, which flew all over the place, and fixing his outfit he sprang to his feet hopping all around the table half shouting, Well come along then, we don't want to be late. Wait, 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 no, no no, we must be going come along. He hopped off the table with Alan not too far behind with pocket watch at blade point. 
Meanwhile Izuku was still in his seat frozen in fear at what kind of transformation he just saw his new form go under. He knew that Alan seems a bit off but he never expected him to go from happy, intelligent, witty older boy to full-on basket case in a matter of minutes. Izuku was more terrified of Alan now than when he first met him at the Vale, and now he couldn't even move. Perhaps now he knew the reason Alan was wearing that straight jacket. He didn't even know if he wanted to go back home if that meant traveling back with Alan who was starting to look as mad as the people and creatures down in Wonderland. Until he was pulled from his paralysis by Alan, Izuku, come on, we're gonna get you home finally. He called out to him with some form of glee in his voice. Izuku slid off his chair and followed behind Alan. He turned back to the mad tea party guest and waved a quiet goodbye. So long lad, come back real soon, called out the March Hare. Yes yes, come back very soon, and stay for tea a bit longer, called out the Hatter. And no response from the Dormouse, just loud snoring. Soon Izuku felt something pushing on his back and saw the white rabbit pushing on his back with all his might saying, Come along now young Izuku, no time for dilly dally. You don't want to be late. Late late late. Izuku picked up pace with the speed frantic rabbit and the two-faced older boy. For quite some time they walked on back the way they came in complete silence. The only sound coming from the talkative white rabbit shouting at the two boys to hurry along not wanting to be late. The sound of the two boys' footsteps and Izuku muttering to himself about Alan. Izuku soon fell short behind the older boy and the rabbit as he walked slower, and slower, and slower until he came to the point that he was standing in place unmoving, doing nothing but muttering quietly to himself. After a moment Alan soon realized that his friend had fallen short behind them and was standing in place unmoving, looking at the ground, and muttering to himself with an unusual expression plastered across his face. Alan walked over to the young green-haired boy, but he didn't acknowledge his presence or even show any signs of movement. This worried him greatly. It worried him even more when he called out his name softly and tried to place a sleeved hand on his shoulder, but only got Izuku moving his shoulder away in fear like a hurt animal. Alan was worried why his friend was acting this way and asked him what was wrong. When no response came he saw that Izuku was trying to formulate a response and waited patiently for a response. While the white rabbit was chomping at the bit for the two boys to just end this already and get on with it. Without looking up from the ground Izuku asked in a meek tone, Alan. Yes, Alan replied softly. Bar. Izuku trailed off for a minute it. Are you mad? He half expected the older boy to react violently and covered his head with his hands in protection for whatever was to come. Though nothing came from the older boy, instead he stood there as still as Izuku. Even the world around them seemed to stop in time as it waited in anticipation for the answer. Eventually Alan made a small sigh and calmly replied in an equally meek tone that almost sounded sad, Yes, I am. Mad as a hatter, and worse so. Izuku finally looked up at the older boy to see him hanging his head down like he was appearing to be on the verge of tears. Almost all of Izuku's fear of Alan seemed to wash away at the sight of the older boy's Varentabao state. He even started to feel bad for him seeing him like dot 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 this. But he still had questions before he could make up his mind about Alan and he was the only one to answer these questions. Though now he did even feel half right about asking him these things. But he took a shaky breath and asked, You said mad people are people who have been hurt right? Alan nodded silently. Izuku took another shaky breath and asked cautiously, Where dot 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 were you hurt too? At first Alan was quiet, but not quite in climbing to anger like before, he was quite climbing to sadness. He took a shaky breath and replied, Yes, yes I was. I was hurt very very badly, and many many times too. I want to be sane again, I don't want to be mad. I just want to be like everyone else and not trapped in this maze of craziness in my head. He said falling to his knees and grabbing his head with tears starting to form. Izuku fell to his knees too to make sure that the older boys was alright. He reached out a hand to him, but Alan immediately shot up his face staring right at him. This caused Izuku to reel back in fear, but he soon realized that he wasn't looking at him just in his direction. Then Alan continued with his explanation. And I tried to get better, I really did. But no matter who I went to or what I did or who I begged for help, none of them would even spare me a passing glance. No one helped me, no one at all, and so I descended into complete madness. Now I fear ill ill ill. Never get better. Tears then flowed down his blue eyes in long streams. After Alan's explanation he had all the evidence he need on what he thought about the mad boy. So he came close to him as he continued to cry and enveloped the older boy's head in a hug. Alan stopped crying as he felt the younger boy's arms wrapped around his head. He stood there unmoving and frozen as if this was the first hug he's received. For a while the both of them said and did nothing, just sat there in each other embrace. Eventually Izuku finally piped up and said, I'll help you. I'll help you get better. I don't know how, but I'll find a way. I'll take your hand though the maze and help you out of it so you can find your sanity. Izuku's words were more than enough for Alan to be brought back to tears once more. He moved himself out of Izuku's arms and asked with horse's tone, Dude you are really am mean it. Izuku nodded slowly. 
Now the tears flowed from Alan's eyes again in huge quantities. Izuku's kind words and selfies act was the first time he had heard it from someone who really meant it. He grabbed the young boy in a hug and only managed to choke out the thank you, over and over. Izuku hugged the mad boy back knowing not what to do for him at the moment, but only to hug him back and be there with him in his time of weakness. One would say that the scene before them was sweet and heartwarming for anyone to witness, however some other would disagree, and that someone was the white rabbit who had about enough of this sentimental candy stuff, and frantically hopping around the boys began to cry, there no time for all this sentimental nonsense, we really have to be go. But the rabbit stopped himself seeing Alan's crying face holding his watch and his open mouth ready to take a bite out of it. The rabbit remained quiet for a moment and continued in a meek quiet tone, or you can take all the time you'll need, I'll just be over there waiting, and went over to sit on a rock under a tree. Alan put the watch away and continued to hug Izuku staying in an comforting embrace, something he had not felt in a long time, for a few moments longer. Though he soon realized that when he tried to leave the smaller boy's hug he did budge an inch. He lifted his face only to see the peaceful sleeping face of his green-haired friend. Alan sighed and giggled softly at him. He must have been completely worn out, mentally, emotionally, and physically from his raging adventure with him. As quietly and gently as he could, he scooped the smaller boy into his arms and cradled him with his head resting on Alan's shoulder and Alan supporting him by his bum. He then turned around and started to make his way down the path to the rabbit's hole with the now sleeping boy. The white rabbit saw that the two of them were finally done, whatevering, and bounded off his rock and cries very loud, Well it's about time. I hope you're ready. But was soon cut off by Alan, SSHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHHH
But he soon stopped his sentence when Alan suddenly crumpled to the ground clutching his head and groaning in pain. Alan moaned in pain. Izuku fell to his knees grabbing at the older boy's jacket overflowing with worry as to what is going on to his friend. Suddenly the white rabbit came to Alan's other side with worry painted on its small face, as he shook his head and softly spoke in a fearful tone, No 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 no. Not now. Not now. Not now. Not now. He reappeared with his voice getting louder and louder. Izuku frantically looked between Alan and the rabbit wonder what to do and what was even happening. Rabbit, what's going on? What's wrong with Alan? Izuku asked the scared creature. The white rabbit looked at him with a serious look on his face and in an equally serious tone commanded, You have to run, now. Izuku was now scared, scared and very much confused. Was Alan in pain? Would he be okay? Why does he have to run? Is there something chasing them? What what is it? Izuku had so many more questions to ask but didn't get the chance as the white rabbit repeated himself this time more sternly. Listen to me young man. You have to run, and you have to do it now. There no time for you to waste. Izuku was shocked and scared and confused at the same time. What was wrong? What was going on? Izuku wanted to ask these questions and more but Alan finally piped up through his pain and in a horse's voice said sternly, Izuku, listen to Rabbit. You have to run. Run for the hole and don't stop running. But what about you? Why are you in pain? Why do I have to run? Izuku asked frantically. Don't worry about me. There's no time to explain. You have to go before it's too late. Go. Run. Now. Alan shouted at Izuku. Izuku stammered for a moment as he weighed his options of what to even do. But soon flight or fight kicked in and with his adrenaline surging through his body he turned around and bolted as hard as he could down the way he came to the rabbit's hole. As Izuku ran for his life, all around him he felt as if time had slowed down to a near standstill. All around him he could feel every detail in the environment, like his senses had been cracked up to 13. While he tried to pick up speed to break out of this time trap with only the sound of his blood rushing through his ears he could clearly hear one sound that cut through the silence like a hot knife. That voice belonged to Alan who was still yelling at Izuku despite his excruciating pain. Keep running. Don't stop. Run faster Izuku. Run. He chanted. Don't look back keep an... <laughs> Alan suddenly let out a blood-chilling scream of pure suffering. Even though his friend kept yelling at him not to look back Izuku had, for the most part, listened and kept running. But once he heard that awful scream he had to turn around to see if his friend was alright. And when he did he would never be able to unsee the sight that laid out before him ever again. The once serene beauty of Wonderland was no more. Faster than the naked eye the veil went a complete 180 from mystical fantasy forest to living nightmare hellspawn. The trees dried and decayed leaving behind twisted old pieces of rotten twisted wood coming out of the ground that seemed to bleed out red with limbs and corpses hanging from their branches like fruit. The blue skies turned blood red and the clouds turned black hazy and polluted giving off little light and a sulfur smell. The ground underneath his feet had been turned into pure raw bleeding flesh and served organ, limbs, and other body parts that saturated the air with a purifying rotten smell that burned the nose. The creatures had been reduced to cackling twisted demonic-looking creatures that had body parts and chunks of flesh missing, while constantly trying to kill one another whether for survival or sick pleasure. The flowers and other plant life looked dead and twisted bleeding a red substance and snapped at anything that came to close. The giant game pieces had been broken, chipped, shattered or covered in blood, corpses laid atop of them. The wind was gone and replaced by horrid and shrill screams of pure suffering and wailing with cry. The puddles, streams, and rivers ran with blood chunks of flesh and body parts that swam in them live fish. Everything, and I mean everything, was into the simplest of words. A living nightmare. Izuku had never been more terrified in his whole entire life. He once to stopped where he was fall on the ground, close his eyes, and wait for Alan to wake him up from this nightmare. He wanted to believe that this was a nightmare, and he was still sleeping peacefully in Alan's arms. But he wasn't he could feel the hot arid air, he could smell the horrid smells around him, he could hear the screams and the crying of God knows what. He was awake and all of this was real. With all his might he still had he started running, and that's just what he did. With every last bit of his courage he turned around closed his eyes and ran faster than he ever had. He ran, and ran, and ran until he came to the tunnel. He didn't even hesitate when it no had been turned into a bloody mouth, and slid on his belly right inside where he grabbed the handle of the door and flung it right open. He got to his feet and and ran headlong into the soft white bed where he first woke up. He dashed to it and jumped right onto the tall piece of furniture and yanked the covers on top of him where he hid underneath and closed his eyes to convince himself what he had just saw was a lie. Meanwhile with Alan, he was having a whole different experiences altogether. He was still on his knees with the agonizing pain in his head and hyperventilating heavily. Now it had been made even worse with the hellish environment around him and the white rabbit had too been turned into a demoise-looking thing. 
One ear was missing the the other one down. His eyes were red and crazing looking. His clothes tatted and shredded and speckled with blood. His nails and teeth had turned to sharp claws and fangs. And his voice was now echoed and horses giving it a demonic feel. Alan please, you have to snap out of it. The not so white rabbit pleaded with him. Alan was still shrunk into his knees in the now flesh made ground with blood soaking into his jacket and sleeves splattering in his face and bald head. He could feel Wonderland around him going insane yet again. He could see the horrors of his past flash before him in the reflection of the blood pooled on the fleshy ground, with his mind already slipping back into madness once more. He couldn't calm down, he couldn't see, he couldn't breath, he couldn't think, he couldn't do anything expect feel his mind and world crumple and go completely insane. He thought this was the end, for him, for Wonderland, for all hope of any sanity altogether. He was ready to give up, he wanted to give up, but something told him otherwise. And this something had a very familiar voice with a demonic overtone to it. Pull it together Alan and calm the hell down, commanded the new voice. This is what Alan needed for him to break out of his trauma-induced trance and finally looked up. Where Izuku was once stood now sat the demonic and twisted form of the Cheshire Cat. It too looked as twisted and mad as the White Rabbit. Its body and fur even more mangy and smelling putrid with blood splattered all over its body. One ear had been torn with pieces of flesh exposing muscle and bone. Its yellow eyes were red and insane losing. Its huge grin was now full of sharp teeth jagged and a seemingly never-ending stream of blood flowed from the spaces in its teeth down its lip and onto the ground. Alan looked at the cat while he was still hyperventilating unable to catch his breath. Now that he was out of the trance he could plainly see what had become of Wonderland. And to be honest he would rather be back in that trance. At least he wouldn't have witnessed the horror around him and staring him right in the face. Quit it with another one of your episodes and pull yourself together Alan, commanded the cat. Alan managed to gain enough air just to quickly squeak out. I I can't. By my Wonderland is falling apart, along W with my M mind. And you just want to give up, just like that? Asked the cat. Why yes, I I want to give up. I I can't take it anymore. Alan said breathlessly. The demonic Cheshire cat only looked at the bland bloodied boy with a strange look on it twisted face, and resorted. So you're just going to leave him, down here forever. With no way out and let him also slip into madness along with you. Is that what you want? Alan looked at the strange cat and asked, Who? Izuku. Izuku. Alan whispered his name like it was the only thing to hold on to. If you don't pull it together he will be lost forever, just like you. Because if you can't do it for yourself, then do it for him. So, what's your decision then? Asked the cat. Alan looked to the ground and continued to hyperventilate. He looked into the reflective surface of the blood and this time didn't see his hellish past flash before him. But instead he saw all his adventure that he had spent with Izuku, the tears they shed, the laughs they had, the fun they experienced. And it was incredible to witness all over again. Alan huffed a few more time before he started to breathe slower and slower until he was breathing normally again. He took one more deep breath and when he was in control again he got to his feet weakly and looked toward the tunnel to the rabbit's hole. You're right Cheshire, he said without looking at the cat. I have to stay strong, if not for myself then for him. The Cheshire cat smiled at this, but not his usual creepy sadistic smile. This time he smiled warmly at the older bald boy's revelation. Then I wish you luck to get him home. And with that the cat disappeared. Alan slowly took one step after the other as he made his way to the hole's entrance with the white rabbit not too far behind taking the rear. Alan ignored the environment around him and kept trekking along. He eventually rested for a moment at the mouth of the entrance got to his hands and knees and crawled into the opening. He came to the door and found it wide open with the corruption of Wonderland slowly creeping in. He crawled through the door and slammed it shut after the twisted rabbit came in behind. The corruption that got in quickly disappeared after, as everything in this part in Wonderland always stayed uncorrupted, but not fully logical. Alan breathed heavily in relief as he fell to the ground knowing that he was now in the only safe spot in all of Wonderland. Even the white rabbit had some of the corruption of Wonderland drenched from him, but not all of it. His still had his crazy eyes and long teeth and claws, but his clothes looked better and his ears were almost as good as new, with many of the blood stains gone. Alan motioned for the rabbit to wait in the corner and the rabbit silently nodded his head and stood off to the side. Woody looked up from his spot and saw the half-twisted rabbit eye the corner and Alan covered nearly entirely from head to toe in blood. He sighed and asked in his British accent, It's happening again, isn't it? Alan said nothing and nodded his head. Woody sighed and replied, I was afraid you were going to say that. And here I was hoping you finally dethrone the royal malignant bitch. Alan didn't face the sentante door and stated in a silent voice, This time will be different, this time I will dethrone her for good. Then I wish you the best of luck lad. Woody commented. Alan let out a shaky breath as he slowly approached the shaking lump on the white bed in the fireplace. He grabbed the chair from the glass tea table, with the cake and potion still on top, and dragged it over to the bed where he stood atop it. He looked at the shaking bundle of sheets and lightly rubbed it. The lump stopped shaking and slowly revealed itself to be a teary-eyed Izuku. 
For a moment Izuku looked relieved to see his friend and for a moment he did. But once it passed a look of shock spread across his face as he saw his friend covered in blood. The Alan, Izuku stammered in worry. WH what happened to you? Nothing, nothing happened. Alan lied as he tried to shake his self clean. Are you alright? Izuku slowly nodded. Good good, I'm sorry for worrying you like that. He said with relief as he held the small boy's cheeks in his hands. You were very brave Izuku, I'm proud of you. What happened to Wonderland? Izuku suddenly blurted out and Alan's expression immediately changed to fear. You saw, didn't you? He asked and Izuku nodded. Alan looked down and said in a low voice, Oh no 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 no. This is bad. Very very bad. He looked back up at Izuku and said in a serious voice, I can't let this happen, not now and not ever again. Alan began to roll up his sleeves and brought them up to Izuku's head. Izuku saw this and in a confused voice asked, Alan, what are you doing? What's wrong? What happening to Wonderland? What's going on? Alan sighed knowing that he couldn't hide the truth now. And knowing he won't remember it for much longer, Wonderland is going mad. But I thought Wonderland was already mad. Izuku cut in. There's all different levels of madness Izuku. And this one will bring Wonderland to the brink of ruin. But what are you doing? I'm going to take the memory of what you saw out of your head, so you don't have to be scared by it ever again. Really? Then dot 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 why do you look so sad about doing it? Alan sighed and replied in a shaky voice. Because once I do, I'll completely remove all memory of Wonderland in the process, including me. Izuku gasped at this news and he grabbed Alan's hand before he could touch his head. Wait, he yelled at him. Why can't you just get rid of that one part of my memory instead everything with it? Because I can't. That's why. He said with sadness in his voice. I can't let what happened to me happen to you too. Izuku was confused by his statement but knew that there was something deeper behind it. What do you mean? He asked. Alan sighed deeply and sadly and replied. When I was around your age, I witnessed something. Something terrible. So terrible it scared me day and night. So I put it into the back of my mind to forget it. But that was a terrible mistake. When I did the memory festered and putrefied, then it spread like a cancer through my whole damn head. And then and then, he trailed off. What happened then? Izuku asked fearfully. It it drove me mad, completely and utterly mad. Alan finished with fear in his voice. He looked at the young boy with a serious expression. And I can't let the same thing happen to you. Not now not ever. So that's why I have to take your memory of everything that has happened. So you don't share the same fate that I have. Alan stated as he slowly brought his hands back up to Izuku's head. However Izuku grabbed Alan's hands at the last second and shouted with all his might, No. No 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 no. I won't let you. Izuku if I don't then I don't care. Izuku shouted cutting Alan off. My mommy can get me medicine and take me to the doctor to heal that memory. But but but. Izuku began to tear up. I don't want to forget you. But. Alan tried to argue but was cut off by Izuku again. Come with me to Japan. He suddenly offered. Alan was in complete shock by his sudden proposal and stood frozen while he continued. My mommy can bring both of us to the doctor and get medicine for my bad memory. And your madness. I want us to go to school together and become heroes. I want to play games and eat snacks and watch All Might videos on the computer. I want to show you all my hero stuff. I want to play games and run around with you in the spring. I want to swim at the beach and pool, chase seagulls, eat BBQ ice pops and watermelon, chase fireflies, have water gun fights, and enjoy summer with you. I want to run in leaf piles, and pick pumpkins and apples, eat and drink fall food, and watch the leaves change and fall. I want to play in the snow, build forts, make snow angels snowmen, have snowball fights, and drink cocoa in the winter with you. Please I don't want to lose you. I want to spend more time with you, for a whole year, every year. Izuku cried out to the older boy who simply stood in place with his jaw gaped and all. Because you're 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 dot 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 my best friend. Izuku squeaked out between sobs. He then buried his face into Alan's jacket and let loose a stream of cry. Alan's face didn't change, still frozen in shock. Then his face started to break and it slowly went from surprise to sadness. Alan bit his lower lip as tears started to pool into his eyes and fall down his face onto the smaller boy's shirt. He tried his best to stifle his sobs and whimpers as he said back, I want to do all those things with you too. I want us to play games and draw pictures and eat snacks and watch cartoons and movies and have fun tea parties together. I want to run in the flowers and pick them to make crowns and chains. I want to roll in green grass down hills and listen to songbirds sing. I want to eat watermelon and do more fun things in spring. I want to swim in lakes and streams and play chicken and Marco Polo. I want to catch files flies and eat ice cream in the heat of summer. I want to play in leaves, carve jack-o'-lanterns, drink fall-flavored drinks, and dress up for Hallow's Eve to eat lots of candy sweets in fall. I want to play in the snow, sing carols, eat peppermint sticks, decorate a tree, and drink cocoa by a fireplace as we wait anxiously for Father Christmas to arrive with gifts in winter. Because I I I, you're my best friend too Izuku. Alan sobbed out. 
The two boys stood in one another's embrace as they both cried their eyes out violently. They cried and cried and cried and cried not wanting to leave, or worse, forget one another. Though Alan knew it could be the way he always wanted it to be, it never does. He knew what he had to do even if it killed him. To save his friend from a fate far worse than any form of death would be worth the suffering for him later on. So he sneakily places his hand on the side of Izuku's head and whispered in an echoed voice in his ear, sleep, and straight away Izuku fell into slumber. Alan repositioned the boy so he was laying in a comfortable position on the bed. He then took both hands on Izuku's head and both limbs seemed to melt right into the young boy's head with a soft light emitting from the area. Izuku whimpered a bit in his sleep but felt no pain. Not that there was any. Alan took his hands out from Izuku's head and in his hands he held a little yellow sphere the size of a pineapple with a reflective surface. Inside the orb was the memories of Izuku's adventure in Wonderland. When he places his hand and slid it over the orb he could fast forward or rewind the memory to see different parts. Alan looked on at the point where they first meet, to where Izuku saw that shattered Wonderland, and where they were right now. It brought a tear to his blue eyes as he smiled at just how much fun he had with him despite his turmoil. Alan lifted the memory above his head as if about to let it go. And he was, he was going to let it fly away and disappear into nothing. However, he couldn't. He just couldn't. He brought his hand back down and held the memory into his chest unable to let it go. Why couldn't he just let go of this memory? Why? Suddenly a familiar voice with a not-so-demonic overtone asked, Well, are you going to let that memory disappear or not? I don't know, I want to I really do, but I can't. I simply can't. Oh what should I do? Alan asked. The source of the voice came to Alan's side and the bald boy could see it was the Cheshire Cat who was looking much better in this safe zone, or as better as better can get. He was still mangy looking but he didn't look so decrepit and demoic. He still had his crazy eye, sharp claws, and jaged teeth with blood running in between the spaces of his teeth. But he still looked and sound better. Would you like a second opinion? Asked the cat. Alan turned to the cat and asked, Then what do you suggest I do? The cat smiled and replied kindly, Memoirs define our lives and they renew us. Treat memories as you would a simple child collect them, nature them. An experience forgotten never was. Alan knew what the cat was talking about so he held the memory in his hand and focused on it. It glowed brightly for a moment and when the light was gone the memory was now turned into a little golden ring that Alan slipped on his finger. He kissed the ring and hopped off the chair to the ground where he saw the white rabbit and Cheshire Cat staring at him, waiting for him to say or do something. When it was apparent that he wasn't going to speak the white rabbit asked carefully, Is it done? Alan nodded. The white rabbit sighed and reached into one of his pockets and placed an object into Alan's hand. You'll need this to get him home, said the white rabbit. Alan looked at the small object in his hand and it was a small purple bubble wand. Alan sighed, thank you rabbit. Well, a deal's a deal. Here you are, and gave the rabbit back his pocket watch. Thank you Alan, said the rabbit as he flipped it open and read the time. And it looks like I'll make it to the queen a bit early if I leave now, remarked the rabbit. Just before the rabbit leafed through the door his attention was caught by Alan. Wait rabbit. The rabbit stopped and turned around to Alan. Will you pass a message to the queen from me? The rabbit nodded. Tell her royal heinousness. I'm coming for her, and this time I'll dethrone her for good. The white rabbit bowed deeply and relied, considered it done. And with that he left in a hurry with the door slamming behind him. Alan then went over to a dresser embedded in the wall and opened a draw, which he shuffled around in and took out a container of bubble soap. He walked back over to the bed with the still sleeping form of Izuku. He dipped the wand into the soap and blew into it. The bubble started small and soon became very very large, so large it was big enough to hold Izuku's whole body. The bubble floated over to Izuku and enveloped him. Once inside the bubble floated upwards from where Izuku fell down. Alan watched the bubble until it disappeared from sight. He sighed sadly and quietly said, Goodbye my dear friend, I hope to meet again when I'm sane, and shed another bitter tear. Alan then turned on his heels and marched over to the glass tea table where he grabbed the glass bottle and the wooden box and shoved them into his jacket. He then marched over to the door, and Woody increased in size enough for Alan to walk through without ducking, while opening by himself. Before he left he heard the Cheshire Cat call out to him and ask, So what are you going to do now? Alan stopped in place and without turning to the cat he replied with a shadow over his face, I'm going to claim what was stolen from me, I'm going to fix what I have been broken, I'm going to reclaim Wonderland. Then I wish you the best of luck, you're definitely going to need it. And with that the cat disappeared. Alan walked through the door. As he did his clothes seemed to melt off and reform into another outfit. Soon after a few steps of walking down the tunnel Alan was no longer in his psycho straitjacket. Now he was in a blue child-sized Victorian-style suit with little black shoes and a white bow around his neck. Alan made a flicking motion with his wrist and the vorpal blade shot straight out from his sleeve into his hand. As he continued to walk down the tunnel into the veil he grabbed the handle of his blade in a tight fist and his once soft charming expression twisted into a deep angry scowl. 
As he did he started to talk to himself. I'm going to fix what I and other have broken, and retrieve what was stolen. I will fight, I will not fear any more. Cause now I have a purpose to find my way through this madness. And I will regain my mind, my life, my sanity, my wonderland. So that next I meet him, I will meet him sane. No forces in all this land can stop me. He roared into the screaming wind as he trudged through into the twisted veil of tears. Meanwhile in the Red Queen's castle, the Red Queen sat elegantly and impatiently on her royal red throne, a shadow covering her face concealing her constant scowl. She drummed on her long, fleshy, sharp fingers on the armrest of her throne waiting for her summon to finally arrive. Not a moment passed by when her summons finally came to her as she thought about him. She smiled with pleasure at this seeing the white rabbit approach her. Rabbit, she greeted with the slightest bit of happiness in her demonic scolding tone. Your Majesty, the white rabbit greeted back. You're early. I am pleased, said the queen. I aim to please you, your highness. Good good. Now then, began the red queen before the rabbit cut her off. If your majesty would be so kind, I have a message for you. The red queen stopped her statement and tilted her head as she asked almost annoyed. A message. From who? Alan, replied the rabbit. Alan, the queen growled his name fairly. He says that he's coming, and this time he's going to dethrone you once and for all. The rabbit passed the message to her. The Red Queen's face contoured back into a snarl and was still rising with anger. Then she stopped and put on a fake smile as she asked, And do you think he really will succeed this time? No your majesty I don't, said the White Rabbit. The Queen smiled at this, because I know he will do it. He will make things right in Wonderland. He will dethrone you, and you will never reign in Wonderland ever again. You'll be nothing but a bad memory. The Rabbit stated boldly looking the Queen straight into her hatful eyes. Suddenly a red object shot directly under the rabbit's feet and catapulted him into the air where he impacted the ceiling with such force it shook the room and created a large dust explosion. The object that started to drip with the white rabbit's blood running down it. The Red Queen breathed heavily as she gripped the arms rest on her throne so tight that they started to break from the amine anger only climbing faster and faster till the point where she stood from her seat and let out a blood-curdling war scream. The shock the whole room she was in in the whole castle with a small portion of Wonderland. Back with Izuku. Izuku was still fast asleep safely inside of the bubble that still floated upwards of the rabbit's hole. Not too long during his ascension and he was already passing the area of the hole with all the random objects and abstract patterns that caused Izuku to go into panic attack and cause him to pass out the rest of the way down. But the noses of the area seems to be muted all the noise and reflect the incoming light form all light sources, letting you Izuku sleep peacefully. After some time the bubble finally came to the top of the rabbit's hole and squeezed through the opening causing a bit of turbulence for the sleeping boy that began to stir away. Soon the bubble floated towards the park where Izuku first started his journey and landed right underneath a large shady tree. The bubble exploded with a loud pop, and little Izuku finally woke up startled from the sudden noise. He rubbed his eyes and looked around. He was in the park, but what happened before? He felt like something happened, but he just couldn't dot 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 oh dot 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 wait, the fight that's right, Kachin and his cronies and that other kid he helped. Izuku sighed knowing that he would have to face Kachin tomorrow and his mother worried face today. But why was he sleeping under a tree? It didn't matter. What's matters that he had to get home before his mom got worried. He stood up and brushed himself off and immediately noticed that his clothes were mended. He had no scars or bruises, and he was totally clean. He was a little thrown off by this but decided not to think about it since he wouldn't have to tell the fight to his mom. Hopefully. He looked around for the park's exist and when he found it headed out on his way back home. Completely unaware of the disappearing giant's rabbit's hole he fell down. The adventure he had. The odd place he seen. The people and creatures he had meet and the friend that he left behind. He didn't notice that the park's clock had shown at 4.47pm when he left down the rabbit's hole at 4.31pm. He even didn't notice the odd floating grin and yellow eyes watching him from afar, close by and out of sight. It had been many many years since Izuku first accidentally tumbled down the rabbit's hole and into Wonderland experiencing firsthand both its raging beauty and madness. In fact it had been 8 years since then. Still Izuku had no memory of it or the boy he meet down there and became very close to, since he took his memory of him and his journey to keep Izuku from becoming mad as he. In that time to say many thing had happened in his life was an understatement. However I'll just give you the watered down version. He spent most of his life quirkless and bullied because of it. Until he nearly got killed by a sludge thing and meet his idol who gave him his quirk after watching him save his friend turned enemy. Kachin, from previous sludge thing, his idol then helped train his body to handle said quirk. He got into the school of his dreams to become a hero and along the way made tons of friend and enemy, including being attacked by the League of Villain 1.0 and 2.0, the hero killer Stain, one for all, the reformed Yakuza in saving a very special girl from their clutches, and having a brawl out with his ex-friend. So yeah, a lot of shit really went down in that time, and most of it happened in one year. 
but noting, and I mean nothing, could ever prepare him or any other pro, aspiring hero for what was to come very soon. Let's start from the beginning shall we, to a new and very wonderful chapter in the life of our favorite green-haired hero. It all started as any other day in the classroom of 1A, though it wasn't another day, at least for Izuku, since they were only five weeks away from entering their second year of the hero course. And you can well imagine that our green-haired plus ultra hero fanboy was practically bursting at the seams with excitement. It had been a rough year, but a productive and life-changing year no less, and Izuku wouldn't have it any other way. Well, except for maybe a few things, but we won't go into detail. He sat at his desk quietly writing in his hero notebook while the rest of his class chattered about tapped on their phones or sat as quietly as him, until it was broken up by a very familiar and tired-sounding voice opening the class door. All right you brats, take your seats, came the voice of Shouta Aizawa, Ak, a pro underground hero erase your head, as he trudged into his class with his normal tried expression and body language. He stood at his podium wearing his hero outfit consisting of all black attire and white scarf wrapped around his neck that almost covered his mouth. Not a moment sooner did his voice call out when everyone in class took their seats in a few short seconds bringing an almost eerie silence in the class. He shuffled around in the podium's cubby hole and pulled out four stacks of papers. Everyone in the class wondered what they were for. The tried man then gave one stack to every row of seats and everyone took one packet and passed it down. When everyone finally had their packet he finally explained what they were for. I'm sure you're all wondering what these packets for right. No one spoke but they all nodded their heads silently. Good then I'll cut straight to the point. These packets are instruction and guidelines for your international traveling. International traveling. Everyone thought in their heads. Um, sensei, what do you mean by international traveling? Are we going somewhere? Momo asked raising her hand. Only if your parents, guardians sign the permission slip on the second page and yes. He answered. Our allies in Great Britain are calling heroes and hero schools from all over the world to help aid in a crisis they are experiencing. He said plainly. A crisis. What kind of crisis is Britain experiencing that they have to call their allies from across the world to help aid them? Izuku asked aloud. Murders. The tired man answered plainly. Murders. Everyone asked aloud incredulously. Aizawa sighed at his class's recreation and calmly explained. It's not just any murders. Mysterious murders. Everyone's sweat dropped at this answer. It's so bad that the government had to get involved and still even with them, the police department, and the heroes of England they still have come up empty. Not enough evidence. Almost no witnesses, no people of interest, nothing. And the body count just keeps on climbing, practically skyrocketing. They're desperate and they need help with this and the outbreak of crime by villains taking advantage of the chaos. That is bad, Izuku said to himself. So as such they called for all their allies across the world to aid in this catastrophe. They even went as far to ask for all the best hero schools aid. So think of this as an in-the-field training. Aizawa commented. If you choose not to go or your parents say otherwise then you will stay at school and still take regular classes. There were murmurs amongst the class about this newsy, but soon Aizawa quieted then down again with his hand in a stopping motion. When everyone was quite the tired man shuffled himself back into his yellow sleeping bag and sipping himself up said, Make your decision by tomorrow and let me know, for now class is dismissed. And he hopped out of the classroom to the teacher's lounge. Soon after, everyone left the class right after their tired teacher bunny hopped away. All of them went back to the dorms to make their decisions or call their parents. Izuku on the other hand already made his decision. However, getting his mom to sign off was another thing altogether. After everyone left to make calls or just see their parents, Izuku searched her around the school for all might. After a little bit of searching he found the retired hero, turned full-time teacher, at the snack machine in his yellow striped suit. He went up to the blonde skeletal man and after a brief hello he explained his dilemma to him. All Might raised his hand followed by a thumbs up as if to say, say no more. Just leave it to me. After a very long arguing conversation and a big pot of green tea and a plate of butterscotch chocolate chip sugar cookies and co Midoriya finally gave in and begrudgingly signed the consent form. Though knowing that her son was going to be with the previous number one hero did make her felt better about it. Even if he couldn't completely protect himself, but him simply being there for moral and emotional support did make it better for her to accept. After the day had come and gone, Aizawa collected signed consent form by all his students. He honestly should have been more surprised but wasn't. Classes were then cancelled for the next three days, enough time to pack all their belongings, get all items requested in the packet for travel, and secure all necessary documents and paperwork for travel. Inko, along with many other parents, skipped work for a day to buy all necessary items that they were required to get in their packet, withdraw extra spending money for their kids, get passports and so forth, and even came to their dorm to help them get packed the night before. After the three days came and went. All the students of Class 1 were all packed and ready for their plane ride across the world. 
and Ko actually stayed at the dorms the night before, by accounts of missing the last train, to make sure her son was all packed up and to see him off before he left for a few weeks. And Ko paced around Izuku's dorm constantly asking him the same exact questions over, and over, and over again. If he had this and that and whether he had enough of this and that. At this point Izuku was almost glad to be leaving. If it meant not having to hear his mother ask the same question 50,000 times and almost flood his room with her worried mother tears. Do you have enough clothes? She asked for the umpteenth time. Yes. Izuku re-repeated himself. Do you have enough money? Yes. Do you have your extra shoes and hero outfit? Yes yes. Do you have your passport, your backpack, your wallet, your pain medicine, your notebook, your phone, your head? Yes, 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 and wait what what was that last one? And Ko giggled and pinching her son's cheeks said mysteriously, I'm just teasing you, just want to be sure you're listening as all. Izuku laughed at his mother joke, even if her content asking was getting annoying she still meant it out of good intention. It's just, and Ko trailed off, you're growing up so fast and I get worried about you especially now that you're going to another country. And here I thought it was hard just to be a whole train right away. What I'm trying to say is, I'm proud of you Izuku and I always will be, but no matter what you'll always be my little Zuzu. She smiled brightly at her son. Izuku smiled back and wrapped her in a big bear hug. Izuku then grabbed his backpack and traveled back, slipped on his red shoes and said another goodbye to his mother. Just before he left Inko called out to him one last time, Oh Izuku wait a moment. Izuku stopped and turned to his mom. I love you, y'all always be my number one hero. Izuku smiled at her and wrapping her in one last bear hug whispered, I love you too mom. Make sure not to miss the train. Izuku called out as he ran out the door. I won't. Inko called out as she waved goodbye to her son. When Izuku finally made it out of the dorms he saw everyone waiting around to be shuffled into the bus to take them to the airport. After they all filed into the bus the heroes in training all had to endure the painstaking boredom of an hour bus ride followed almost immediately by a painstaking 18-hour plane ride. And finally another 4-hour bus ride to where the meeting area would be. When the bus finally came to the stop everyone was practically crawling over one another to get out after nearly a whole day of traveling and not moving. When everyone was finally out they all took the opportunity to breathe in some fresh air and stretching their tired limbs in their hero outfits. Some even helping one another with stretching or even moving all together. Aizawa was probably the only one not affected by the travel in stiff limbs. In fact he actually looked like he benefited from it, since he took the opportunity to catch up on some much need sleep and almost all the dark circles around his eyes were gone. He even sounded less tired. Though what was really shocking or terrifying or both, was the fact that when he breathed and he didn't breathe out with a tired, annoyed sigh like he always did and actually smiled. This made the whole class sweat drop at the sight and standing a little farther from their homeroom teacher, even All Might looked a bit pale seeing his friend like this. After Izuku had finished getting the feelings back into his nearly dead muscles he looked around to see the other buses and their inhabitants all filling out. The whole group was made of all students from class 1A, 1B, support, and even general ed. A lounge with a dozen pro heroes and a small handful of UA teachers and all. Even dozens of students and staff from Shikesu had joined them on separate buses. Izuku mentally comment on how many people actually came. It was like the whole inhabitants of both top schools had decided to come on this crisis call. Wow, I can't believe it. We're actually here in England. London, England. This is amazing. Izuku awes in wonder at the cityscape stretched before him. I'm pretty excited too Deku-kun. But to me it just looks like a dirtier and less developed Tokyo. Hiroraka piped up next to him. Sniff sniff well one thing's for sure. This place definitely doesn't smell like tea, crumpets, or old ladies, came the dismembered voice of Toru. All of her classmates just stared at the floating pair of gloves and boots with questioning looks on their faces. Toru-chan, why would you say that? Asked a confused Anjiro. Well isn't London known for its tea, little bread briskets, and a really old lady? Toru asked back. Okay I can understand the tea and crumpets, but why the old lady connection? Yuraka asked. Isn't London known for being ruled by some old lady? The invisible girls asked. Oh you mean Queen Elizabeth the V. Momo stated finally drawing the connection. She and the rest of the royal family don't really run England. They're just figureheads. I'm not even too sure myself if they hold any political power at all. Izuku then saw Momo go up to Aizawa Sensei and ask. Sensei, why is it that Snipe Sensei didn't accompany us on this trip? I actually heard through the grapevine that he always wanted to visit London, England. Aizawa sighed and answered. Because heroes like Simp are actually prohibited from entering England. That doesn't seem to make much sense. So you commented. Why would they prohibit heroes like Snipe from enter this country, Kiro? On account of his quirk and weaponry. The not-so-tired man answered simply. Wait you mean to say they still have that old law in place? Gyro asked as she was helping Kaminari crack his back. What? Crack OOF law? 
Kaminari asked as his back finally popped. The short version is that they have a band on all forms of firearms. Aizawa answered. The fuck? Did these flicker learn their lesson the last 40 times someone with a 9mm and two bullets took over half the country? Bakugu stared angrily. Actually that did happen. In fact it happened only a year and a half ago. Todoroki chimed in. Except he also had a quirk that could control weather patterns. He caused havoc on a widespread scale with thunderstorms and tornadoes. Until the rubber hero, Elasticity Man stopped him. Izuku added letting a bit of his inner fanboy come out. While well, I say it's a pretty lame law. Quirk or no quirk, you should have the right protect yourself. Not all quirks are battle ready and some people don't even know how to fight to begin with. Gyro added. I couldn't agree with you more young Kayoka. However ever since the appearance of quirks the British government has used it as a scapegoat for not lifting the law. Said All Might. That's bogus. Stated Kirishima. Well at their law and there nothing we can say or do about it. Aizawa stayed blandly. Soon everyone's chatter was interrupted by the loud wailing noise of a police car driving at breakneck speeds down the road adjacent from them. The car then came to a screaming halt and stopped right across the street where their buses parked. After the dust settled from the car and everyone got the feeling in their ears back, two British police officers came out of the blue and white car, a tall one and a short one. The taller one wobbled out of the car and immediately began yelling very loud, in his native tongue, at the shorter one who was dismissing all of his yelling. The shorter one must have been the one driving and the taller one was no doubt scooting the shorter one for driving like a maniac. When they stopped their yelling and arguing they both approached the group of heroes who all watched them inquisitively. Both of them were in their early to mid-forties and wearing identical police uniforms, badges, and hats with a belt filled with every tool except a gun. The taller one was male with green eye and grayish white hair tucked under his cap. He didn't look very friendly with a very prominent scowl on his face. The smaller one was female with purple eyes and purple hair tucked under her cap. Her face showed much more friendliness than her partner but held a very neutral expression. To Izuku she actually looked like an older version of Kami. Hey who are these fuckers? Bakugu asked as he approached the male. Who the fuck are you fucker? Huh? S-Y-C-R-C-D-U-C-S-Y-T-E-S-Y-T-E-S-H-T-V-U-R-D. Said the male, or at least that's what Bakugu thought he said. Hey, the fuck you just say to me? Bakugu asked staring to get annoyed. R-D-U-R-G-D-U-Y-T-F-H-U-T-F. The male said with a scowl on his face. Hey T-Bag, you speak fucking Japanese yes or no? Bakugu yelled at him. U-G-H-U-T-G-I-U-Y-G-I-U-O-J-I-U-H. Yelled back the male while pointing at him. Don't you fuck with me like that. Bakugu roared at him. Soon the two of them were in a very heated argument not knowing what the other was even saying. Everyone sweat dropped at this display and looked at All Might and Eraser Head to stop this since that was their student. Eraser Head, shouldn't we do something? All Might asked. Actually I'm kinda enjoying this scene. It's kinda like watching two cat yell at each other. As long as it doesn't get physical I don't see any problem letting them both scream until they finally calm down. Aizawa said with a smirk. I don't think you and I are seeing the same kind of problems at hand here. Said All Might. The exploding hero in train and the grown cop continued to yell at each other in their own gibberish language until the female officer came behind the male and promptly smacked him over the back of his head. The male shuddered with his head down for a moment. Then he completely exploded like Bakugu and yelled at his partner, U-Y-T-N-U-G-U-Y-J-I-U-H-J. He yelled. This only made the female officer scowl at him with a face equally as angry as Bakugu's mom, and promptly gave him another whack on the head for whatever he said to her. U-Y-G-I-U-Y-J-H-O-I-U-H-J-O-I-H. She yelled back. H-G-U-Y-G-I-H-U-Y-G-I-J-U-G-H-J-O-I-J. The man yells while pointing his finger right at Bakugu only centimeters from his face. While the man's attention was away from him, Bakugu tired to take the opportunity to bite the officer's finger in his face. He opened his mouth about to do so but was stopped by Aizawa who glared at him and growled at him like a cat in a low tone. Bakugu I swear if you do what I know you're gonna do then God better help you. Bakugu stopped his action and closed his mouth. The two of them soon calmed down when Aizawa got their attention with a no so to crit. Ahem. They both looked at Aizawa and looked embarrassed by their little scene. Or at least the female officer did and not so much the male. The female glared at her partner as if to say, don't do anything stupid, while the male only growled at her angrily. She then walked up to the group with her neutral expression and asked very slow and calmly. Everyone could now tell what she was saying now that she wasn't talking so fast you couldn't make heads or tails of what she was babbling about. All Might cleared his throat and stepping forward replied back in English. The two of them talked for a little bit before All Might put his hand to his chin inquisitively. What did she say? Aizawa asked. She said that in order for us to communicate properly she'll have to touch my head. Aizawa shot the blonde skeletal man a confused look. Odd request but I'll oblige. All Might shrugged. 
The purple-haired police officer then placed her fingertip on All Might's templates and they both stood there with the female police office closing her eyes. In another moment All Might jumped back and let out a pain-filled gasp. He fell back only to be caught by Aizawa who asked with concern, Are you okay? All Might held his hand up to his head and replied a bit weakly, I am fine, just feel like I got some whiplash. The female police officer also looked a bit dizzy as she wobbled a bit on her boots. She shook her head and stated, Wow, now that was a head rush. Sorry about that haven't been on my a game lately. Hope you're alright. She apologized in perfect Japanese. I'm fine just a bit dizzy is all. All Might replied. That's good. A lot of people get pretty dizzy after I do that, but not as bad as you. She said. Oh fucking finally. Someone who can actually talk fucking Japanese. Bakugou shouted in anger relief. The female police officer giggled at his statement and said, Oh no I don't speak Japanese. Not a single word. Everyone there looked at the woman like she lost her mind. How, apart from your accent, you're speaking perfect Japanese right now? Lita questioned. Oh that's just my quirk doing the job for me. She answered. If you don't mind me asking, what exactly is your quirk? Izuku asked her. She smiled at him as if to say it wasted a touchy subject and replied. My quirk is called Mind Mistress. And the watered-down version of it is that I'm a telepath. Izuku's eyes shone with wonder and enthusiasm. And how does that factor into your current bilingualism? He asked her excited. The woman smiled at him and explained. I can manipulate a person's mind in many different ways, like coding a computer. One of them being I can translate language between thought and sound to make you hear and say what the other person is akin to. So you place a mental filter over someone's brain and when they speak in their native tongue their speech will be automatically translated into the other person's native tongue. And vice versa right. Izuku asked trying to make sense of it. You got it kid, right on the money no less. I have to say for someone so young you sure are a smart cookie. She complimented him with a thumb up. Izuku beamed with happiness at her compliment. By the way I'm Officer Oliver Smith, nice to meet all of you. Avila introduced herself with a friendly wave. Aizawa finally got All Might back to his feet and he stepped forward and introduced himself. Shoto Aizawa or my proname Eraserhead, call me whatever is easier for you. I'm Tashinori Yagi. All Might introduced himself by his actually name. But I'm sure you know me better as All Might began until Oliva cut him off practically screaming, All Might. All Might was a bit taken back by her sudden enthusiasm and stammer out his reply, Yes that's me. Olivia took All Might's hand and shook it roughly. It's so nice to actually meet the number one hero of Japan in person. I'm um, glad to, I'll uh, hear that. All Might stammered practically being shaken like a rag doll by the surprisingly strong woman. Don't take this the wrong way but why exactly are you here? Don't get me wrong I'm ecstatic that you're here and all. But aren't you retired after well dot 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 you know? Olivia asked him more calmly. All Might sighed and asked, so you all know about that? Made national headlines, hard to say who hasn't. She replied, while I may be retired but I mostly came as moral and emotional support for my students. The blonde man said with a smile. Olivia smiled back and said, Retired and still looking out for the greater interest of others. Man I sure wish there were more people like you. All Might chuckled and said, You wouldn't believe how often I get that. Oh where are my manners I forgot to introduce my partner. Olivia said referring to the now quite male officer with an angry scowl on his face. The grouchy old dude with the perma scowl is my partner on this case, Pleo White. Pleo just stood there with his arms crossed and grunted in response. He sure seems friendly. All Might thought to himself sarcastically. So the sushi mongers can finally understand us? Pleo asked with a grunt. Immediately after he said that the hand of Oliva came down hard on the back of his head with a loud and painful sounding smack. She hit him so hard that even his hat fell of his head from the impact. Pleo arched over for the pain running though his head as Oliva shouted at him, Don't call them sushi mongers you blasted idiot. They're our allies so treat them with respect. I call them whatever the bloody hell I fucking want to. And don't hit me on the head you fucking harlot. Pleo yelled back at her. Other smack was hit on the back of his head as Oliva shouted. Don't you call me a harlot you old sack of bone. Bloody fucking whore. Pleo shouted as he held his head from the stinking pain. This was meet by yet another smack on the head by Oliva. All Might turned to Eraser head and quietly asked. Eraser, have we seen this before? I feel like we have. I know what you mean. I got the same feeling. Eraser agreed. The two heroes then though back to when they saw a scene similar to this. Then it hit them both, the memory of Bakugu and his mother having an argument almost identical to this one. Now I remember. They both said to themselves. Their attention was brought back to the yelling officers when Officer Pleo yelled, You can't talk to me like that you witch, I'm the fucking commander of the force round here. Yeah well so am I. And that make us on equal footing so I can talk to you however I want. And don't you call me a witch either. She yelled back. Ah the fuck with you. I don't need to get into another fucking argument with you bitch. Pleo spat as he retired his hat. 
I've got a bone to pick with one of these yellow freaks, and turned towards Bakugu with a sneer on his face. Bakugu had a similar unsettling expression that yelled sadistic pleasure. That's good, now I can understand what you're saying and have a reason for blowing the shit out of you, T-Bag. Bakugu said as he licked his lips. K catch and P please don't. Izuku tired to reason with him. Shut the hell up fucking nerd. Bakugo yelled back at him. Oh yeah, and you got something to say to me a twat? Cleo asked with a snarl. Yeah since you started it when you pointed that old shriveled bony finger in my face. Bakugo resorted. Cleo hissed at him through his teeth and spat. Why you little? What? You want to make something of it? Bakugo asked clinically as sparks popped in his hands. You're barking up the wrong tree a bloody twat. Snarled Cleo. Teabag, Lil Runt, Cracker Face, Sushi Monger, British Bitch, Rice Queen, English Muffin Muncher, Chinese Lookalike, Snaggletooth, Yellow Bastard, Enough, yelled Oliva as she smacked both Cleo and Bakugu on the back of their heads. Both of their head were forced down from the impact as they held their heads from the pain stinging thought their head and down their necks. They took a moment to recover their thoughts and sight back. Then they both turned Oliva and yelled, How dare you hit me you skank. But the two of them soon resorted as they saw the angry expression raising off of Olivia's face. She was so angry even her hair was starting float under her cap like Aizawa when he activated his quirk. This made the two boys zip their mouths shut and rear back a step or two at the demonic-looking woman. They both gulped as she spoke in a very authoritative tone, I am at the end of my wits with you both. Either shut up or I'll use my empathic abilities to give you the worst splitting migraine you've ever had. Understand? She asked dangerously. The two of them nodded at the terrifying woman. Even the pros standing around watching this were frozen in fear from the very sight of her. Then Aizawa broke the tension with a not-so-obvious ahem. Oliva calmed down and passed the two frozen men in front of her and walked up to Aizawa and All Might. Sorry about all that, my partner had some personal stuff go on a few years back, never got help for it, and he's been even more unpleasant since. And sorry about hitting your student as well. Olivia apologized earnestly. Aizawa waved his hand dismissively and said, No please if you didn't hit him I woulda. Now where exactly is the commissioner and the chief thought they would be here? In fact where is anybody else? This place is like a ghost town. He asked. Olivia smiled nervously. Well you see the commissioner and the chief have about three quarters of the force trying to hunt down the villains taking advantage of all the commotion going on, along with half of the pros here in London. As for where all the people are they either left or have boarded themselves up in their own homes. She explained. I was referring to where all the other heroes are. Are we early? The racer had asked. Actually you're all the last ones. All the other heroes are actually at the statenum about five miles from here. She explained with a bit of embarrassment in her tone. Then why does the meeting place say it's right here? All Might asked. Well with everything in practical chaos going on we're so all over the place and so disorganized from it that the department made some errors with everyone's instructions. I deeply apologize for the mistakes and any complications it's caused you. She apologized. It's alright. It's understandable with everything going on. We're all human after all. All Might reassured her. Olivia sighed with relief and explained. That's a relief that you're also understanding. After I found the mistake I personally posted myself out here to redirect everyone to the right place. I would have been here when you all arrived but you know coffee, bathroom, human urges. Boy do I know that feeling. Aizawa agreed with her. If you'll follow us we'll get there and give you the debriefing on our situation. She said pointing to the police car. Oh come on Olivia. There's no need for this fucking assembly. I already told you the last four time we already know who's committing these murders, causing all this racket racket in the process. Philo half yelled at her. What? Everyone yelled aloud. Oh not this again. Olivia said not so quietly under her breath. Wait if you already know who is responsible for everything that's happening in London. Then why did you call for all heroes across the world for help? Are they that dangerous? Lita asked perplexed. Oh he's all that and so much more. Cleo said cryptically. The reason is because it's based on one accusation without any evidence or connections to the person in question. Olivia cut and pushing Pleo aside. I don't follow. All Might stated. Olivia grabbed Pleo and took him to the side where she said, Why? You can't keep saying that it's him and telling everyone that, because it most certainly isn't. And how many times I got to say that it is. I'm gonna find that bastard and give what coming to him once and for all. He shouted angrily. Olivia sighed and spoke gently. White look, what happened to your family was tragic to all those families. But you can't keep this hurt in yourself forever. Otherwise, otherwise I'll become the thing I hate and blah blah blah. I don't want your damn pity party. He shot at her. Olivia sighed. It's not pity, it's concern. Do you really want to go to your grave with all that hate? She asked. Cleo only growled in response. Besides, no one has seen hide nor hair of him since he was put into the asylum. He's probably not even in London anymore or the country. Hell he's probably not even in Europe. So we can't say it's him. Cleo looked like he wanted to argue further until All Might cut in asking. 
Um, could we please have an explanation here? Olivia turned back to the heroes and explained. Sorry about my partners confusing you all. We really don't have any poi. The person he is talking about has zero connection to the murders, apart from one thing, though it still doesn't draw a solid connection. Also he has a personal vendetta against said person. Who exactly is this person and what did they do that was so terrible? Izuku asked carefully. Olivia rubbed the back of her head awkwardly and explained. Well, you see, about a decade ago a young boy came into his school one day with a knife. Avery began to tense at her short story. He then committed manslaughter and killer everyone in the school. Teachers, students, faculty, no one was safe. And no one came out alive, except for the child. But he was soon apprehended by police the same day and taken away to a mental asylum. After that the school was closed for obvious reasons and was even dubbed the Red School Year, and he hasn't been heard of since. Everyone who heard this immediately got the chills. To think that someone so young could do something so horrible was almost impossible to believe, including my family, Cleo said in a low and sad tone. And I'm telling you it is him. Besides the gash marks in the wall we found, Cleo said, that still doesn't draw a connection. Besides the bodies, Olivia argued back. He didn't have enough time to figure out what to do with them the first time. And now that he's older he's more meticulous and cunning he's disposing of the bodies so we can't track him. He may as well have escaped from that asylum. And now he has his thirst back for murder and it's stronger than ever. Once a psycho always a psycho. Philo argued back. Yes a launch with no fingerprints, no DNA, no eyewitnesses, no nothing. All of us shit back. Um, what's this guy's name anyway? Izuku asked. Cleo looked at him and in a dead serious expression and tone replied, His name is Alan Little. Alan Little Alan Little Alan Little Alan Little. That same name repeated itself in his mind over and over again. He he knew this name, but from where? How did he know this name? And why did he feel like he remembered it but never heard of it at the same time? Izuku stood in place completely blank-eyed with mouth gaped open in shock. Everyone could see the young green hero's sudden paralysis and began to grow concerned when he didn't show any signs of movement. And Midoriya my boy, are you alright? All Might asked the stiff teen. <laughs> Izuku yelled as he fell to his knees clutching his head in pain. Midoriya, shouted All Might rushing to him. Midori-san, Lita shouted coming down on one knee beside him. Deku-kun, Yuraka shouted running to her friend. Izuku let out a few painful breaths as All Might held the teen by his shoulders. Even Aizawa looked a bit pale at this sight. The rest of the class and pros looked on in shock seeing this young man fall to the ground in a painful heap. Oliva got really scared at seeing the teen suddenly scream after hearing the convict's name. In that moment her mind went blank, while Pleo just looked at him with a are you serious look right now. Look, Izuku eventually stopped breaking in pain after a moment and sputtered out. I am fine, I'm fine are really. Fine, Midoriya and you looked like you were in horrible pain only moments ago and you say you're fine. Lita shouted incredulously while chopping his arm in the air. I it's just that name. Everyone looked at Izuku with interest. I know this sounds ridiculous but I I I feel like I've heard that name before. You know that bloody murdering son of a whore. You're an accomplice aren't you? Pole yelled at Izuku in a crazed tone while making a grab for the taser on his belt. Stop right there Officer White. Lita shouted blocking the furious man's path. Get the fuck out of my way you yellow arsed fucker. Unless you want to get tased too. He's right. Came Aizawa's voice. Stand down now. He commanded the officer with his hair and scarf rising in the air. Plo still wasn't letting down as he grabbed his taser from his belt and was about to shoot it when he felt a pair of hand touch his templates. He cocked his eyes only to see the angry school of Olivia. White I'm only going to say this once. Put the taster away or I'm going to turn you into a paraplegic for a week. She threatened. Plo looked between Oliva and the heroes a few times. He looked at Izuku with instant annoyance and with a growl he begrudgingly put his taser away. Olivia took her hands off his head. Aizawa's scarf went back to normal, and the rest of the heroes and students relaxed a bit. Seriously for once in your life Plo can you please use your thick head? There no way he has connections to him. Oliva stated. The purple bitch is right. There no way shitty Deku and this Alan fucker can even remotely know each other. They both live on upeast ends of the fucking planet and speak totally different languages. And I know for a fact that the nerd speaks terrible English and has never left Japan before. Beside that the nerd said he felt like he knew his name not he fucking knew it right of the fucking bat. Bakugu stated oh so humbly. It was almost odd for Bakugu to be defending Izuku in any way since he acts very antagonistic towards him. Olivia glared at Bakugu's comment for referring to her as the purple bitch while Aizawa and All Might shook their head at the blonde teen's comment. Though they knew he had a point seeing as he knew Izuku far longer than anyone else in the class. Bakugu-kun does raise a fair point. Not Officer Olivia's nickname but the other thing. Yuraka put forth. Olivia smiled at the brunette's comment. Though why did you start screaming in pain when you heard that guy's name Deku-kun? She asked the green-haired teen who was still rubbing the pain from his templates. 
I'm not sure myself. I don't even know why I reacted like that. I swear I never meet him or heard of him before. But his name, it felt like a wave of Naslogi when I heard it. Izuku explained. Well that was some hell of Nasloja that hit you, you sure you're alright? Olivia asked. I'm fine really. Izuku replied as he got back onto his feet shakily. Maybe let's just not talk about him to prevent whatever happened to me again. That's probably a good idea, Officer Oliver. Aizawa mentioned for her. You said something about taking us to the right meeting spot. Hmm, oh right. Just pile back into your bus and follow behind the squad car. She replied. Just before they all left Olivia asked if everyone would conjoin hands in order for her to use her quirk to create a universal translator in their minds so they could not only speak with them but anyone with a different language. At first everyone was apprehensive because of what happened to All Might. However Olivia reassured them they wouldn't have the same reaction as All Might since she herself wasn't mentally prepared. So they all agreed joined hands or any form of skin contact and Olivia used her quirk to place the mental filter in all of their brains. When Olivia finished everyone was a little bit dizzy from the experience. But Olivia had the worst of it and nearly fainted from over-exaggeration with so many minds. After the awkward and nerve-wracking moment had passed all the students and pros filed back into the buses and the two officers jumped back into their squad car where they turned on the blaring siren and speed off with the buses close behind going 80 and a 50. It only took them a few minutes to reach the stadium where the assembly was held, and it was actually being held in a baseball field stadium. The parking lot was virtually empty with only a few dozen buses and cars filling up the front part of the lot, and in a way almost felt ominous like the place really was a ghost town. All the students and pros piled out of the buses once more and were escorted by the two police officers into the stadium's huge marble opening. When they finally came to the archway that lead into the field bright light flooded their senses and blinded them for a moment. When Izukuai adjusted to the bright light what he saw next both stunned and amazed him at what he saw spread out in the stadium before him and the rest of his class. Spread before Izuku eyes in this enormous baseball field was the largest gathering of heroes from all across the world that he had ever seen in his whole entire life. When I say that there were heroes from all over the world, I literally mean the world. There were heroes from China, India, Russia, almost a dozen different parts of Europe, South America, Canada, and even America. Each country has their own spot in the stadium with their national flag to show who's who. There was lots of chatter and energy going around the whole place with everyone talking over one another and to people of other countries sitting adjacent to them. Izuku's sparkling eye looked more akin to two Milky Way galaxies in each eye with how many sparkles of pure overjoyment and excitement were reflecting in each of them. Midoriya my boy, I know you're excited but maybe hold back on your fanboying for the time being. We wouldn't want another scene. All Might said breaking Izuku out of his wonderment trance. D don't worry ya All Might. I will okay keep it tea together. Izuku said in an overwhelming shudder of excitement. More or less I suppose. All Might said to himself. Watch a look in at Kirishima Khan. Mina asked the red head. Kirishima was looking out at the part of the stadium being occupied by America with an inquisitive look in his face. I want to see if something will happen if I do this thing. Do what thing? Mina asked. Kirishima then cupped his hand over his mouth and yelled at the Americans in a chant. U.S. A. The Americans chanted back. U.S. A. U.S. A. And the Americans erupted into a thunder of cheers and wish lists. Wow, the Americans sure have a lot of spirit and enthusiasm don't they? Jairo remarked. They're just as manly as people say they are. Kirishima said with a clenched fist and a manly tear running down his face. All right, that's enough of that. Aizawa's deadpan voice stopped them before they tried something else. Then an unusually silent woman in business attire holding a clipboard came up to the Japanese heroes and ushered them down the stadium where she brought them to their place with nation flag hanging over the side. The woman then handed a thin packet from her clipboard to Aizawa and several of the pros. Before anyone could ask what they were the silent woman simply walked away. Most everyone brushed it off and took their seats, with the pros sitting in the front row and the students sitting in back of them. Soon the same silent woman walked onto the field where a few chairs, a bird perch, and a podium with several microphones sat on top with the British national flag displayed on the front, sat in the middle of the field where the pitcher's pad would be. She then walked up to a very short and impatient-looking man tapping one foot rapidly and glaring between his open pocket watch and the stands. He was dressed in a suit and tie, with black polished shoes, a monocle, and slicked back hair. He also had a very strange-looking nose, as it was long but then came to a blubus end making it look like a deformed potato. The woman walked up to the short potato-nosed man and cupped her hands to his ears and whispered something to him. The man looked at his watch closed it and did an unusual shuffle walk, like Velma Dinkley from Scooby-Doo, and hoped on top of a stool that was behind the podium. He tapped at the microphone and spoke very clearly into it with a very proper and gentleman-like British accent. Attention, attention everyone. 
Can I have everyone's attention please? Everyone fell silent after a minute or so and he continued. Heroes from across the world allow me to present the temporary commanders of the British Police Force, Officer Olivia Smith and Officer Pleo White. The two officers walked out onto the field and stood on both sides of the podium where they bowed their heads at the neck and took an at ease position, announcing the arrival of our very own president himself. President Hootley Wings. The announcer said as a huge Eurasian eagle owl in a suit flew from the sky and landed onto the bird perch next to the podium, with two bodyguards running into the field and stood at both sides of the large bird. Where's the president? Kaminari asked. There. See you pointed to the large bird. Behind the owl. It is the owl, Kiro. You guys say I'm the idiot. That's just crazy talk. A bird can't be an elected official. Yes, you are still the idiot. Did you really forget that our principal is an animal himself? Jairo chimed in. Yeah I remembered that. Except Nezu can talk and is plus ultra smart. Kamiri shot back. I'm sure he can talk otherwise he wouldn't be the president. Momo Afrid. Yeah and I'm sure glad Nezu did come with us. If that all saw him I'm sure instinct would take over common sense. Izuku sated with dread. That would definitely be mortifying. Yuraka agreed with the same amount of dread. Thinking about their principal being scooped up and swallowed whole by that large predatory bird. And last but certainly not least, please welcome the arrival of Her Most Esteemed Honorable Majesty herself, the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth Alexandra Victoria the V. The short potato-nosed man announced as everyone applauded for a very old lady that made her way to the center of the field accompanied by four guards. She walked quietly to one of the seats near the podium and sat down with her guards talking the other available seat. Is that the Queen? Kiminari asked. No, that old woman is just doing a cosplay of the Queen and the announcer is blind. Gyro said sarcastically. Of course that's the Queen Kaminari. Why would you ask that when the potato-nosed guy just said it? But why is she dressed like that? Like someone died? Kaminari asked pointing to the Queen's attire. Shouldn't she be dresses more like, well, royalty? The Queen was dressed more differently than anyone would have expected. She wore a large full-body embroidered black dress that covered every inch of her body. Black heels under her dress, black lace elbow-length gloves, and a black headdress with veil that covered her whole face. There was almost no part of her that could be seen not even her face. In her hands she held a bouquet of assorted white flowers, lilies, roses, orchids, and irises. Her body was slumped forward in an almost hunched arch and she walked very slowly, like she was carrying a great deal of weight on top of her elderly shoulders. Well of course she's dressed like someone is dead, or in this case dying. Kamiri gave her a confused look. Her country is spiraling into chaos and no one can do anything about it. Jairo explained, she must really love her country. If she's showing it like this, Todoroki commented, and now Her Majesty herself would like to give a special announcement speech for all you heroes. The potato-nosed man announced as he hopped off his stool and stood beside the podium. The queen got off her seat and very slowly walked up to the podium where one of the guards adjusted the microphone for her. Everyone leaned in as she tapped the mic and cleared her old throat. Heroes from all across the world, as Sir Penworth said I am Queen Elizabeth Alexandra Victoria the V, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to my fair country of England though I wish it were under other circumstances. And on behalf of all the people of London I would like to thank each and every one of you from the very bottom of my old heart for your attendance here today. As I look around at all of you I see firsthand what true heroism really looks like. To see so many individuals from all corner of the world to drop everything at a moment's notice. To travel from their home country they swore to protect from all forms of evil and unjust. To come together to help an ally in a foreign land in desperate need. I thank you, all of you with my most sense gratitude. Thank you for coming to protect my beautiful country. The queen choked out as tears fell down her veil and onto flowers. The queen let out a small whimper of sadness and took a hanky from her pocket and dried her eyes. When she recommused herself she spoke in a very soft and sad tone. And now I shall turn the mic over to President Wings. The queen stepped away from the mic and a roar of clapper filled the air as the queen sat in her seat and began to weep again into her bouquet. The owl stepped from his perch and onto one of his security guard's arms where the guard placed the bird on the podium. The large predatory bird ruffled his feathers and in a very gruff voice cleared his throat with an unusual sound he made after every sentence, like a horse's grunt, and spoke into the mic, Your Majesty. Heroes of all corners of the world her her her. As Her Majesty herself said I would like thank each and every one of you for coming so far to help in our most desperate hour of need her her. As I'm sure many of you know already know, our country is being overrun with a spree of mysterious manslittering cases. As such many villain and day-to-day -day thugs have come out of their hiding holes to take advantage of all the commotion her 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 her. Our citizen are fearing for their lives and not even with the combined efforts of the police force, military, and heroes we haven't even made so much as a smig of progress on this conundrum her her. But seeing all you here with some of the most prestine hero and hero schools in the entire world bring hope my heart along with all people of Britain her her. 
And so I thank and salt each of you all for your efforts to help us. The large owl said as he brought up his wing up in salute. And now I turn the microphone over to Commander Olivia Smith to explain a dire situation more thoroughly her. President Wings was taken off the podium by the same guard and placed back on his perch. Olivia marched up to the podium and after adjusting the microphone spoke with authority in her voice, President Wings, your highness, heroes of the world, I'm afraid we don't have much time so I'll make this as quick as I can. Suddenly the once dead screens all over the field flickered on and showed the British police force symbol. Izuku looked around for what caused the screen to flick on, since there was no electricity running through the stadium. He then caught a glimpse of the same silent woman from before as she stood next to one of the lower hanging screens with her hand touching it, while a strange code-looking energy seeped through her hand and into the screen with her eye looking like computer code. It seemed she had a quirk that could control any machine along as she was touching it. Izuku took note of this in his hero notebook. Oliva continued, For the last ten and a half months now we've been finding many cases of murder. If you look towards the screen nearest to you we'll show you what we've found. If you're squeamish I suggest you look away from the screens. Suddenly the picture changed to a back alley in some street corner with blood smeared all over the place. The picture changed many more times to show different alleyways with blood smeared all over the place. As you can see the only evidence we've been able to find is blood all over the crime scene and maybe some chunks of flesh. Sometimes if we're lucky we'll find a dismembered limb for analysis and trace back to the victim. The blood we find at the scene can't even be traced back to who or whatever it may belong to. The only other evidence we can find are large gash marks in the wall made by something. Though we're not sure what it is. The picture changed to many wall with deep gash marks embedded in them like something with sharp claws cut into them. Other than that we unfortunately have nothing. Olivia hung her head in disappointment. And as such we have no eyewitnesses. No clues, no nothing. Of course we have someone. Stop telling them we don't. Plo yelled loud enough for it to travel through the mic. Almost everyone in the stand seems to groan or roll their eyes at his statement showing that he's done this with more than just them, even the silent Lady Wa doing a facepalm in annoyance. Oh for fuck's sakes, fine. Olivia growled under her breath at him. She turned to the silent lady and nodded. She rolled her eyes and begrudging showed two picture on the screen. One was a headshot of bald boy who looked around the age of 12 and almost like a lobotomy patient with his dead fish expression. The second was another headshot of a significantly different looking boy who looked to be much older, around Izuku's age or older, with a large smile, closed eyes, and black hair. At the sight of the dead fish looking boy Izuku's head started to spin once again as the young child's face began to do the same thing as his name. He knew this face but didn't at the same exact time. What was going on with him? He tired to hold back the pain as he clutched his head and let out a deep groan of pain. Lita and Yuraka, who were sitting next to him, saw what was happening and tried to help him any way they could. The pain eventually subsided as quick as it came and Izuku said breathlessly, His face, I feel like I've seen it before. Why? I'm not sure Deku-kun, but me and Lita are gonna find out what is causing this. Yuraka smiled as Lita nodded in agreement. Thank you guys. Izuku thanked his friends. Oliva cleared the annoyance in her voice and said, Okay we have one suspect his name is Alan Kinsley Little, however, he doesn't draw a decisive conclusions from current evidence. If he is found please arrest him and bring him in for questioning. Though be wary he was the culprit as he was responsible in the red school year. Caution is advised for all of you. Assume him to be armed and dangerous. Oliva cleared her voice again to get rid of the tickle of anger welling up inside and continued. Now that that's out of the way let's get to the villains who have resurfaced in Britain taking advantage of all the chaos happening. Oliva then went on to show about a dozen or so individual criminals with name and quirk written on the mugshot. She gave a brief description of each and the nature of their quirks along with just how dangerous they really were. After she was done explaining all the criminals she then told everyone to turn their attention to the nearest screen where it showed a huge list in categories of two. If you will all look at the packets given to you, you will see two set groups each with their own numbers and then divided into their own sub-category. Each number represent each one of you heroes. Group Alpha will be assisting the police and military to apprehend all the criminals, and Group Omega will come with the remaining force to investigate these murders. We've tried to make sure all the groups with hero students have at least one teach, pro from their home country. If there are any mistakes then please come to either me or my partner and we'll change it immediately. I thank you all for your help in this endeavor. She ended with a bow of her neck. After the clapping subsided everyone began to chatter again reading to get into their groups to aid with the British government. Meanwhile everyone in class 1 were practically climbing over one another to see who was where. While Aizawa's attention wasn't even on the packet or the students. Um, eraser. All Might called for Aizawa attention. Come, he grunted back. The students are dying to know who's in what group. The blonde man explained. 
Aizawa then threw the packet towards All Might. All Might noticed his friend's odd behavior towards the center of the field where most of the pro had gathered around the police officers and passing the packet back to the students to fight over he stated, You got that look on your face again. Which look? He asked back. The one that says I'm going to break the rule and or do something stupid look. The blonde answered. Something like that. He said as he got up and jumped over the rail to the field where he trudged over towards the officers. All Might watched as his friend took off to the officers for whatever he was planning to do, and leaving him with all of the students by himself. All Might sighed at his friend's mysterious behavior and turned around to see all of Class 1 a trying to see who was going where with who. He also saw as Yuraka and Lita were trying help a very painful looking Izuku. Shock rose through his body as he pushed through the other students to make sure he was okay. He mentally kicked himself for not taking notice sooner. Midoriya my boy, are you okay? All Might asked him. The young green-haired boy rubbed his head trying to get rid of the pain coursing through it. He breathed a shaky breath and replied. I think so. I got the same reaction when I saw that guy's face, though it wasn't as bad. All Might sighed knowing that everything isn't alright with him. After all he did saw the same thing back in his youth saying everything is alright with him even though it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea convincing his mother to let him go on this trip if her was already falling in pin before they started the mission. Izuku could see the look on All Might's face and tried to reassure him, All Might, I'm fine really. But he's if this Allen guys really does have something to do with what happening to me and the murders then I'm probably the best thing we have now for anything regarding this guy. I just wish I knew why I know him and not at the same time. All Might sighed. He knew that Izuku was right whatever's going on in London and with Izuku are somehow connected to this Allen little. Okay young Midoriya I'll trust you that you're okay. But don't push yourself with this or I'm going to bench you. All Might told him sternly. Izuku smiled and boldly said, Yes sir. What are you two talking about? Came a voice from behind them. All Might practically jumped out from his pants and Izuku was frozen in fear as he turned white. All Might whipped around to see the deadpan expression of Aizawa's face. All Might breathed out in fear. Don't do that you nearly gave me a heart attack. He scolded him. Don't go dying on me already. Aizawa depained. All Might sighed at his friend's attitude and took notice of the two folders in his hands. What are those? Folders. I know that I mean what's in them. Oh, paper. All Might facepalmed at his reply while the rest of the class was either doing the same or giggling. And here I thought Aizawa sensei didn't have a sense of humor. Minda whispered to Siro. Just tell us what they're for. All Might complained. Aizawa then handed the skeletal man one of the thinner packets. He opened it up and saw only about a dozen papers inside. He flipped through them quick and asked, Is this it? Unfortunately, she was very apologetic for not having more clues for us to work from. Aizawa answered, What is it sensei? Momo asked, This is all the information on the murder cases. All Might answered, It looks more like a book report for college students. Why is it so thin? Hiroshima asked, Like all of us said before, they have almost no evidence, no witnesses, no clues, no leads, no people, no nothing. Aizawa answered, Do they have any connections between the murder victims? Lita asked, I'm afraid not they don't have any connections. What they can scrounge up from the remains is only random people with no clear connection to any one of them. Aizawa replied, So it's just manslaughter cases, killing for no reason other than just to kill, said Lita. So we really are fighting an invisible enemy. Not quite, Aizawa suddenly stated. Everyone looked to him in question. When I asked Officer White about this Alan Little character, he gave me this folder after I convinced him we were going to start looking for him in order to arrest. Aizawa said holding up the other folder. So you lied to him to give you information? All Might asked skeptically. He was skeptical when I asked for any info on Alan. When he asked for what reasons and I couldn't give him or think of a good answer answer, I simply told him what he wanted to hear. So when I said that we were going to searching for him he was more than happy to give me anything he had, and had this sinister off-putting serpent looking smile on his face while doing so. Gave me a bad feeling in the pit of my soul. Something wasn't right with him or why he's even acting like this to arrest this guy in the first place. Aizawa explained with a shudder. All Might took the folder from Aizawa and flipped through it quickly, or really something isn't right with this whole thing. All Might offered. I suppose you have a plane in mind eraser head. I do. We'll conduct our own secret invention regarding this Alan Little. You and I will take a group of students to draw suspicion away from us as we investigate. We'll interview the one eyewitness and follow a trail of breadcrumbs from there. Wait I thought Officer Olivia said there were no eyewitnesses at all. Izuku asked. She may have been misinformed by her partner. According to this folder from Plio, there was one eyewitness who saw something. However it was considered as false evidence due to the victim giving more than one story with neither making much sense. So it was put down as indecisive evidence, and the victim called well. A loony. Aizawa explained. Something's definitely amassed here and Officer Plio is definitely behind it in some way. Am I to assume that you have a group picked out to go on this mission, and you will start with this single eyewitness first? Lita asked. 
Exactly. Izuku you're coming with me and all might. You have some kind of connection to Alan so maybe you can remember something that may help us. Aizawa motioned to Izuku. I'll do my best sir. Izuku replied. You're Araka, Lita, Kirishima, Mina, Momo, Toru, so you're with us. Aizawa motioned to the other kids. You can count on us sensei. Kirishima said manly. We'll do our best. Toru chirped. Hiro, croaked Tsuyu. Yes sir. Lita, you're Araka, Mina, and Momo said in unison. The rest of you with the groups you're assigned to. Yes sir. They all said in unison. Class 1 all left the stadium and diverged into their groups to help find the villains and investigate the murders. While Aizawa and All Might's group went on their own to begin conducting their own investigation of Alan Little and his connection to Izuku and the murders. So who exactly is this eyewitness that we have to interview Aizawa Sensei? Izuku asked his teacher as they started to walk down London Street. Aizawa opened the folder that had all of Alan Little's information in it and looked over a page and read aloud. A man by the name of Auden J. Smoker. He lives on 301 Mulberry Way in Apt, 17 degrees Celsius. So that's where we'll start. So the group of hero walked off to the home of this smoker fellow to find any information on the murders befalling London and the young man who seems to be at the center of it all. After a short bus ride downtown the hero found themselves at the home of Mr. Auden Smoker on Mulberry Way, Apt, 17 degrees Celsius. It was a quaint little building in a quaint neighborhood with identical buildings all sandwiched together. Each one was colored a light shade of gray. Built two stories high, was all brick at the first floor and wood on the second with a blue shingle roofs. Plain oak doors with small metal fence in front. Some houses had plants, straight concrete, garbage or nothing altogether. Each house had a simple metal mailbox with the house's number written on them. They found the one marked 17 degrees Celsius. Push open the strangely unlocked gate, walked up to the door and rang the doorbell. After a few minutes passed with no answer Aizawa rang the bell again. And this time a very gruff and loud voice shouted from the other side, Yeah yeah I heard you the first bloody time. Hold your shite for a moment would ya? Soon came the sound of footsteps followed by the sound something hitting into something else. Then the sound of something breaking with a shattering noise to accompany it. Then a multitude of angry curse words from the same voice. The voice cursed up a storm for another minute. Even worse than Bakugu ever could, the voice groaned in pain and shouted, Hold on hold on I'm common. The sound of many locks were heard from the other side of the door and once the last lock was opened the door creaked open to reveal a short angry looking man. The man looked in his very late 40 seconds even early 50 seconds. He had pure grey hair with a thick grey moustache. He wore a plain grey outfit to complement his hair with black shoes. His eyes were a fiery orange. And in addition to holding an angry scowl on his face he held a pipe clamped between his teeth. He took a few puffs from his pipe and asked in an annoyed tone. What the fuck do you lot want, eh? He looked down at all of the students' hero outfits, but immediately looked back up when he caught a glimpse of Momo's. Ain't you all a bit early for Hallow's Eve? We're heroes. Aizawa explained deadpan. Right, and I'm the bloody Queen of England. He mocked him. Aizawa and All Might pulled out his hero license and badge showing it to the man. The man took out some glasses and after inspecting it he asked incredulously, The hell you lot want anyway? Are you Mr. Auden J. Smoke? All Might asked him. Yeah, what's it to ya? We wanted to ask you a few questions about your... Incident, Aizawa asked. Smoke looked at Aizawa with more annoyance and in his gruff voice half yelled, Well fuck you to that then. I ain't saying anything to you fuckers, especially after what how that officer that came here last time treated me. He was about to slam the door on them when Lita put his calf through the door calling out, Wait. Smoke reopened the door and looks at him with annoyance. What do you mean by that officer? He asks him, Well why the bloody hell should I tell you? In fact why the fuck should I trust any of you lot? Eh. He yelled at them. Izuku's breathed and very calmly answered. Because we're not the police and we're not here on their behalf either. We're here to stop the plague of murders spreading across England. And the only way we can do that is with your help. The more we're set back the more people die. Losing neighbors, friends, family, loved ones. But if you help us we can save that many more people. Isn't that worth to save that someone who's loved by someone? Smoker's face softened at his words he looked at something near his door, smiled and began to get all teary-eyed. He rubbed his eyes dry and with a heavy sigh said, All right son, you've convinced me. I'll tell you all I know. Izuku smiled at the man change of heart. However you have to believe everything I say no matter how ridiculous it may sound. Even sounds crazy when I replay it to myself. We're heroes sir we've seen a lot of strange things. Nothing can surprise us. Aizawa resorted. Oh you won't be saying that after you hear what I've saw. Smoker replied mysteriously. Now get your arses inside you're letting out all the AC. And watch the glass on your way in. Everyone shuffled into the house one by one with Aizawa and All Might in the front. As Izuku walked and he noticed two things immediately. First was a knocked over stand with a shattered something covering the ground. Second was a picture hanging by the front door with five people. 
First was Smoker himself, then a beautiful woman with brunette-colored hair, and last were three very excited children with black hair, brown hair, and a little one with red hair. No doubt this was Smoker's family. After they came inside Smoker motioned for them to take a seat at the two couches in the living area. Sorry that we made you break. Um, whatever that was by your front door. Momo apologized with a bow. Smoker waved off her apology and said, Think nothing of it, I was actually hoping to break that old thing. Always thought the kids would do it first. Why exactly did you want to break it? She asked. It was a gift from me mother to me wife. He explained calmly. Um, why would you want something like that to break? Mina asked very confused. Me mother hated me wife. Gave it to her as a passive aggressive hand me down to say fuck you. Nothing I ever did made that old hag happy especially my wife. If anything you law actually helped me. You're welcome, Kirishima said in a question. Alright stay right where you are and I'll be right with some tea. Smoker stated as he walked to the kitchen. That won't be. All Might began to say until he stopped himself as he watched Smoker literary walk right through the wall like a ghost. Necessary. He drowned out. A few minutes later Smoker phased through the wall again this time with a tray in his hands. Oddly enough the tray phased through the wall with him. When he got close everyone started to coughing violently. Smoker saw this and said, hold on a minute. As he opened a window and everyone started breathing normally again. You can turn your body into smoke. Izuku asked still coughing. Smoker relit his pipe and puffed on it a few times before answering. Yeah, my quirk is called Smoke Man. I can turn my body and anything I touch into smoke. I can even go through walls with other objects. Though I can only do that depending on how long I've smoked previously. I can even control any smoke in my vicinity. He showed his quirk off by forcing all the smoke in the room to blow out the open window. Now did you come here to chat about our quirks over tea or did you come here to stop all these bloody murders going on? Oh right sorry. Hum please take all the time you need to explain everything you saw in as best detail as you can. Izuku replied nervously. First can you tell us about this office you mentioned before? Aizawa interrupted. If it's so important to you, yeah, I'll tell you about him. He called himself something white. Had a weird first name started with P I think. Smoke explained while scratching his chin. Cleo White. Yuraka asked. Yeah and that's the fucker. Real sour guy. Made me look docile by comparison. Well that's a lot coming from you. Aizawa depained. Oi, I already know I'm pretty rough and curse like a sailor, and I like it that way too. Smoker resorted with pride. What exactly did Office White do that put you on such edge with us? Izuku asked the man. I gave him the truth that's what. People nowadays always want the truth but once they get it they don't like what they hear. Smoker complained. Aizawa only gave him a can we continue look. Right I'm getting off topic aren't I? So long story short after my dot 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 let's call it my experience yeah. Mr. Pleo came to me for a report. After I gave him the whole truth with my story he got all red-faced with anger and immediately exploded into an adult-sized tantrum. Started screaming and yelling incoherently at the top of his lungs and even kicked some furniture. He gets all in my face with this savage look and tells me if I don't give him what he wants to hear he'll tracer my arse and send me to the loony house. He actually said that. Are you sure you're okay after that? Lita asked with concern. I'm fine, thanks for the concern though. I was more glad my wife and kids weren't in the house at the time. If he weren't on the force I swear I'd give that asshole an adult-sized arse whooping to teach him some right good manners. He stated while raising an angry fist. On that we both can agree. Aizawa agreed with him. Also no he didn't say all of that. But that's just what I read from what he was yelling at me. So to save my arse I make up some bullshit story and he stood there writing something completely different down. So what's on here isn't true. Aizawa asked as he handed a paper from Alan's folder. Smoker took the paper and read it while puffing on his pipe. Yeah, every last word is a big fat fucking lie. The guy this report describes didn't attack me. He actually saved my life. Smoker explains. He did. Lita asked in surprise. Yeah and that's the truth. It actually pertains to my experience. That is if you're still so pleased to hear it, son of a bitch. Aizawa ignored the last part of his question and taking out a pad and some paper alongside Izuku he said. Go on. Smoker took a few more puffs from his pipe. I know you lot have lots to do in little time so I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Take all the time you need to sir, Lita said while adjusting his glasses. So Smoker started with his story, so it happened about two weeks ago. It was just after dinner time and I was in a back alley not too far from my home. Why were you in an alley in the first place? Why not out on your front porch, Hiro? Suyu asked while sipping her tea. Wife doesn't like it when I smoke in front of the little ones, so I go there to have a puffy that's why. Puffy, Mina asked in a low tone to Momo. Smoking, the taller girl translated. Nina gave a thank you thumbs up. So I'm just standing there in the alleyway by myself enjoying the cool night air when I hear someone walking down the alley. This doesn't strike me as a surprise since many people use that alley as a shortcut. I don't pay any mind to the person and they walk by me with a civil good evening. I return the compliment and that's the end of that. 
It is, Yuraraka asked incredulously. Or so I thought at least. Suddenly the ground all around my feet starts to flood up to the point it came up to my heels. He didn't say it was raining that night. Kirishima asked. That's cause it wasn't. The liquid was sealing up through the ground in between the cobblestone. And it had a strange a pungent smell to it. Smoker explained with a nervous sound in his voice. Like what? What did it smell like? Tur asked. Rotten fish mixed with iron. The smell of blood. Everyone gulped involuntarily at this revaluation. Blood was coming up through the ground. The normally cool Aizawa asked with a nervous tone. Told you you never hear nothing till I tell you what I saw. Smoker said with a bit of smugness in his voice. Anyway I was pissing myself too and was ready to hightail it out of there when I finally figured out what it was. But just then out of completely nowhere a giant tentacle as long as a train. Made of raw pink flesh and blood shot straight out from the pool around me. It grabbed me in a moment's notice and started to whip me around violently, like a rag doll. Everyone's mouths were hung open in shock at the man's description, so much so that Aizawa and Izuku stopped writing everything down and listening to the man's story in suspense. My mind is racing at a thousand miles wonder what's going on. How did this happen? Was this a dream? And was I going to die? I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scared out of me wits. However just as suddenly as it started it stopped. It went completely stiff all cartoon style and then it started to shake or vibrate whichever and in another moment it completely exploded. He emphasized with his hands. Like kaboom explosion or fell apart explosion? Izuku asked a bit nervously. A bit of both. Main point it fell apart into a bunch of blood and flesh chunks leaving me to fall 40 feet through the air. Thought I would have died. But fate had other planes. And out of nowhere I feel someone grab hold of me bridal style as I fall. I look up and see the same person from before. We float down like some kind of magical pixie dust or some shit. I don't know what was going on, but we were floating down like we was on a parachute. We finally land on the ground all gracefully and shit. He puts me down and asks if I'm alright. I'm just standing there pissing myself and the only thing I can do is nod me head like a mindless wanker. Then the blood pool grows larger and five more of those tentacles shoot out of the ground. The guy tells me to run and hide. I don't have to be told twice when I run to the nearest dumpster and jump inside for cover. I peek out of me hiding hole and I see that guy dancing around the tentacles. Dancing like the foxtrot dancing. Mina questioned with a nervous tone. Though, like moving around them so quick they can't touch him dancing. Smoker explains. He was moving around these things like they're nothing. And the tentacles are trying their best to grab hold of him or squash him. Every time they actually came close enough to grab him he would disappear and then reappear into thin air. He could teleport. All Might asked. No not teleportation. But something akin to something in video games. I think it's called smoke dassing or something. One minute he there and then he in another spot. Said Smoker. I'm not following. Said Aizawa. Oh I get what he's saying. Kirishima stated. In some video games you have a move that allows you to evade all enemy attacks by doing a roll move or something similar. If you time it right every time you're basically untouchable. Yeah, exactly like the red one said. Smoker agreed with him. Only instead of rolling out of the way he would transform in a cloud of insects. Um, insects? Lita asked. I think they were moths or some kind of butterfly. His body would turn into the bugs and reform back someplace else in the blink of an eye. I even saw him hold that move for at least several seconds making him intangible. Izuku and Aizawa wrote down what Smoker was explaining, under what Alan's quirk was. Then he take the largest ass kitchen knife I had ever seen in my whole life out from who knows where and starts to slice and dice these tentacle things like they're made of wet paper. He cuts apart the last one and the blood pool seeps right back into the ground not leaving behind a trace of it. He puts away the knife, brushes himself off with not even a speck of blood on him, and walks right past me in my hiding spot not even noticing I was there. I couldn't even move or make any noise from how scared I was. So I guess that's the only reason why. Then I hear him nervously muttering to himself about something as he passes me by. I must have waited at least an hour before I finally sprang from that dumpster and hightailed it back to my house where my poor wife was nearly scared half to death seeing me burst through the door so late covered in blood, shaking like a leaf, smelling like a dumpster, and pale as a baby horse. Smoker started with a bit of embarrassment in his voice. Is that all? Aizawa asked and Smoker replied with a silent nod. Can you give us a description of what this person looked like? He asked him. When he saved me from falling on my head and peeking at him through the dumpster I remember what he looked like quite well actually. Izuku flipped a page ready to draw down Smoker's description. He was much taller than me at least over six feet and extremely thin. He had very pale sickly looking skin. His hair was black as a raven's feather and very curly. Shaved at the sides leaving the top long and pulled back in a bun. He had the most stunning shade of baby blue eyes I had ever seen. He also had very soft facial feature like he managed to keep all his baby fat on his face. As far as his clothing goes he was dressed very. Stangly. Strange how. All Might asked. He was dressed really old-fashioned, like 1860s old-fashioned. 
blue waistcoat, blue pants, black knee high laced boots, white undershirt, lace leather vest, and a big white bow tie with a tiny skull in the center. Smoker explained. Aizawa shuffled through the folder and pulled out two pictures and gave one to Smoker. Do you recognize this person? He asked. Smoker took out his glasses and looked at the picture of a young, bald, dead fish-eyed boy who looked like a lobotomy patient. He shook his head. No no no, never seen this decrepit child before in my life. Aizawa took out the second picture and handed it to Smoker asking, How about this one? Smoker's eyes lit up when he saw the picture and practically scared everyone half yelling, Yeah, that's the guy who saved me. Him. Thaws looks exactly like him. So we have one connection made. Now we just have to find something we can branch off from Smoker's experience. But what? Aizawa thought to himself. Now look here you lot. Smoker called for everyone's attention. At this point I really can't tell the difference between truth and myth. But if you really think this guy is as dangerous as that officer says he is then I don't believe you one fucking bit. Everyone looked at Smoker's statement in confusion. Even though they didn't say he was dangerous it still is strange that he would make a statement like that on a potential convict. I'm not sure what the hell he did in the past to get such a reputation and to be honest I don't really give two flying fucks about it. That kid saved my life plain and simple. If he's really as bad as he's made out to be I'm sure I wouldn't be here discussing it with a lot of you. He not only gave me a second chance at life, but he also gave my wife her husband and my children their father and for that alone I'm indebted to him. Everyone was both shocked and moved by Smoker's statement about Alan. To say that you were indebted to someone was a bug thing to announce, but to say it about a convict would make you sound ballas or just crazy. Though in a strange way, in Smoker's case, it made sense why he would say that. You didn't by any chance catch what he was muttering to himself, did you? Izuku asked him. As a matter of fact I do. I was so scared from that experience that every last detail of what happened is permanently ingrained into me memory. See as he was getting off track Smoker cleared his throat awkwardly and continued. Anyway I didn't catch all of it since he was talking so softly but I could just make out a few words. Tea, sweets, biscuits, and flowers. Everyone looked at one another wonder what their culprit could have meant by that cryptic gibberish. You wouldn't happen to have any idea what he might have been talking about. Izuku asked. Uh, no 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 I don't. He replied. Everyone knew what that meant. Back to square one on their investigation. Until Smoker suddenly shouted. Oh no wait. I think I have something. Could have said that a bit earlier. Mina said under her breath. There's a tea shop, a sweet shop, and a bakery owned by three brothers only a few miles from here. The missus and I always go there. Got great prices, quality products, and the three of them are real kind blocks themselves. As far as the flowers go I do know one place downtown by the old park on 22 cent. Right by Crocus Lane. A kind yearly lady, goes by the name Granny Green Thumbs, has a small botany shop near the park. Real nice lady, real old too, I think she at least 93. God bless her soul for living this long. Makes the most beautiful bouquets anyone would ever lay eyes on. Takes her a long ass time to do it. Poor old thing has arthritis for days. I don't know if those were the places he was talking about. Thought those are the closest ones that I personally know of. Smoker explained. You don't happen to have the clothing you wore that night on your attack would you? Aizawa asked. Fared not. That white fucker took it as evidence. But if you ask me he either got rid of it or destroyed it by now. I'm not sure what's with that guys but he seems to have some kind of vengeance against that kid. Smoke told him. Aizawa and All Might finished their tea they stood up in straightening their clothes. And with a bow said, Thank you very much for your help sir you've been an invaluable help to us in this endeavor. Smoker puffed on his pipe while waving the compliment off like it was nothing. Yeah yeah, you're welcome and all that fuzzy shit. Now out with the lot of you. The missus and I have our anniversary today and I want to get this place spotless and dinner on the table before she get home from work with the kids. Now out with you all. He shouted as he literally pushed everyone out his front door. The door slammed loudly behind them followed by the sound of every lock being locked back up again. Then the sound of smokers heavy footsteps walking away, probably back to the kitchen. When everyone processed what happened only moments ago they all awkwardly walked from out of the front yard, out of the gate, and out onto the street where they waited at a bus stop. Izuku turned to Eraserhead who looked between the reports in the file and the notes they both took down with concern in his eyes. Suddenly Aizawa took almost all the papers from Alan's folder and ripped them to shreds in front of him. Everyone was shocked for a moment and could say anything until Izuku and All Might finally piped up and asked, W why did you just do that? Aizawa sighed and replied, Because whatever is in that folder and no doubt false and untrustworthy information that we can't actually use. For now we can't trust anything in this folder until we get the whole story on Alan Little and find what's real and what's made up. So what the plain? Izuku asked. We follow our trail of breadcrumbs and collect as much information as we can. 
Aizawa and All Might flipped through his notes and stopping at one page he continued, starting with those three brothers that own those three shops Smoker mentioned to us. After another short bus ride into the small township the bus made a stop about a dozen miles from where Smoker lived at three shops sandwiched in between one another. So this was no doubt the places that Smoker was talking about, the three shops run by three brothers. Everyone filed out of the bus and Izuku stood there taking in the sight of the three shops staring at it for a moment. The first one on the far left was the tea shop. It was painted a light green like green tea. It had two windows with racks filled with cans of different teas, and had a sigh above written in English that read tea. The sign was cut and painted into the shape of a piping hot cup of tea with the tea bag string hanging out of it. The shop in the middle was the sweet shop. It was painted just like a cake with a tame body that came up to a chocolate brown top. The windows were filled with racks of different mouth-watering candies. The sign was cut in the shape of a villial cake with sprinkles with the word sweets written in English. The last one on the far right was the bakery. The whole place was painted like a loaf of fresh bread. And like the other shops had its windows with fresh-baked bakery goods lining itself, the smell wafting from the shop was just as delicious as it looked. It too had a sign cut in the shape of a baguette with the words bread written in English. Midoriya are you coming or are you going to stand there staring all day? Aizawa drowned out. Snapping out of his trance Izuku and shaking his head clear ran up with the group saying, I'm coming. The small group walked up to the tea shop and pushing open the door the sound of the bell rang as they all enter. I'll be with you in just one minute called a cheery voice from behind the counter. On the inside the whole shop was very very small with tall shelves that extended from corner to corner and wall to wall brimming with all different teas in different packages, colors, and so forth. Izuku mentally wondered if the other shops were exactly the same style as this one. Suddenly the voice from behind the counter sprang up and with a kind smile and cheery voice, sorry about that, was checking me inventory. The man apologized. He was around his late 30 seconds early 40 seconds with blonde hair and brown eyes, he wore a plain white button shirt with blue jeans. His smile was kind, very inviting, and almost shining, and his hair and shirt had a multitude of different tea leaves stuck to him. So how can I help you? The man trailed off after seeing the students in their hero outfits. He rubbed his chin in thought and asked, Ain't it a bit early for Hallow's Eve? Before Aizawa could answer the man cut him off saying, Wait I got it, you're all cosplayers aren't ya? Aizawa still didn't get to answer him as the man cut him off again placing his elbow on the counter trying to guess what they were. Now let's see here dot 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 you're some green ninja rabbit, you're a space girl, you're the ghost of haunted gloves and shoes, you're a commando frog, you're a pink punk rock army alien, you're a white knight, you two are a male and female stripper, you're a skeleton in a suit, and you're a hobo. How'd I do? He guessed it pointing to Izuku. You're Raka, Tur, Suyu, Mina, Lita, Momo and Kirishima, All Might, and Eraserhead in that order. Wrong on all accounts. Aizawa finally managed to speak. We're heroes. The man gave a skeptical eyebrow and Aizawa rolled his eyes show him his licenses. The man looked it over and laughed nervously. He he sorry about that, but your hero outfits are very strange looking. And here I though the heroes round here looked odd. So what can I do for you heroes? I don't think you're here to sample my fares or ya. No we're not. We're investigating the murders going plaguing England and part of our investigation has led us to you and your brothers. So we're wondering if you three could answer a few questions for us. All Might asked the man. The man placed his hand to his chest and with a bow replied, It would be our pleasure. Just let me grab my brothers real quick and we'll answer anything you need. The man then walked to a door behind the counter pointing towards the shop next to him. And just before he opened it he face palmed and turning back to the hero said, Where are my manners today? The name's Militian, but you can call me Mill for short everyone does. Mill opened the door and yelled into the opening, Hey Will. Yeah, called another voice, properly belonging to Will. Go get Billy Boy and bring him over here. Why? We got heroes here who need our cooperation with the murders. Say no more will be over in a tick. The sound of another door could be heard opening and Will shouting into the passage, Hey Bill. Yeah, called another faraway voice most likely being Bill. Get over here Mill needs us. For what? He's got heroes that need our help with the murders or something. Okay be over in a tick. Then the sound of two sets of footsteps could be heard walking along the hardwood floors of the other shops. After a few moments two men walked through the side door into Mill's tea shop. Izuku immediately noticed that the three of them were definitely triplets since they all had the same face, height, eye color, and looked the same age. The first one had black hair and wore a smock with chocolate splattered all over it, gloves, and fisherman boots. This one had to be Will. The other had very light brown hair. Wearing a baker's outfit and large hat, he had flour covering his face and clothes and smelled like butter. This one had to be Bill. Well brother let's give them the old brown family how do you do? Said Mill. Are you ready fellas? Ready. The other two chanted. How do you do I'm Militant Brown the oldest. Militian cheered. I'm William Brown the middle child. Will cheered. And I'm Billy Brown the youngest. Bill cheered. 
were the brown triplets. It's nice to meet you. They all cheered in unison while striking a pose. They sure are a lot friendlier than Smoker and Silire. Izuku thought to himself. Now what did they need us for anyway Mill? Bill asked Mill. They need our help in the investigation of the murders. Their investigation and witnesses lead them to us. Bill told Will and Bill. Ahem. Brown triples if you don't mind I'd like to get on with the questioning. Aizawa depained at the three men. Oh sorry. Please ask us anything and we'll tell you all that we can. Bill apologizes with Will and Bill nodding in agreeance. All Might shuffled through the folder and pulled out the current picture of Alan and handing it to the three men asked, Do you three know anything about one Alan Little? Alan? Mill questioned. Oh yeah Alan. Will stated with glee. We know Alan. He's a regular of ours. Bill said with glee. Wait has something happened to Alan? Mill asked. Is he hurt? Did he become a victim of these murders? Will asked worried. You're not seriously thinking he's the one responsible for the murder are you? Bill asked astonished. Cause that's just nonsense. All three said in unison waving it off like it was nonsense. I wish they would stop talking like that. It's giving me a headache. Aizawa thought to himself. We've only labeled him as a person of interest nothing more. Though we do have reason to believe that he is in some way connected to the murders. Until we find everything we can we won't make any assumptions. Aizawa explained to the three men. Though I have to ask why exactly you're defending him if you don't mind. All Might asked him. All three men looked at each other and nodded with a smile. Then Mill started their explanation, because Alan is a great kid with a great heart. There's absolutely no way he would do something to this degree, said Will. He wouldn't hurt anything, unless provoked, said Bill. Can you please tell us everything you know about him? Izuku pleaded with the men. The three men looked between Izuku's eyes and back at each other as if they were having a mental conversation. They nodded once more with each other and asked, Well that depends you see. What exactly are you gonna do once you have all the info you need on Alan? And then what are you going to do with him once you find him afterwards? Mill asked him. Hey, you just said you'd be more than happy to help us. What gives? Hiroshima shouted at them. Now that it's about Alan at a much different playing field. So like my brother asked before. What are you gonna do with Alan? Bill asked. Izuku stood there for a moment before looking all three men in their eyes and answering full-heartedly. Because I want to help him. This got their attention. I don't know Alan, yet somehow I feel like I have some kind of connection to him though I'm not sure what it is. If I do I want to do everything in my power to help him. If he is responsible I want to see him get proper help and know the full truth of why he did it. If not then I want to at least clear his name so no one thinks of him as some kind of criminal. So please, tell us what you know so I know how to help him. The three men stood there for a solid minute with tears brimming in their brown eyes and Bill finally choked out though his tears. Young man I think I can speak for my brother when I say that was the most touching thing we've ever heard. He took a tissue from the counter and blowing his nose continued. We'd be happy to tell you all we know of our dear Alan. Dear Alan dear Alan dear Alan. That nickname echoed in Izuku's head like the last times. Only this time there was no painful migraine. Izuku knew that nickname despite never hearing it before. What did it all mean? Hey green bean, you okay? Mill asked with concern. Izuku shook his head clear and replied with a slight shake in his voice. Yeah, I just spaced out for a minute. Well if you're okay then we'll tell you all we know. Said Will. As far as his past goes we haven't the foggiest idea. And he always get very quiet when we do ask him, so we never bother to be nosy about it. Though we could give you a description if you'd like. Bill offered. Pale white skin. Black hair pulled into a bun and saved at the sides. Blue eyes. And wears a mid-1800 seconds outfit. Aizawa interrupted. Yeah that's Alan. Exclaimed Mill. Though how did you know that, especially his outfit? Our last suspect gave us a description of him. He was the one that directed us to you three. All Might explained. Can you tell us how you know him? Will scratched his chin awkwardly and said, Well, I know this is going to sound a little cliche, but really we don't know where he came from. Just popped out of the blue one day walking around town like he was the mayor, greeting everyone with a friendly smile or handshake. It was almost odd to find someone so chipper. Though I suppose we don't see people like that too often. It reminds us how our mindsets should be. First time we all saw him he came in like any other customer. And as you lot described him, with a big bright friendly smile wishing us a good morning, and with those stunning blue bell eye. Man I've never seen eyes so sparkly and intoxication in me whole life. Anyway he bought one of our products from each of us and left still with it that smile on his face. Bill explained. A few days pass and he comes back still wearing the same outfit with the same bright smile. And those shiny blue eyes. He asks me and me brothers how we make our products while giving compliments on how good they were. I don't think I've seen someone like that praise me or my brother so much in our whole lives. And so earnestly too. Mill explained. Though I told him it's a family secret and he accepted that, bought our products and left. What exactly is the secret? Aizawa asked with a raised eyebrow. The three men looked nervous at him as Will explained. Well no use in lying to you is there. 
We'll tell you. But you can't go spreading it around town it'll put us out of business. Got it. Everyone nodded. Will wiggled his finger for everyone to come close and he whispered, The reason our products are so good is because it comes from us. Everyone blinked for a moment wondering what he meant by that. I don't follow. Lita sighed confused. The ingredients we use to make our products come straight from our quirks. Bill explained like it was obvious. What exactly are your quirks? Izuku asked with a bit of excitement showing. Mill then rolled up his sleeve and pointing his arm out stared at it intensely. Everyone leaned in to watch what was going to happen. Then something started to sprout from under his skin and in another second a bunch of leaves grew from his arm like hair. Momo sniffed the air and said bewildered. They're tea leaves. That's right. Me and my brother can sprout plant life from our bodies like hair and control how much we grow and how big it should be. We just have to know everything about the plant. How it looks, feels, tastes, smell, stuff of that nature. Mill explained. Doesn't it hurt when you have to harvest it? Tur asked. Mill then took some scissors and cut the leaves right off his arm making it look normal once more. As long as I cut it off it's fine. He explained. We all have the same quirk though we're all better at creating different plants. Like I'm better at creating leafy plants. I can create plants that have ponds or shell-like structures, like cocoa ponds or sugar cane, said Will. I can create any kind of grain plant, like wheat and barley, said Bill. That's kinda gross, Momo admitted. You're one to talk. You pretty much do the exact thing. Kirima scoffed as he was stuffing his face with chocolate. Kirishima where did you get those? Momo asked. The red-haired teen then pointed to a plate on the a small table with a bunch of different chocolates on them. Kirishima you shouldn't just take stuff without permission first, especially in a place of business. And also don't talk with your mouth full you're a hero not a child. Lita scolded him with his robotic movements. Mill laughed at this and with a smile said, It's alright I don't mind at all, I left those out for customers to sample. My brother's trying a new recipe, so tell us what you think. Well I gotta say whatever you did, they're absolutely the best thing I've ever tasted. It's like my taste buds are having a block party. Karishma complimented while shoving more into his face. Kirishima. Mina shouted while holding the red-haired teen back. At least save some for the rest of us. Are you serious? Linda shouted at her. Say what was that thing about your friend Quirk being similar to ours? Will asked. Oh yeah that. Momo here can create anything she wants as long as she knows how it's made. She could create a bazooka from her armpit. Kirishma explained gesturing to Momo who turned away in embarrassment. That's incredible, said Mill. I've never heard of a quirk like that, stated Will. I wish I could have that quirk. Hey you want trade with me? Asked Bill. Ahem. Gentlemen if we could continue with our previous conversation. Aizawa deadpan getting back on topic. Oh right sorry about that we're easily distracted. Mill apologized. Now where were we? Oh right. So Alan would come around every so often and shot the breeze with us and buy our products. But soon he would come and ask us if we ever need any help around here. I always told him no, but one day I joked with him and told him that we could always use help opening up. The very next day we find him waiting for us by our shops bright and early. So we let him help us open up for the morning like I told him. He sweeped the shop, polished the cases and windows, check inventory, set displays, and so on. When we were done, in record time no less. He then waited for us to make or prep our fist goods of the day, and bought one of something from each of us at their top price. Why would he buy your goods at top price? I mean I'm sure they're that good, just why? Yuraka asked, well since me and Bill here make goods that spoil over time, we charge top price for them in the morning and drop it down bit by bit as the day goes on. So he bought our goods at their most expensive price. We actually tried to give him a discount or just free for his all his hard work, but he insisted he pay. Eventually we caved and he went off. Will explained, this then turned into a ritual of sorts. Some days he'd come in the early morning and help us open. Sometimes he'd come in the afternoon and buys our goods. Sometimes he'd come just to chat with us on slow days. Sighed Bill. Eventually we formed a bond with him and even told him our secret for how our goods are made. Will and Bill eventually took him up on his offer and let him help them in the kitchen from time to time to bake sweets and breads. And he was very good at it too. Mill gleamed with excitement. Not only that but he was also a fast learner too. It only took him only how many days before he was cooking on his own, Will. Three days. Will beamed with pride. Never saw someone learn so fast in my whole life. He was making pineapple upside down cake before I could even how to make crumpets at a quarter his age. And after that it simply became a tradition and the rest is history. Bill said simply, Aizawa finished writing down everything the three brother told them. Has he come by recently? He asks. Actually yes he has, just yesterday in fact. Bill replies. That's great. Will he be back today? Do you know what time? Do you know where he is, where he lives? Izuku rapid fire questioned them. Whoa 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 their kid. Take breaths between sentences. Will tried to calm Izuku down waving his hand. Unfortunately, like we said earlier, we really don't know much about him, where his lives and what his business is, and we never really bother to ask. 
Bill explained. Also he won't be coming by today. We might have failed to mention that he only comes every few days or so. So he may not be back for a couple of days maybe even a week. Even then he's never punctual when he does come. Mill explained further. Is that all there is? All Might asked. Afraid so. Well concluded. Though if you want to know anything about anyone in town then I suggest that you go see Granny Green Thumbs. She knows just about everything about everyone. She owns a botany shop by the old park near Crocker's Lane by 22 cent. Bill Offreed. That's what our last guys told us. Perhaps we should continue our investigating with her next. What say you Aizawa sensei? Lita asked the tired man. Aizawa finished writing down the last note in his booklet. And closing it said, Yeah, well ask this Granny Green Thumbs next. Aizawa and All Might bowed to the three men with the rest of their students. Thank you three very much for your cooperation. You have greatly helped us on our mission. The three men saved off their compliment with embarrassed pride on their faces as they said, Oh don't be so modest, you really don't need to thank us like this. We really didn't do much for you. The heroes then left the building with Will and Bill returning to their shops. Just before they all left Mill called out for Izuku to say for a moment. Aizawa and All Might stayed behind with him. Listen kid whatever's going on with the murders and Alan me and my brother agree that there is no way he could be responsible for this mess. He a great kid like you. He mysterious but certainly not dangerous. Albeit. I don't want to admit it but if he is somehow responsible for this me and my brothers would want to hear the reason behind it. Could you do that for us? Izuku nodded. Mill smiled and thanked him. If he isn't will you do everything you can clear his name? Cause the three of us will hold you to your word. Izuku nodded again. Mill made a light brush to Izuku's cheek with his face and smiling again said, Thanks, you're a real good lad you know that. You got a real great kid here sir. He said to both heroes. They're all great. Aizawa said with a bit of pride in his voice and All Might nodded. The three heroes exited the small shop with the owner waving goodbye and wishing them luck on their mission. They regrouped with the rest of the students waiting patiently outside for them and together they waited at the bus stop. The bus came only minutes later, with the vehicle being completely empty, and after climbing aboard Aizawa handed the man a small stack of cash as told him to drive to the old park on Krakas Lane. The man tipped his hat and stuffing the bills into his coat pocket drove off further into town, to their next suspect of question. The Araldi flower lady who know everyone in London, Granny Green Thumbs. Let's hope she has more insight on the mysterious Alan Little. The bus driver eventually stopped at their destination and after they all filed off the driver gave them a tip of his hat and closing the doors drove off in a cloud of dust. When the dust settled they looked around for the botany stand that their witnesses mentioned, though they couldn't find it where they were standing. They only saw the park which was like any other city park. Big metal fence with even bigger stone archway that lead to the inside. Grass as far as the eye could see. Flower beds and trees dotted the landscape. Cobblestone paths that lead all over and fountains that spewed water majestically. All the while being dead quiet. Everyone agreed that she wasn't anywhere outside the park's walls. Being so close to the street, so they mingled through the stone archway and began to search for the stand and the woman in question. After nearly an hour of searching with nothing to be found everyone was nearly ready to take a break or completely give up, when Tur snuck up behind the group and scaring them in the process. After she apologized profusely she told them she found a small stand at the far opposite end of the park. The students and teacher followed the floating shoes and gloves to the stand she found. After a solid 15-minute walk everyone was nearly exhausted, and Izuku wondered just how big this place was. They came upon a very small stand placed right next to an exact replica of stone archway they came through. The stand it was very quaint and very well kept only a foot or so taller than All Might in his buff form. It had a green body with roof shingles colored purple making it look like a flower. It had a sign hanging above it with all different flowers embroidering it, reading flowers in English. All around the base of the stand were the largest assortment of flowers growing around it forming the outline of a path for people to walk up to the stand. The heroes walked up to the stand and saw it had even more flowers in pots, hangers, or sitting in vases. Behind the counter stood a person with their back turned to the group, unaware of their presence, happily humming to themselves. This had to be the person they were looking for. That and there literally no other flower stands in this whole place. Not wanting to wait for the person to notice them and get frightened in the process, Aizawa let out a very loud ahem. But the person still hummed merrily to themselves, not taking any notice to them or not hearing it at all. All Might saw a small bell sitting in the counter sung between two flower pots. He thought, why not and ring the bell twice? Though he really didn't expect to actually get a reaction from the person. However, life has a funny way of working and the person stiffened up at the sound. They didn't turn around but looked on both sides and asked in an elderly voice, Hey, who's there? I'm sorry I lost my glasses and I can't see a darn thing. Izuku glances over the counter and caught sight of a pair of glasses laying on the floor. He quickly reached over and picked them up, cleaned them off and asked the old person to turn around. 
The person obliged and the moment their face met his, he pooped the glasses right on their face. The person, being an old lady, blinked a few times before her eyes adjusted. She looked at Izuku and with a smile said happily, Oh why thank you dearie, I've been looking for these darn things all day. You really saved me a whole lot of trouble. Of course ma'am, just doing my duty. Izuku smiled at the old woman. Oh but I must give something to you as a proper thank you, she said sweetly. Before Izuku could politely decline her offer she reached into her pocket and pick out a brown seed, and pressing it to his costume with her thumb, that was colored green, it suddenly grew into a gorgeous green flower. Izuku was stunned by this. The flower was not only beautiful, but it matched his outfit and smelled wonderful. Amazing. Thank you so much. He yanked the woman. The old lady giggled and replied, Consider it my way of saying thank you. That quirk of yours is amazing. You can control plants to grow. Izuku asked in astonishment. Indeed so, my quirk is called green thumbs. Any plant that I touch with either of my thumbs will instantly grow to adulthood. I can even control any plant that I have grown. In fact I'm actually the one who grew all the plants in this park. From the largest tree to the smallest blade of grass. She explained motioning to all the plant in the park behind the group. That's amazing. Izuku exclaimed with glittering wonder and amazement. Now with her glasses back the old lady looked around her and saw all the people crowded around her very small stand in their very strange attire and made a surprised yelp that made everyone around jump back a step. Oh I'm sorry about scaring you all like that. I just didn't expect to see so many people at once. And your outfits didn't help much either. Are you all going out for an early Hallow's Eve? Why does everyone say that? Is it going to be a recurring thing? Iraraka asked herself. Gave me quite a scare. Thought I was going to die here and now. She apologized while everyone's sweat dropped at her last comment. Eddie haha. But enough of all that. Welcome to Granny Green Thumb's floristry stand. How can I help all you dearies? She asked sweetly with a giggle. Are you Granny Green Thumb's ma'am? All might ask the old woman. Indeed I am. Though everyone just calls me Granny. Were you all looking for me? She asked sweetly. However, after everyone got a good look at her she sure didn't look as sweet as she acted. She was very very old and very very ugly. She had white hair all neatly tucked away under a bonnet that wrapped around her whole head and only showed her face. Her very very ugly face. She had very wrinkly pale skin that made her look like she didn't get enough sun. And facial blemish dotted her face. She had a few teeth missing in her mouth while the rest were yellow. There were no sight of her ears as they were tucked under the bonnet. She had tiny eyes that were amber colored, and her most prominent feature was her long pointy nose that stuck out and came down immediately at a 90 degree angle that went below her chin. She wore clothing that covered her whole body apart from her hands which had long wrinkly finger with sharp nails at the end. And the most prominent thing was that it was plainly obvious that she had very very severe arthritis. Also her thumbs were colored bright green. She wore a dress that had faded blue top half that came down to a purple skirt and brown leather shoes. Over her dress was a white apron with dirt and plant blood staining. All of this, plus the fact that she used a broom as a walking cane, made her look like she was some kind of witch. Actually we have been. We've gone from one person to the next, by word of mouth to have a chat with you. All might explain to the woman. Oh, well I never knew my reputation susked me so well. She exclaimed happily. So how can I help you all? Do you need some flowers for a get-together? A wedding, family reunion, baby shower, prom night. I don't think you understand why we're here to speak with you. Aizawa interrupted her. Granny looked at him inquisitively. We're heroes from Japan called by the government in order help aid in the murders that have been devastating London and catch the renegade villain running amok. We've questioned many people today who have only been able to slimy help us with our investigation. Though all of them have mentioned you. You don't really think I'm the one killing all those people do you? I'm 97 years old. Aizawa calmed the frantic woman down and continued. Calm down ma'am we're not saying you're the culprit by any stretch. What I'm trying to say is we believe you have some information on someone who we may think is connected to this catastrophe in some way. If you do it will greatly help us get to the bottom of this case. Well then, that depends entirely on who exactly you want to know about. I know nearly everything about everyone in this town and five miles or so further. So who exactly do you want to know about? Granny asked while fixing a bouquet. Aizawa took out Alan's recent photo and handed it to Granny asking, Do you know Alan Little? She fixed her glasses and squinting at the picture finally said with delight, Of course I know my sweet Alan. He's like the great grandson I never had. Sweet Alan sweet Alan sweet Alan sweet Alan sweet Alan sweet Alan. That nickname repeated itself again and again in Izuku's head. Another clue but one that only brought more questions than answers. Izuku's headaches once more from the flow of stimuli flowing through his brain. Though not as bad as the last times as it only makes him make a sour face. Wait a tick. Granny suddenly exclaimed. You don't really think he's the one responsible do you? That absolutely the most absurd thing I've heard. She screeched at them. The whole group held their ears in pain from the old woman's voice going from butter smooth to nails on a chalkboard. 
Aizawa mentally noted on how people reacted to Alan being questioned as a murder. He's either a really good manipulator or he's actually a really caring good-hearted person. Either way they had to find the truth no matter what people think of him. First they have to get this old hag to stop screeching at them or all of them will no doubt go totally deaf. Ma'am please just hear us out before you make your own accusations on us. Lita shouted at the top of his lungs. Granny stopped screeching like a banshee at Lita command and everyone finally let go of their ears. She then put a hand up to her ear and said, Hey, what's that you said? Hiroshima face palmed with Mina in the back as they both said mentally. She couldn't hear him over her own yelling. I said could you please let us explain the situation first. Lita repeated himself to the old woman. Granny crossed her arms and raised a spectacle eyebrow saying, Go on. All Might finally dug out the ringing in his ears and explained their demima to the old woman. You see we've been trying to follow false leads on Alan for quite some time now. Thought we have many reasons to believe that his is connected somehow to what's going on in light of certain things we have found out. We don't think he's the culprit, but we want to get all the facts before we make a decision. And so far he's remained a mystery to us, so to draw any kind of conclusion we need your help to know what kind of person Alan is. Granny simply stayed there with her skeptical expression not leaving her face as she drummed her fingers impatiently. If that's all, then I'm going to need a better reason than what's currently on offer. She yelled while slamming her fist on the counter. If you don't we're all doomed, Tur exclaimed. Maybe that rings true for all of you. But as for me, I'm near ready to kick the old bucket any time now. So it doesn't mean a thing to me. If it means protecting Alan form you lot then you all can have your wild gooses chase without my help. She stated angrily. No please granny we really need your help. Iraraka pleaded with her. And why should I him? What can you say or do Thal change my mind? If you don't you'll be labeled an accomplice and Aizawa began until Granny cut him off, and what? You'll throw a 97-year-old woman in jail. I'll be dead before the sun raises the next day. And then you'll have to explain that to the public and your allies. So the way I see thing you either give me good reason to help or you all can get lost. Everyone didn't know what to say to the old woman to convince her otherwise. Not even All Might or Eraserhead could think of a good reason to tell her. However, there was one person who knew what to say to her. He only hoped it was good enough for her standard. Izuku took a deep breath, cleared his mind and told the woman their reason or rather his reason. Granny please, if you don't then everyone is doomed to die. And I know that you don't care enough to protect Alan. I may not know you but I'm sure you see Alan just like you see a flower and consider him just like your flower. So Alan is very special to you if you would go this far to protect him with whatever reason you might have. And I'm sure your reasons are good and true, you want to protect him for as long as you can. But all the people of London also want to keep the ones closest to them for as long as they can. And also, I think of Alan as my flower too. I want to protect him just as much as you do. But I can't do that unless I know him and have more reason to protect him. So please granny, let me know all I can about him so I can protect him. Izuku exclaimed with a deep bow. The old woman's face went from shock to understanding. And finally to sorrow mixed with happiness. With all her years of wisdom behind her she was a great judge of character. Even if she was blind and deaf she would have been able to see and hear everything that Izuku was saying was coming straight from his heart. And it made the old woman's heart flutter with melancholy and happiness to know that there was someone, other than her, who was so willing to go so far for the one person that it made her old heart skip with joy. She sighed with delight and wiped tears forming in her aging eyes. Well if that's not good enough reason for me then I don't know what is. You've convinced me sweetie I'll tell you all I know about my sweet Alan. She agreed. Izuku's eyes showed with happiness and relief as he bowed rapidly thanking her over and over again with the rest of their group deeply thanking the woman for her change of heart. The old woman giggled sweetly at their sincere and very unusual form of thanks. It was nice to see other people who loved her Alan so much. Now she would be able to die with no regrets. Before you start with your story could you just let us know why you were so defensive over him? Aizawa asked her. Oh really now? Can I just say that he's very dear to me and leave it at that? Granny shot back skeptically. Did it have something to do with an officer? It continued. Granny sighed and replied, I'm afraid so. Knowing about everything about everyone make me a treasure trove of knowledge and gossip. So the police come to me many times for information that I usually do or don't have. Thought it does help them from time to time. Not too long ago a police officer and his subordinate came to me demanding that I tell him about Alan and his whereabout. He was so rude and had the most awfully threatening look on his face that I naturally declined helping him. Then he started to yell at me and said he would do all sorts of awful things to me if I didn't give him my help. Granny started to cry as she told her experience and Izuku quickly went behind the encounter with Yuraka and Lita to comfort the old woman. You don't have to tell us all that if it'll make you so upset. Yuraka tried to calm the woman down holding her hand. Granny wiped her eyes and blew her long nose into a hanky as she waved it off showing she would continue. I can't bring myself to say all that he told me but one of them was he would burn me at the stake like the witch I was. She began to weep again. That's terrible. How could anyone say something so horrible? 
Lita exclaimed in shock. Yeah, you're not a witch, you're just really really old. Kirishima put forth. Oh, Kirishima exclaimed as an invisible elbow hit him in the ribs. Not helping Kiri. Tur sold him from the corner of her mouth. I had never been more frightened in my whole life. I thought for sure I was going to expire right there and then. Though if it wasn't for his subordinate holding him back and leaving in a hurry I'm sure I would have. She exclaimed with one last tear rolling down her wrinkled face. This officer's was his name Pleo White. All Might gently asked the woman. I don't quite remember since I was so scared but I think his badge did say white on it or something like that. She recalled. So threatening bodily harm or even death on family men and old ladies for information about Alan. What is it you're really after Mr. White? All Might thought to himself. When Granny finally calmed down she then set to work fixing up a bouquet of flowers near her as she told them her story. I do know Alan quite well, though I don't know every little detail about him. However I do know quite a bit more than any other person in town. Anything at all will help. Just go back as far as you can and tell us anything. All Might told the old woman. She nodded and connited with her story and work. As strange as it may seem Alan just one day popped right into town without a warning. He was a sweet boy with an even kinder heart and a smile that would make the sun winch from the pain. He's sincere and caring, trusting, and a real gentleman. Hey ha <laughs> in fact there was this one time when he oh, I'm getting off topic. Everyone nodded. Oh sorry about that. Living alone I tend to be a talkative person with anyone. I can just bite your ear off all day long. Now where was I? Oh yes, as far as his past goes I know for a fact that he used to be a resident of the old asylum. I'm not entirely sure what he did to go be sent there, but I know it was something terrible. And truth be told I don't want to know either. An asylum? Mina asked. You mean a place where crazy people go to become sane? Granny nodded at her question. Perhaps that's where we'll go for more info. Aizawa spooked softly to himself. I'm afraid that would be a waste of time on your part dearie. Granny suddenly said as if she heard what he was saying. That place has been abandoned for about five years now and is nothing but ashes. Ashes? Hiroshima asked. Granny nodded again canuted. Yes the whole place just burst into flames one day and burnt completely to the ground. Nothing was left to find the cause so they said it was a one in a million chance. Oddly enough all the inmates had managed to escape and were moseying around on the front lawn where the police and fire department found them all without so much as a burn or scratch on any one of them. All the while the entire staff had been locked away inside the blaze and roasted alive like chestnuts. Fire department couldn't stop the blaze at all until the last scream from the victim inside had gone quiet. Then the flames only reduced when the whole place broke apart and crumpled down into nothing. But if you ask me they deserved it. Every last one of them deserved to die a death like that. After what they did it was fitting they go out screaming in horrific pain. Everyone blinked a few times to make sure they actually heard that correctly. Did she say what they thought she just said? Pause of so then why would she say that? How is she so deadly calm saying it? And when did she suddenly change? Then again she did do a complete 180 twice before so it really shouldn't be so much of a surprise. Though just hearing her saying it was way too much for them to process in one sitting. Perhaps she has a reason for saying something so uncouth. She had one for going off on them when they asked about Alan. How and why do you say that? And how can you say it so relaxed? Momo asked with a horrific tone. Granny didn't reply for a moment as she snipped off the leaves from a flower. Because of the truth, and some people just don't like the truth no matter how it's told to them. Those people deserve to die, plain and simple. And why is that? Mina asked with mortifications in her voice. Because it was the inmates that truly ran the asylum. The people who worked in that hell hole were far crazier than the people who actually were in there. I may have not seen what happened in there but I heard stories from many people and seen the fruits of their labors when someone is discharged. I don't want to recall everything being how horrible the stories were. Thought I can give you the watered down version. She continued to ramble not even waiting for a response. The people, no, the monsters in that place would tournament and torture their inmates day in a day out. They would subject them to horrific physical, mental, and emotional experiments for no reason at all sometimes. Their screaming, crying, and moaning could be heard echoing constantly through the whole place and even from outside. They were given little food and water, heavily medicated all the time, and almost never saw any daylight. The ones who didn't survive the experiments their bodies were simply burned. The one who did were subjected to more tests to find the limits of the human body, and the ones that did came out were hollowed out remnants of themselves and discharged as cured. But they were never cured, not one bit. You didn't go there to get better. You went there to become even more broken, if you were lucky. Cruel to be kind that was their motto. And they held it to a T. She scoffed at the last part as she angrily snipped the heads off a whole flower pot. When she finally calmed down she immediately noticed what she had done in her state of furry. Almost three healthy potted plants reduced to the compounded of mulch. She was less worried about the flower and more worried about the nice people who had to watch her do it. She turned around only to see all of their horrified expression plastered across their faces. She was especially worried about All Might and the blood dripping from his mouth. Oh dear did I scare you. 
Granny asked in a sweet yet worried tone. I think that's the understatement of the year, Kiro. See you said bluntly with wide eyes. If you knew all that why didn't you stop them? Go to the police, the state, the president, hell even the queen. Chur practically shouted at the woman. Granny clicked her tongue in anger and replied, Because no one want to hear the rambling of an old botanist, and even if I did it wouldn't have made much of a difference. This got everyone's attention. That place and its workers all had connections to the government, law firms, police officers, and so forth. They had so much protection that no one could lift a finger against them. They could do whatever their empty souls desired and could be covered up by it too. Honestly their death meant the liberation of so many people. You said you saw the fruits of their labor. What did you mean by that? All Might asked. Granny sighed sadly and replied, I used to have a cousin. A dear cousin no less. She was young, kind, and beautiful. She could sing and dance like no one else could and she enjoyed it too. Always said she was going to be a big hit in the theaters. Suddenly Granny got really quiet again and her eyes started to water. Izuku took the old woman's hand for support and she continued. But one day she hit her head dot 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 hard. Started to act much differently after she healed. Violently and all the time. Then out of the blue they took her away to that accursed asylum. I said she only needed a doctor and get some medicine. But no one would listen to a child. She was gone for three years straight and when she came back on the fourth. That's when the waterworks started again. She was as I described to ya, a remnant, a shell of her former self. She wasn't violent no more, but she never danced or sang or talked ever. Then one day dot 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 one day six months later I found her dead in her bed. They broke her spirit till there was nothing left of her. Granny started to cry profusely again at the last the word, while Izuku, Yuraka, and Lita all tried to soothe the woman while trying to hold back their tears. Everyone else in the group were rough or full on crying or trying to hold it back. Even Aizawa and All Might were failing to fight back their tears. That's, that's disgusting. Momo exclaimed with her hand over her mouth. After what you told us, and to think Alan had to stay there too. It's no wonder you're relieved knowing that place and its people had that happen to them. I I just can't believe it. I always thought stuff like that happened in games, and book, and TV shows. Not real life. Kirishima exclaimed looking sickly color in his face. I hope those politicians, officers, and law firms got the same treatment. And I am curious to know whatever happened to all the asylums inmates. So you asked herself. Granny must have had better hearing than they thought cause after Tsuyu asked that she immediately answered, as far as what happened to the inmates that night. I know that they were all recaptured and sent off to a different mental hospital. It wasn't perfect but it was far better than their previous residence. As for all those crooked people, they actually all wound up dead the same exact day. This both shocked and scared everyone. They wondered if this was also the truth or just her playing a dark humor joke. No one knows who did it but every last dirty politician and law enforcer wound up dead. The government decided to keep it hush-hush and elect new officials and promote new law enforcers to top rank. And to be honest, just like with the asylum, things actually got better here in all of England from all their deaths. It's far from perfect but so much better. I haven't seen peace like this since I was a child. How could their deaths bring peace? I find that hard to believe. All might ask the woman in disbelief. Because nothing ever changed. She replied simply. They all stood in the test of time trying to keep everything looking as good as it did back then. But in reality it was only masking over the rotten mess underneath that was festering and petrifying. And with all of those backwards justices hold her in place, nothing ever did change cause they made sure it wouldn't. Henceforth no one could stop them due to their power. She explained to all of them like the wise woman she was. Everyone stood there flabbergasted by her words. Even the two adults were stunned at what she said and how much sense it actually made. Without change everything would eventually get worse from just one problem. And the ones in charge of fixing the problems weren't in it for the people, but only themselves. Even if those people getting killed was a terrible thing to happen. Even if they deserved it, it still helped so many more people in the grand scheme of things. Granny wiped her face dry and calmed down enough to speak again. Now after hearing all I've told you, let me tell you dearies this. She spoke like an adult about to inform her children on something. Everyone turned their attention back to the old lady as we spoke. Like I said before I know Alan did something horrible for him to go there. But let me tell you he is not the same person as he was when he went in there. He's different. He's changed. For better or worse that up to you. Whoever he was died in that hellhole and now he's someone else. So I suggest you rethink your opinions on him. I think I can speak for all of us when I say that what you told us has opened our eyes and made us rethink many things we were told. Aizawa told the woman boldly. I'm glad to hear it. Granny said with happiness and relief in her voice. Could you tell us a little more on Alan? Like how you meet him and stuff? Izuku asked trying to break the current atmosphere. And everyone was mentally thanking Izuku for doing just that. Granny put a hand to her heart and replied, I would love to. She let go of Izuku's hat and set to work on a bouquet of flowers new to her. Now let me recall. As yes I met him about two or more years ago. 
It was like any other day and he came into the park with a big bright smile on his face. He moseyed around admiring all my flowers with his bright blue eyes. He eventually came up to my stand and purchased a dozen daisies. While I prepared the flowers for him he patiently waited there for me to finish and chatting up a storm with me about little things. I gave him the daisies he's pays for them and went on his way. Then I had gone out on my break and when I came back a daisy crown sat on my counter made from the same daisies I gave him with a note on it. In fact I actually still have that note. Granny reached under her counter and deposited a small note card wrapped in lamination. The card read, For the most beautiful queen in all of England, here is a crown befitting you and your beauty. With love, Alan K. Little. Granny fanned herself with the pruners in her hands as she said, I haven't been swooned like that since I meet my late husband. If only I was a dozen decades younger. She giggles to herself at the thought. Not too long after was that the first of our many meetings. At first he'd come by every now and again and purchase a small bouquet of flowers and chat with me. Then one day as I was going to my stand, I saw him standing at my door and offering his help to me. At my age I need all the help I can get so I accepted his offer. We walked from my home and through the park, my arm in his, and he helped me open my store. He swept the sidewalk, weed and water a few of the flower beds, opened the front of my shop, set out plants, picked flowers, and so much more. In fact I was opened a whole three hours before I normally open. Why does it take you three hours to get ready? Hiroshima asked without realizing his question. Granny pointed the pruners in her hand at him and in a stern tone replied, Because I'm old and have arthritis for days. And you said so yourself that I was very very old, did you not? Hiroshima only laughed nervously in response. Everyone looked at each other to make sure they were seeing this right and simultaneously wondering if she was alright in the first place. See you finally piped up in the group and asked, Um Granny, are you alright? You're muttering Kiro. Granny snapped out of whatever trace she was in and looked at everyone confused for a moment. Then she realized what had happened after a moment and blushed with embarrassment. She said, Oh I'm sorry about that sweeties. I tend to mutter when I'm lost in thought, which happens more often than I do want it to. What exactly were you talking about? Momo asked her. That depends entirely on what it was I said. What did I say? Granny asked her. Something about those eyes that hold something. She replied. Oh that? Well you see that also relates to why I'm so protective over my sweet Alan. I thought you sympathized with him with Haim being a resident of the asylum. Aizawa asked. Well, that is true. But there is always more to see than what's on the surface. Have you all ever known when something is wrong despite someone saying there is nothing wrong? Though you can just tell. Everyone looked at one another and nodded silently. 
Well that's what I knew the very first time I saw Alan. Sure he is kind and chivalrous with a shining smile and equally shiny eyes to compliment them. Though I could tell that he carried a heavy burden on himself. And I knew cause I could see it reflexing in his eyes. The eyes that remind me of myself. How so? Izuku asked her. They remind me of myself cause I could see the pain that they held. Just like the pain that reflected in my eyes for so long even up till today. The pain of loss. She explained. How can you tell it's from the pain of loss and something else entirely? Iraraka asked her. She smiled at the brunette and answered. When you get to be my age you can determine these things rather quickly. And also I've had much loss in my life. You wouldn't know it but I'm the very last of my kin. Not one person in my family is alive. She sighed with a bitter sad tone and continued. Me mom, me da, me aunt and uncle, me cousin, me husband, all four of my children, and me sweet sweet sister. Losing her was probably even harder than losing my husband. I'm all alone in this world. Everyone looked on at the aged woman with pity and sincerity. Knowing full well at this point they braced themselves for another tear-jerking and revelating explanation by the woman's motives. And Alan, oh poor sweet Alan has suffered more than I have. I might be able to handle such disdain since it's happened over my whole life. But him, so much pain and loss at such a young age. It pained me right down to the soul to see such likeness of me and him. I made the mistake of not spending every last moment with me loved ones like it was me last. To make as many memories as I could. Alas I didn't and to this day I regret it. After all he's been through he deserves some happiness in his life. He deserves so much more than what's been given to him. And even after he still walks with his head high and his smile shining. Someone like that that deserves so much better for being so strong. If I could die with just one less regret in my life then it would be to protect that boy with what life I have left in me. And god damn it I'll do just that. Granny stated boldly while slamming her fist on the countertop as hard as her old hands would permit. Everyone was deeply moved by the woman's words and had to fight down the tickle of pride they felt for the woman and the every creeping sadness worming its way up their throats. To be so old yet have something so noble to live on for really brought new light into the heroes, both young and old. All the while everyone wondered was Alan really as bad as he was made out to be? Was he really tied to the murders in some way? Was he just another victim and they wasting time? Was there another reason altogether and what is his connection to Izuku? So many questions still unanswered which meant that their search for evidence and information was still on. Meanwhile Granny finally calmed down again and was now wrapping up her last bouquet that she set aside with three others, knowing that meant Granny told them all they could know about Alan. All Might and Eraserhead decided that it was best to move on with their search. Thought before they could thank the old woman for her help as Goo asked the woman one last question that they all forget to ask. Has Alan been by lately? He asked her. Granny tapped her chin with her long finger in deep thought and she replied. He hasn't been by this morning, which is normal. He might show this evening when I close shop but it's not a given. In fact I haven't seen him in a few days. I begin to get rather worried for me sweet little sweetie. I can only hope everything is alright. She said with worry in her voice. I'm sure he is. Izuku condoled the woman who smiled at him warmly. I'm sure you sweeties are still going to be on the lookout for my Alan and also to find out more about him. Yes. She asked the group. We are. There's still much we need to know and we still need to speak with Alan as well to tie up every last loose end we have. Aizawa answered. In that case I believe I can give you your next lead. Granny said to the tried man. This almost immediately got everyone's attention as they listened to the old woman. After Alan came out of that horrid asylum he was shipped off for a few years in an orphanage that rescued him from that place and helped him recuperate from his experience. You know the place? All Might asked. Granny nodded and continued. I do. In fact I know the woman who runs it quite well. Knew her since she was just a lass. She's right sweet and gentle with all manner of folk especially children, yet stern and authoritative like a mother. She practically raised Alan herself. If you want to know everything about Alan's past then you'll have to seek out and speak to her. Where is this place and what exactly is this woman's name? Aizawa asked. She lives quite a ways away, near the hills of Cheshire. She lives in an old mansion on top of a hill that overlooks a forest to the left and the dairy field to the right, you can't miss it. Her name is Miss Alma Peregrine and runs Miss Peregrine's Home for Strange Children. Peregrine, like the bird. So you asked, Home for Strange Children. That's a nice way for describing someone with a quirk. Aizawa deadpanned, exactly. Though I'm not sure if it's a family name or a nickname given on account of her eyes. And on the other note I didn't come up with the name and I don't know the story behind it neither. Granny explained, Is that all you know on Alan? Is there anything else you can give us? Lita asked the woman. She shook her head and replied, I've told you lost everything I know. I could tell you about a few of our conversations but I can tell that you're strapped for time as it is. Aizawa and All Might both nodded. Well the most I can tell you is that Alan is a very imaginative child. Never seemed to lose his sense of wonder and childlike demeanor. I wish luck to each and every one of you dairies. The group bowed deeply before the old woman and gave her their most sincere thank for her cooperation and information. 
Granny smiled and giggled at their kind gesture and told them it was nothing and gave them the exact address to Miss Peregrine's orphanage. Just before they all left through the gates closest to them Granny called out to the group one last time. This time the adults told their student to wait for them by the nearest bus stop. However they only hid to see what it was that Granny wanted to say to them. As they looked on they saw their teacher about to approach the woman when suddenly dozens thitch vines shot out of the ground and wrapped around the adults' limbs enabling them from moving. The two heroes desperately tried to break free but the vines only squeezed tighter. Granny waved a finger at them while saying in a wicked sounding tone, Tsk tsk tsk, now now dearies you don't want to struggle anymore otherwise my vines will only continue to squeeze you tighter. What gives? Shouts all might. Now calm down dairy. Granny said with a sweet wicked tone. I'm not going to harm you both. I simply want to get my point across thoroughly that's all. Then tell us what you want to say. Aizawa demanded. Alan is a good child and I can't express this any more than I have. If you re-impression him I have no doubt in my mind that he'll revere it right back to the way he was. You never take a free once caged animal and place him back into a cage. He been through too much and he can't afford that kind of trauma to come back into his life. I've already told you that my sweet Alan deserves some happiness in his life from what has happened to him. And I already told you that I would protect him with what little life I have left in me. And I intend to do just that. So if you find Alan and put him behind bars or back in an asylum I'll do just as I say. And you'll be the first see why the children around here call me the Wicked Witch of the Thick Green. And with that last sentence the vines let the heroes go and retreated back into the ground or slithered away. All while Granny began to let out a wicked cackle like a witch. The two heroes wasted no time to flee from the old woman with her wicked laughter echoing behind them the whole time. Eventually the heroes lost the sound of the old woman's laughter and found themselves at the bus stop with all their students waiting around with pale expressions placed on their faces. The two of them didn't have to ask knowing that they all stayed and watched from a distance to see what Granny had wanted from them. And by their collective expressions they too were also very shaken up by the old lady. They tried to play it cool as they walked up to their students with equally sacred place expression as them and simply tried to stand there waiting for the next bus to arrive. Though it didn't last long as Mina piped up in fear. That was one seriously scary old person. MHM. Tur agreed with her. What gave it away the fact she captured two very powerful heroes or the fact she threatened their lives? See you crooked fearfully. Let's not talk about Granny Green Thumbs. All Might finally said trying to calm the students down. For now let's focus on questioning to Miss Peregrine for more information on Alan. No doubt she will also be protective over Alan if we ask. Aizawa nodded with the skeletal blonde. Once we mention word of the murders his seeming connection and even our partnership with the government and the police department I'm sure you're right. Midori I hope you can convince her to see it our way. You managed it with the last three suspect. But I think she might be even harder to convince than green thumbs. I'll do my best sir. Izuku replied absent-mindedly while staring off into space. You okay? Aizawa asked. Izuku sighed and replied. Just thinking about everything I've sorta of learned about Alan. Some things are coming back and forming a solid connection and some just go straight off the map. I need to know more about Alan and talk with him if I can piece together all that I currently know. That is to say we can find him and if I'm able to fully convince him and Miss Peregrine to speak with us. For all we know Alan could be just as hot-wired as the rest of the people in Britain. And with his past it would also make total sense. Problem child you're doing your thing again. Aizawa cut him off snapping Izuku out of his muttering spree. As sorry. He apologized embarrassed. Anything stand out when we spoke with Granny? All Might asked trying to change the subject. Just a few things. Alan's personality, his love for sweets and tea, his imagination world, and something about the Cheshire Hills that remind me about a cat. The cat. Iraraka questioned him. I'm not sure of it myself. Ezuku stated equally confused. Well whatever it may be we'll find out once we ask Miss Peregrine and Alan when we find him. Aizawa stated calmly. So there the hero stood at the bus stop in silence waiting for the next bus to stroll by. After only 30 or so minutes did the bus show up with the same driver as before. The heroes piled in and the driver asked where to. Aizawa silently handed the man the address. The driver fixed his cap, turned on his GPS, and told them all to get comfortable as this was going to be a rather long ride. The bus's doors closed and the heroes sat comfortable as they could and prepared themselves for what was to come next when they meet Alma Peregrine and her home for unusual children. Hopefully she could shed some more light on Alan or just shed more darkness on them all.